Welcome back to Learn with Simon Ash. This is the only complete IELTS free course available on internet and we can proudly say that that most of our students have received their desired brands watching just this course. Before we begin, let me just tell you each and every part of this course is divided in chapters. That means if you go to the description and click on the time, it'll take you to that particular chapter in IELTS. We also provide you some data along with this course in order to understand IELTS in a nutshell. The link for the data is in the description. If you need complete data, 30 hours of live session, mock tests, as well as unlimited feedback, do not forget to visit ielsclass.learnwithsimons.com. The date on which the batch is starting, as well as timing for the sessions are provided on the website. Do not forget to visit it. If you have any doubt about the legitimacy of this course, we got 4.8 out of 5 in Google review, and you can read the comments as well what people think about our course. Now, let's get back to our main course, that is 9 hours and 45 minutes, and everything you need in IELTS is here. IELTS stands for International English Language Testing System. In this test, all they do is check your proficiency, you by mean non-native speakers. Now, what is this proficiency test? Proficiency means checking how good you are in English. And by non-native, I mean people who are living in a country where English is not spoken as the primary language or the first language. Let me tell you and give you an example of countries such as Canada, Australia, US, New Zealand, such countries, there are eight countries. These countries have the first language as English. Apart from that, countries like India, China, and most of the Asian countries, African countries, South American or European, they don't speak English as their first language. They have it as second language or maybe third language. For them, it's must to write this test if they want to go to these countries. For example, I want to go to Australia to study or let's say I want to go to Canada to work. Then I have to write IELTS so that I can show my proficiency. All right. Now, this test has been created by Cambridge University a long time ago. Well, here is not important. Important is to know that it was created by Cambridge University. What does it mean by that? And why do we need this information? See, Cambridge is in UK and hence 80% of the English used in IELTS has British accent. Hence, I would recommend start watching British related movies or British accent movies. Most of the Hollywood movies are from US, hence you will see an accent different, difference and some of the answer might be incorrect, let's say in listening because of that. All right, we'll see how to solve that problem later. But for now, let's start watching British accent movies. Okay. Moreover, there are types and categories in IELTS. There are three different things that you have to notice, three different types. Okay. Some of them are very important to take care of. Some of them are okay, you know, you're, you're fine with it. Some of them you can be cautious or you can be fine. For the first one, IDP and British Council. Let me explain what these things are. You might be hearing this a lot while you're registering for IELTS. Now, as I said, Cambridge created the test and they, as a university, give responsibility to IDP and British Council to take the test in various countries. These institutes or, you know, agencies, you can call them their parts, take care of the test and conduct tests in countries like India, China and any country. You are given option to choose IDP and British Council. And trust me, both are same. Now, I'll tell you why there are many rumors, misconceptions, wrong information about this. Let's say I go for, first time, for the first time to write IELTS. I write with IDP. I book my test with IDP and I don't get the required score. I'll say IDP is horrible, you know, because I have another option, right? I'll say maybe British Council is better. Instead of accepting what did I, what did go wrong, I'll say IDP is wrong. Same, same for the person who goes for British Council and didn't get the score, they'll curse their British Council rather than their own problems, right? If I get in the first score, British Council score, that person will never say there's problem with British Council or IDP. So trust me, both are same, no difference. You can choose any of them, whichever, for whichever the seat is available. Yeah, please try to book at least 15 days before the exam. Uh, don't worry about that. I'll talk about this in later um, sessions or class because there we'll talk about how to book exams and all those stuff. Yeah, now this was the first type. You don't have to worry, you can choose anyway. 
The second one, you do have to pay attention. What do you mean by pay attention? Listen, if you are planning to work abroad, then please go for general training. This is for work, immigration or anything related not to not to study, right? Here, if you want to study anything, graduation, post-graduation, PhD, any kind of course, go for academic and hands. If in case, let's say, you go for general training instead of academic, you want to study, but you take general training test, that's just wrong. They won't accept the score. And hence, you wasted a lot of money in that. Please take care of this. Otherwise, there will be trouble later. You have to write the exam again. It doesn't matter how good you score you get. This will be invalid if you do, you know, the otherwise, otherwise uh, academic or general training. So please take care of this while registering for the exam. If you have any doubt in this, you can definitely ask me in comments. I'll definitely let you know which one you should go for. Uh, I can help in that. Yeah. All right. The last one is paper and online. Now, what does it mean by paper and online? Earlier, the test was being conducted just paper test. That means paper and pencil. You have to write all the answer based on paper. You get a question paper, you get a pencil, you write the answer. But now, because every other test is online, so they are planning or they already have conduct, started this, that they are taking tests online. I recommend, please go for paper. That is paper and pencil. The reason for that is from our first grade till all the time we have studied, even in, in, our, in our work, we write, we enjoy writing in a paper. And we have we are habitual to that, right? Studying a, online is a bit of a trouble, I would say. Yeah, because it is, there is study conducted and said that 30% speed decreases while reading in a screen rather than a paper. That's, that's the reason when you watch TV, when you watch um, videos and you read book after the book sometime you try to go to back to the video because you're really slow but if you read from a book it's fun and it's faster so please go for paper and pencil that's my recommendation and these are the three things three types or three categories in IELTS all right after that we have something important as well which is scoring how are you scored in IELTS in IELTS there's nothing like marks or anything like or points we have bands. These are the final ones. Now, what is the meaning of these bands? All right, we'll see on that part itself. Bands is a name of a scoring system created by IELTS or let's say Cambridge, where you are scored from one to nine, where nine is the highest and one is the lowest. There's nothing like zero. Zero is when you didn't go or appear for the exam, right? You will get any score between one and nine depending on your situation or your requirement you have to score according to that if you score nine that's well and good it's highest you don't have to worry about anything even eight well and good no worries but there's one more there's a catch there are four modules in IELTS that is listening reading writing and speaking if in case you score less in any of these less compared to the requirement so for an example, I'm a company who wants to hire someone from um, India. I, I'm staying in US, let's say. And I want you to come to US. And my requirement for my company is, let's say, eight bands in listening, seven reading, seven writing, seven speaking. In that case, what's going to happen? If you get 6.5 in writing, definitely you are not cleared the exam. You have to write the exam again. So module wise score and overall score is required so they might say something like eight overall and not less than seven in each this is how they tell you what you require i hope you understand what i mean by that yeah good now there's one more thing that we must know about scoring that is band and sephir there's something called bands and there's something called sephir they're different things and they're connected in a way which we don't know let me make you understand about that. If you look at Sefer, it stands for Common European Framework as a reference for languages. It's a way to test the levels in the language. So there are three different levels. A level, you can call them A1 and A2, B1 and B2, and C1 and C2. So this is basic, intermediate, and advanced, right? now. Bands are created from one to nine. 
these bands respond to these levels. So for an example, 8.5 or 9 is considered 6 C2. So hence 8.5 to 9 is considered C2. Above this, it's C1. So basically speaking, they are responding to these levels, which are official levels in Europe. If you are learning any other language apart from English, like German, French, there are levels to learn. For example, if you learn A1, you get some score in there, you write another exam. So you see, these are those levels, Sefer levels. Band was created by, as I said earlier, Cambridge, so that it's easier for them to test others. Because these levels are actually very broad. They wanted something concrete. So these one to nine are concrete. Moving ahead, if you look at here, we have listening and reading. We'll talk only about them for now. Moving ahead, we'll talk about other things, which are four modules. In these, we have 40 questions. Now, I'm not saying that I'm gonna introduce these listening and reading right now, only that I'm talking about the scoring part, okay? So we have 40 questions in both of them. These are similarities. And one point you get for one correct answer. So you get, let's say, you get um, 40 out of 40, right? So this will be nine bands. If you get 39 out of 40, you get 8.5 bands in reading. However, in listening, if you get 39 of 40, out of 40, you get still nine bands. So there are some differences, but what I mean is one correct answer, one point, and hence 40 points you get. Out of 40, whatever you get, based on that, you get your band score. I hope you understand that. What I mean by this is listening and reading are like common in this, but writing and speaking have completely different criteria. So writing and speaking have something called four criteria. Now this criteria itself is a plural, we don't have to add S. The singular of criteria is criterion. There are four criteria for writing and speaking. And based on these criteria, they test you and provide you bands. Now, I'll give you an example of each, you know, one one criteria, um, one criterion of each. The first one, let's say your vocabulary or lexical resource. The better vocabulary you use in writing, the higher score you get in writing. This is one of the criteria. I mean, criteria, trust me, there are many. So there are total four. In speaking, one of them is fluency. Yes, the more fluent you are, the higher score you get. So. Not just this, there are three more, as I said. When we combine them and test you, and they create your score. Okay, not just one person, many people check your paper, like total three, and then they give you the score. See, I'm not saying that I am introducing writing and speaking completely. This is just for to tell you how you are being scored. Now, what happens in writing, what happens in speaking is completely different issue. We'll see that later, okay? This is just for the scoring purpose. Now, most of you must be thinking what, which book to go for. You know, there are many books online. Please don't go for online material. They are horrible. They're literally horrible. The reason for them to be horrible is they're not connected to Cambridge, right? So the books they create, they're not exactly according to exam or the test. So you might be getting good score in the online material. You might be getting bad score in the online material, but the exact material that you need, we call them the best book. The best book is the Cambridge, the official Cambridge guide to IELTS. So there's a guide called official Cambridge guide to IELTS. This is in my opinion, the best book. It has everything. Yeah. Second book that is required for practice is a series. It's called the Cambridge Practice Test for IELTS series. There's a series ranging from one to 14. The 14th is the latest. Please start from nine till 14. Practice only these books. Now I'm gonna provide you a link so that you can directly go and buy those books. Um, these books are the best. You can purchase initially two to three books. That's it, like for example, 12, 13, 14, or just 12 for your practice and go for the official guide. That's enough. Along with this course and those books, it's enough. Trust me. Okay. 
Moving ahead, we have to know how many times can I book for the test? You know, how many times is test being conducted, the frequency of the test? So there's a difference between academic and general training. Academic is conducted 48 years, 40 time, 48 times a year. However, general training is conducted 24 times a year. So you can say four times a month here, it's, you guessed it right, 12 times, a, I mean, two times a month not 12 sorry so watch out for people who are writing general training seats are less compared to academic because it's only written two times a month okay now of course you must be thinking how many times can i write ielts for example i tried once and i didn't get the desired score can i write many times no please don't do that of course there is no set requirement you can write as many times as you want but i won't recommend it going to it immediately. That's what I mean by don't write many times continuously. Of course, let's say you didn't get the score. So your score requirement was 7.5 for your college or for your work and you got seven. Now, just after one week of exam, there's a date coming. Don't go for that because you didn't look into what went wrong, what went right and what kind of module you need to practice. You just went there because you wanted the score again don't do that please take time evaluate yourself ask me ask uh, your uh, your friends or anyone who has helped you in this look at the book what went wrong what went right okay so that's what i mean please don't go for it immediately it's the wastage of 13 to 14k in that whole process and of course you lose confidence right good i hope you understand that part it's important now let's talk about the modules, the, the building block of the whole exam, right? Or the whole test. So there are four modules, as I said earlier, and they need to be evaluated in all the areas in English. For example, not for example, exactly, we have listening. Listening is that you hear some audio. Let me try my drawing. It's okay, I guess. <laughs> So listening, you will be hearing audio for around 30 minutes. There will be breaks in middle and there will be 40 questions in that. And based on these um, questions, I mean, the audio, you'll be answering questions. Of course, there will be break, as I said, but it might get a little bit difficult because the language is English plus accent is British. So there might be some trouble. So this is what happens in listening. You have to write the answer while you're listening to the audio in the question paper, of course. This will be declared in detail in later that, for example, when we are understanding listening in detail, this is just a module as introduction. In reading, you will be given a question paper in which you will have some passages. This is a passage, let's say. And here we have questions. Of course, not on the same page, on other pages. You will have to read the questions and find the answer from the passages. This is what reading test is. Okay. It's not just reading, okay? I had a friend, uh, he said, oh, it's just reading, right? I can read fast. I'm like, it's not just reading. You have to find answers from the passages. And also like listening, we have 40 questions. And remember, please, the sequence is always the same, which I'm showing you. So listening comes first, then comes reading and whatever the modules I'm gonna show you. Sequence never changes in, in IELTS, okay? Then comes writing. In writing, we have two options, I mean, two things to do, task one and task two. There's a difference in academic and general training. For academic, you gotta write a report in part one. For general training, you gotta write a letter. For part two, you all have to write an essay. There's no difference in part two. The total time will be 60 minutes. And yes, you have to write an essay. You heard it, right? I don't remember when was the last time you wrote an essay. Well, if you ask me, it was like day before yesterday for my practice, just to check how it is. But most of us write essays um, in our school, not even college. College, we write exams, right? So it's a little bit weird and a difficult task in my opinion. So please practice this the most, writing. And the last one is speaking. This will be a formal interview or kind of a test it will last for 11 to 14 minutes now i wrote it in the last and i'm gonna draw a line here for a reason well my line is horrible horribly uh, you know not straight now this part will be taken on a different day what i mean by different day this will be taken on the same day 
So total time will be two hours and 45 minutes for the whole test. And um, this will be taken on a different day. That means plus or minus five days before or after this test. Let's say I have listening, reading and writing IELTS test on 25th of July. Then probably my speaking test will be anything between 20 to 25 or 26 to 30. So it could be 21, 22, 23, 24, or 27, 28, 29, 30, any of these. Now, how will I know when my test is? You will get a message in your, on your phone, the registered phone on the website. Of course, a mail as well. And uh, if you have any doubt, you can call the, the British Council or IDP wherever you booked your test. So this is what you can uh, understand from speaking on a different day. It is the shortest one and the venue, the date, the timing will be told. Please try to be a little bit early. I have seen people who have written these three tests on one day and when this came, they couldn't reach. And of course, when you can't write one, you, they won't even give you score for this. So it's all gone. Try to be a little bit early based on uh, what, they, what time they gave you. All right. So these are the four modules that you have to uh, understand and write. Detailed will be in coming sessions. This is just a mini introduction, right? For you to understand. Now, once you write all the tests that is speaking, after 13 days, you will get your score. And that will be online. That means you will get a registration number. You can check on their website. They'll tell you where to look for. And of course, you'll get a message or a mail that all oh, your result is out. Please check it. That will be wonderful to get an alert, right? Um, if you want a hard copy, well, you can get it, you know, but it will take some time, like 30 days. It will be sent to you by a post and you can just, you know, send it to anywhere as a copy. But remember, you will get first online and then you'll be sent hard copy. I hope I'm clear about this. Any doubt about the structure or the IELTS or result, um, please message, I mean, write in the um, comments or you can ask me through the mail ID which I provided in my uh, details. Yeah, you can message there. And last but not the least, the passport. See, I have seen plenty of the people crying after some time because of passport. And why does that happen? I'll tell you. It is a must for registration of IELTS. So let's say I'm going for registration of IELTS and I have all the details filled and they say, please fill your passport number. And I say, I don't have a passport. They say, please remember, you cannot write the test. The reason for that is simply without a passport, how would you go abroad? And you're writing a test for abroad. So they don't allow you to write IELTS without passport. Now, why did I say many people have messed up? So let's say my test is in the next month of 25th. I tried booking on 5th of the same month and I recognize I have no passport. Yeah, what's gonna happen? I'll go to the agency or I'll go to the, the where we can get passport, passport service, and they'll say, it's gonna take some time to get passport. Now you have two options, either give up or pay more to get the passport like you might get in four days and by that time you might miss your seat in IELTS exam so please do it right now if you're planning to write IELTS soon get your passport ready so that we can register easily okay and this was the end of your session listening module its structure and grading remember listening module is always first in the sequence what does it mean by first in the sequence? I think we have discussed this in the introductory video that there are four modules, listening, reading, writing, and speaking. The sequence is never broken. In fact, they always are taken on one day and speaking is on another day. In these three, listening always comes first. Just remember this. The reason to remember this, you have to be ready for the audio and other things. Secondly, it's a relief because, see, if this is the first one, you don't have to worry about the earlier one. For an example, in reading, you're already partially accept, um, exhausted and hence, you know, your concentration might go down. Hence, listening, being first, gets a benefit. All right. Moreover, you will get many breaks between modules. So like I said, listening, reading, writing and speaking, of course, speaking on a different day, we can ignore it for now. 
about listening, reading and writing. When one test is over, you'll be given a break in here. They'll say, uh, we're going to take, take your paper back, which you have finished. Then they'll give you reading tests. It's not like you'll be getting all the tests in one go, right? And then again, once reading is over, they're going to take your answer sheet and the question sheet back from you. They'll provide you a new question sheet and answer sheet. Okay, so these breaks will be there for around one and one half minute or more. These breaks help you to relieve, you know, just, just get um, worry less. Yeah. Now, this is how the question paper looks like. I mean, this is the answer sheet looks like. Question paper, I'll show you later. Why am I showing you the answer sheet? Because this will be provided separately, right? Question paper doesn't look like this. This is the answer sheet and it's a blank one. So basically, once you finish writing in the question sheet, listening to the audio, which I'm going to explain in detail later, you will be writing in here the answers here. For example, the first answer is cat. You'll be writing here cat. Second is bat. You'll be writing here bat. So this way you have to fill till 40. You have to write your name and number. So all the details are here. This sheet is important and this will be provided only once this sheet. Please try to keep it secure. All right. Now, let's talk about the structure of listening module, okay? Understanding the structure will help you to get better score by just evaluating it by yourself, yeah? Now, there are 40 questions in your listening uh, test and there will be four sections. So these 40 questions are divided in four sections. Um, so total 40 questions, four sections, you can say each section has 10 questions, 10 questions per section, right? The difficulty level always increases from one section to next section. So section one is comparatively easy than section two. Same goes for section three. It's much, you know, section two is easier compared to section three. Same way the difficulty level keep increasing and it reaches to the highest point at four. Okay. The, the reason for them to have sections will be described in the coming videos. Why do they have sections? Okay. For now, just remember 40 questions, four sections. About the audio, 30 minutes of audio will be played and you will get 10 minutes to transfer the answer. What is this 30 minutes audio and what are these? What is this 10 minutes of audio? This 30 minute, this 30 minute time is when you will be listening um, continuously, but with breaks, audios. And from these audios, you have to find answers while looking at the question paper. Now let me explain what this 10 minutes to transfer time is. So you will answer while you're listening to the audio. So let me explain the situation by drawing something. This is your question paper. Yeah. It has some questions and this is you listening to something in your headphone, the audio. While you're listening, you have to write answers in the question paper. Okay while listening, because once it's gone, you cannot remember what happened, right? Taking note is one thing, but continuously taking notes for like 30 minutes is horrible. Yeah, anyway, sequence is maintained. So you're listening to the audio, you write the answers in the question sheet first. And once you finish writing, you are given 10 minutes after the audio is over. So 10 minutes are provided for you to write these answers or copy these answers from question sheet to the answer sheet, which I already showed you earlier, which looked like, um, you know, uh, Excel sheet with 40 blanks. Yeah, that's what that was your answer sheet. Now you understand what is it for? First, you write in the question paper and then you copy it into the answer sheet in the 10 minutes, which I provided later. All right. Now comes an example to make it easier for you to understand. Of course, I'm not going to provide you example of 40 questions because that will be too long. So I'm going to provide you a short example. That will be simple one, section one. I'm going to play the audio as well as show you the questions. So this is how the question looks like. It has been uh, taken from uh, IELTS.org. It's a sample question, the general one. Now, initially they might provide you an example to show and they'll play this example as well, right? Your task is to write the answer in the answer sheet, I mean question sheet here. Try to write it here. If it's long, you can extend it, of course, because they're not going to check your question paper. They're going to check your answer sheet. Okay. Sequence is always maintained. Like if it's one, then audio will be played for one and then two and then three continuously. 
and they'll be going on till seven or eight, whatever the number it is, right? So let me just play the audio for you and uh, let me clean up the stuff which I've created so that you can write the answers here. You will hear a telephone conversation between a customer and an agent at a company which ships large boxes overseas. Good morning, Packham's shipping agents. Can I help you? Oh, yes. I'm ringing to make inquiries about sending a large box, uh, a container, back home to Kenya from the UK. Yes, of course. Would you like me to try and find some quotations for you? Yes, that'd be great. Thank you. Well, first of all, I need a few details from you. Fine. Can I take your name? It's Jacob M. Kerry. Can you spell your surname, please? Yes, it's M-K-E-R-E. Is that M for mother? Yes. Thank you. And you say that you will be sending the box to Kenya? That's right. And where would you like the box picked up from? From college, if possible. Yes, of course. I'll take down the address now. It's Westall College. Is that W-E-S-T-A-L-L? Yes, college. Westall College. And where's that? It's Downlands Road in Bristol. Oh, yes, I know it. And the postcode? It's BS89PU. Right. And I need to know the size. Yes, I've measured it carefully and it's 1.5 metres long. Right. 0.75 metres wide. OK. And it's 0.5 metres high or, or, or deep. Great. So I'll calculate the volume in a moment and get some quotes for that. But first, can you tell me, you know, very generally, what will be in the box? Yes, uh, th there's mostly clothes. OK. And there's some books. OK, good. Um, anything else? Uh, yes, th there's also some toys. OK, and what is the total value, do you think, of the contents? Well, the main costs are the clothes and the books. They'll be about £1,500. But then the toys are about another 200 So I'd put down £1,700. Pounds. All right, we are back here. Let me show you the answers now. See, this was not to test you, but to show you if you have written all the correct answers, wonderful, no problem. Otherwise, don't worry. When we are practicing these kind of questions, which are called form filling, by the way, these questions are called form filling, where you have to fill a form based on the audio that is being played, you will understand how to do them. Don't worry for now, all right? If you have written first answer as M K E R E, M K K E R E, it's correct. Second one is Vestal. Third one is B S eight nine P U. Fourth one is zero point seven five meter or meters or any of these spellings. See, let me tell you one thing. If in the any practice book they have mentioned with brackets and slashes, what is the meaning of it? Is slash means this could be an alternate answer. For example, if I write here red or red car, both are correct. If I'm right, if I'm in the book, I can see red car, that means I can include it or exclude it, both are correct as well, right? So if you have written 0.75 meter, it's correct. Next one is 0.5 meter, it's correct. Uh, six and seven can be in either order. If you have written books first or twice first, it's fine. Like I said, the bracket thing. See, we have the word sum in bracket. Here as well, sum in bracket. If I don't include sum, it's fine. It'll be correct answer as well. And last one is 700. That is the correct answer. If you've got eight out of eight, great, wonderful. You're on the right track. If not, don't worry. This is just to show you how listening test has been taken. Same way, it will continue to for 40 videos. I mean, 40 uh, questions in the test. There'll be breaks. We'll see what kind of breaks soon. Now, about the headphones, you will be provided with them. Don't worry about that. You don't have to carry your headphones. They won't be playing the audio in the speakers because that's not the right way. What if you don't understand what's happening? What if speaker suddenly breaks? So they always provide separate headphones, that is individual headphones. Um, 
So I recommend you two things. First is when you are provided your headphones, always check if they're working. Yes, check their working condition. If it is good, well and good. They'll be providing you time for that 10 to 15 minutes. Second thing, check your volume level. I mean, volume control will be provided to you. That's it. You cannot play the audio one I mean, twice. So just only volume control is in your hand. Check what volume is good for you, what you find comfortable. And if you find set, a, set that volume, if you find that um, headphones are not working, please ask them to change it. They'll instantly change it. No worries about that. If you can't find your volume set, keep checking. You have 10 minutes. And I think that's enough to set volume which you find um, bearable or, you know, comfortable. Okay. Talking about the headphones, sometime things happen that, you know, um, you might not hear the audio suddenly in the middle of the exam. That happened to some of my students. What they generally did is they raised their hand and you know, generally happens to more than one person. It's like 20 people suddenly can't hear anything. If they raise their hand, they have to stop the audio. So in this case, they have to stop the audio and they have to play again. All right. This happens rarely, like once in 100,000 100, times, right? This is an exception for that reason itself, because it happens rarely. Don't rely on this. Well, the people were lucky that they have, they could play the audio again. They could test it. But this is rare but don't stop yourself if audio is not clear in the middle of exam okay so let's talk about breaks of course there will be breaks breaks between sections and in sections so there are four sections we have discussed we have 40 questions in listening and there are four sections in it between these sections there will be breaks for example section one is over they'll say now this is the end of the section look at question number 11 to whatever number they say you know what I mean? So section one is one to 10, section two is 11 to 20, section three is 21 to 30 and 31 to 40. There'll be breaks between these places as well and breaks in sections as well. Now, what do I mean by that? Let's say we have section one. You have question one to 10 assigned for that. They'll say, you will have a look at question one to six. That means after six, there will be a break. Your task is to just have a look at question one to six, read the question, understand them until the audio is being played. They'll tell you now the audio will be played. Okay. So this is called break in section. Once this section is over, that is seven, eight, nine, they have played and 10. Another break will be there because section is over. This is section one overall. And for section two, they have to have a break. I hope you understand what I mean by section a uh, breaks in section and breaks between the sections. Okay, these are two kinds of breaks and they are really uh, important that you use these breaks uh, methodically. Um, I mean, uh, really um, smartly that you can easily read the questions in the time, even when they're saying, and now look at your answers, what you have written at that time, you can use that to read next part as well. Okay, now let me proceed further. Um, let's talk about some specifications or characteristics, characteristics of the audio. The audio that is being played will be played once. You have no control over the audio, just once and it's over. If you miss this, it's gone. I mean, once you miss any of the question, don't, don't, don't stay to that, you know, you have to move ahead. Well, how to cope up with that, we'll see in coming videos. But for now, remember, audio will be played just once. Okay, proceeding, there will be various accents in there. British accent, American accent, Canadian, and many other Indian, African, depending on, you know, the situation. But, but let me tell you, 85 to 90% will be British accent for a reason. This test is being created in Cambridge University. And Cambridge University is in UK. That's why most of the audios are in British accent. Hence, I suggest you, as I already suggested in previous videos, please start watching British accent movies or TV series. Uh, because most of the movies are from Hollywood, which are from US, they won't help much. So please go for British accent movies. They will be really helpful for you in future. Trust me. Yeah. Anyway, I like British accent anyway. All right, moving ahead. 
there will be minor differences between in accents you know uh, there's not a big difference so what are these differences definitely i'll help you not just accents for numbers as well there will be some things that you have to understand <clears throat> for both of these things i'll take care of them in the coming video there will be a detailed introduction plus tips and tricks for accents we're going to see something more about listening and in that we'll see how are these sections being created and we'll see explanation of the same. The first thing we'll see is the troubles you have with listening. What do you mean by troubles we have with listening? I'm not questioning your listening skills. I mean your ears, the physical skills. I'm questioning your skills with English. That's the language I'm talking about. All right. So there are two main things that you should notice. The two main reasons that you can't get nine bands, that is the highest in any module in IELTS, if you don't know, they are listening, reading, writing, and speaking. And nine is the highest band, one is the lowest. So these two are the main reasons why you're not getting nine bands in listening so far, or why you might not get in future. So if you understand the reasons or the root causes, of course, if you eliminate them, you get nine bands. That's the main logic of knowing the reasons, yeah? So let's see the first one. The first one is, we are non-native speakers. So I'm from India, right? I'm not a native speaker. Uh, my first language is not English. It's something else, right? Depending on the state and depending on my mother tongue. Hence, I will not be listening to English all the time. That is very close to our next reason, which is we are not engrossed with the language. That means I have to speak it, then only then, only then I'll speak it. That's like a compulsion. This is this one. Now, when I go to work or when I go to school or university, then only then I'm forced to speak in the language that is English. Otherwise, at home, I use my own language. That is my mother tongue. These two reasons makes, makes it very hard for us to, you know, get nine bands. Now, I cannot, you know, get to be a native speaker suddenly. But yes, I can change at least this one. Yeah, maybe if you believe in, you know, you know, you're dying again and taking birth again. Let's just forget about it. But if you get engrossed with the language, you can change that part. Yeah, that, that you agree with me. Every day, two to three hours of listening continuously will definitely change that thing. Yeah. Now, <clears throat> the English language is an issue. So why not solve it? Yes. Let me show you an example of how to solve it. Let's say you listen to English songs. Why the sad face? I'll tell you. When you listen to the English songs, you're enjoying the music and you're understanding 50 or let's say 60% of the, the, the lyrics of it. Why not fully? Why not 100%? The way you understand in your native uh, language, the reason is because you can't speak English as a native speaker, right? But what if I provide you lyrics? Well, definitely your sad face will be converted to happy face and you understand 100% of the song. Hence, I would suggest you initially, when you're listening to audios, always use lyrics or subtitles or any file which can be a help while you're listening to the audios. That will give you an illusion that, oh, you not just illusion, actually you'll start enjoying, you know, the listening to the English part. Otherwise, this is like swimming. You go to the swimming pool, somebody pulls you in and you are just drowning just hating it because this that was a bad experience. Don't just drown yourself in English, right? Try to understand some part of it and then you'll start enjoying. This is called joy of learning. And this was a concept created by Leonardo da Vinci, one of my favorite. He said, if you learn a little bit, automatically the graph goes higher once you understand it. And eventually you reach to the expertise level. So. To, in order to make it clear, in order to learn it, you have to understand it, all right? In that case, I have to use lyrics initially or subtitles or any file that is a catalyst or that's a help. But now I don't need to because I have done this plenty of the time. Before you even start preparing for IELTS, start doing this, okay? Watch a lot of English movies. I know I'm the only trainer who's pushing you towards movies. Otherwise, all the teachers and parents say, don't watch movies, right? TV series, which are good, and especially British accent TV series, why we have discussed earlier, you can see that, yeah? Now, 
let's talk about sections themselves. Yeah, there are four different sections in IELTS. And these sections are um, divided, uh, these sections are from 40 questions. Yes, there's an S missing here, by the way. <laughs> when we say four sections, each section has 10 questions. Yes, you can see that by itself. And there'll be breaks between sections. Now, what does it mean by breaks, breaks between sections? I've explained once in previous video. And if you have not um, seen that, let me explain again. So there are four sections, right? Between these sections, they'll be taking breaks. That means they'll stop the audio and let you evaluate or let you see what's happening, what kind of question you will be uh, bombarded with. Okay, that's what I mean by breaks between sections. Just remember 40 questions, four sections, and in between each section, there'll be breaks. Okay, more information about sections is the difficulty level. The difficulty level definitely going to increase with increase in section. That means with every section, it's going to go higher. Hence, section one is the easiest and section four is the most difficult one. Okay, this you have to understand so that you get ready for the audio. If in case you, you don't understand the difficulty level, you'll be, you, you might listen to the first section and say, oh, that was easy. I can get any score I want. Like, you know, I can get 40. But as section increases, you get scared. Oh, this is getting difficult for me. So I have to tell you already, the difficulty level is going to increase with every section. Now, how are they going to increase the difficulty level? The first one is speed. In section one, they're going to speak really slow. Like you can understand, anyone can understand who is who's speaking a little bit English even. In section two, the speed is going to increase by a little bit as well. In my opinion, section three and section four has almost similar speed. And they are the most difficult one, like a non-Indian speaker. Talking about the next factor which makes it difficult is distractions. Now these distractions are something which we have to see while we are understanding question types. For example, there's an audio being played and I say, um, yeah, I would like to buy this uh, toy, but I have only $12 left. And the other person says, um, I don't think $12 will do. Oh wait, I have $12.50. Now, if in case you write this as an answer, you're incorrect. So they distracted you, right? Here, the correct answer is 1250. These distractions are gonna increase with increase in section. So section one might have some, but section three or four will have plenty of them, you know, like more distractions and difficult one which to catch, right? So that's the second factor. The third factor is the types of questions. Let me give an example of that. Though we're gonna see and practice in the same uh, video today, but let me give an example so that you get uh, get to know what I mean by that. Let's talk about fill in the blanks. Yeah, so we have a question here and a blank here. Now, if an audio being played, it's fairly easy compared to the question called MCQs. That is multiple choice question. The reason we have a question here and now we have four options. For an example, generally there are three. Now, let's say we have three options. You have to read the question as well as the options. Now you understand what I mean by types of questions. Here, you just have to read one statement and fill the answer according to the audio. However, in MCQs, all you gotta do is listen to the audio, read the question, read the options and choose one of them. Of course, this is difficult. And these kind of questions are generally asked in section three. And trust me, I have seen this is the question length and the option length is even bigger. I mean, the options are lengthier. You have to read more in the option rather than question. That makes it difficult. Yeah, this is how difficulty level increases with section. And the last one is in the last section, there are no breaks. So section one will have breaks inside them. So in section one, we have one to 10 questions. Section two has 11 to 20. Section three is 21 to 30 and the final one is fourth is 31 to 40. Here they will say, please have a look at question one to six and they'll take a break. I mean, they'll play the audio and then take a break and they say, look at question seven to 10. Same way in here till section three, 
there will be breaks in between the section as well as in the sections. But in section four, they'll tell you, have a look at question 31 to 40. So what are you gonna do? There's, there are no breaks, right? 10 questions being uh, in front of you and the audio will be played for them. So this is one of the uh, factors for difficulty level to increase. You understand how difficulty level is increasing and what are the reasons for them to increase now? Well, of course, when we practice the section question, you will see what it means by difficulty level increasing. Yeah, good. Now moving ahead, we have why sections, right? Why don't I put all the 40 questions in one go? Why do we have to divide it in four, 10 questions each? And you know, like this kind of structure, why didn't I get 40 all of them? Just play the audio, I'll try to solve it. The reason for that is they want to test your listening in various contexts. Now, what is meaning of context? Context is various environments, situations, or let's say, for example, I'm talking about science and suddenly I'm talking about general topic. So science will be academic and general will be like restaurants and stuff. So in order to test your various context, they have to have sections. Let me caution you one more thing. In academic or general training, there's no difference in listening. That's why they have four sections in which they have academic context as well as general training context, both of them. So there won't be any different paper for listening. It'll be same, okay? What I mean by context is, so we have four sections, four contexts, four difficulty levels, four contexts, um, and also four different types of questions. I mean, types will be more, but four different sets. So, um, this um, the understanding the section is important for a reason. Another reason is you will be ready for kind of audio that is being played. So I tell you, section one. Um, see, the, as I said, it'll, you'll be ready for that. Let me explain this more. We have section one, right? In section one, what happens is actually you will be hearing a conversation and between two people, exactly two people. Let's say there's a phone call, all right? So I'm calling someone and somebody is picking the call and I'm a person who is sitting in a company and trying to get information about my clients. And I ask them, um, hi, am I talking to XYZ? They'll say, yes, this is XYZ. Um, actually, you forgot your this thing in my office. How can I send this to you? They'll say, oh, I'm sorry for that. Um, maybe you can send it to my um, office address. Or can you tell me your office address? Now, when this is all going on, it's always between two people in section one. And it's always a conversation. Because this is a conversation and this is a slow one, it's easy to understand. Like I said earlier, difficulty level in section one is fairly easy. Because there's a conversation between two people mainly on call, the kind of question being used or kind of context being used is everyday social context. Like I forget my this thing or I would like to get a quotation on something or for example, um, yeah, I, I would like to book for this uh, contest. How can I book for it? I say, oh, you can book from a website. So two people talking fairly easy and social context. Now you understand what I mean by that, yeah? Let me show you an example here. See, two people are talking here. So there's a customer, David, and there's a person who is talking to the customer. This is called form filling. Now I've showed you an answer for a reason. I'm not uh, playing the audio. I'll be playing the audio later in another question type. So the kind of question you might get is called form filling or MCQs maximum. Generally form filling are the common ones. Here's the name of the person. They'll play an audio. Um, Hi, um, I'm David Marshall. And when they say this name, they're gonna, of course, uh, dictate it to you, right? Spell it for you, M-A-R-S-H-A-L-L, -L, Marshall. How to solve this kind of question is not the scope of this video. You will see it later. Okay, by the way, I got it from IELTS.org USA. So it's um, just for practice, it's not for practice, it's just to show you what kind of question to be used. It's not for practice here. Here we have mentioned how, what's the term of it? Answer is 180 days. Don't worry about this here, but what I mean to say is kind of question you asked, 
it's fairly simple and it is just form filling yeah now you have to fill forms in this kind of question like i said and mostly on calls so there's a tiny problem that might happen you might not be able to hear the voice clearly here so i suggest you to keep the volume of the headphones which you'll be receiving in listening section a little bit higher than normal because it's on call right that will be suggest that will be advisable for a reason see there are two people talking the first person and the second one first is the caller and the last and second one the receiver the receiver might not you might not he, be able to hear the receiver person caller you'll definitely hear clearly like you see in movies you know when a person calls one person to another one they try to show you as if we are showing you the voice on the line you know the voice recording of the line same way hence i would suggest you to keep the volume a little bit higher so you can hear it all right let's talk about section two in this section there are some differences of course like section one difficulty level gonna increase but most importantly we have a monologue this time and context gonna stay the same that is everyday social context but what is the meaning of monologue Earlier we have a con we had a conversation, right? This time, monologue, single person speaking about something related to social context. Let's take an example: um, a person talking about the benefits of the service station, or benefits of the railway station in the society, or anything. I mean, in the in the city, anything related to social context, but a monologue. Yeah, let me give you an example this time so that you get e that is easier easier for you. But before, it's fairly easy compared to section three, but a little bit difficult than section one. The types of question asked here are plenty, like MCQs, short question and answer, sentence completion, diagram labeling, and all those stuff or map labeling. You can say that you have to label the map. Now. We're gonna see each question as a separate video where I'm gonna explain you, uh, explain it to you how we're gonna solve these kind of questions. So tips and tricks are coming later. That is in the coming videos or coming sessions. Don't worry about that. And here I'm just giving an, uh, a short idea, uh, a tiny idea that these kind of questions might come up in this kind of section. That is section two. Now let's see an example. Here we have MCQs, right? So there's one question and three options. One question and three options, like in 11, 12, and 13, 14, 15. Your task is to listen to 11 to 15, the audio, and choose any of these, any of the letter, depending on the audio. I'm gonna play the audio. You have to listen and write in your book, okay? Let me just play the audio first. Section two. You will hear a woman introducing the Lunar Realm Amusement Park. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 15. Now listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 15. Good morning, everyone. We're very pleased to have you here at Lunar Realm for our September Celebration Day. We have many smaller celebrations throughout the year for different events. I think it was five at last count. But the September Celebration is a special day to honor the park's development, from tiny beginnings to the huge enterprise it is today. It's our most significant annual event. Come into the visitor center now. Over here, you can see a picture of the original park when it was under construction. The land was donated to the city in 1955 by the then mayor, Matthew Hardacre. But the park itself wasn't developed until 1979. And you'll notice it wasn't very big at that time. Then there was a huge growth in the 1990s and we're still growing today. In the beginning, there were only a few small rides in the park. There were lots of other attractions in those days, including an adventure playground for younger kids. The kids loved the petting zoo with its farm animals. And in fact, 
That's the only attraction to have survived until now. We've still kept two of the original rides as an exhibit, but they're not in working order anymore. We're now one of the biggest amusement parks in the country. We've got an amazing range of amusement rides here, 43 in total this year. I think we're most famous for our roller coasters, aren't we? I guess you'll all have heard about the Hurricane. That's our oldest and most famous one. Some of our visitors think it's not fast enough to be truly exciting. But we love it because it's the highest wooden roller coaster in the country. Then we have the Bobcat. That one's a bit gentler for our younger visitors. And for the truly adventurous, the scream machine hurls you upside down and backwards at huge speeds. It's too much for me. It's important to remember that all of our rides have age guidelines. And to help you, there's a color system. If the sign for a ride is yellow, it means it's suitable for all ages, although we do recommend that parents or older siblings go with very young children. Blue means that children younger than 14 can ride only if an adult accompanies them. And black, well, this means that you must be at least 110 centimeters tall to ride, regardless of age. We should say that no rides are really suitable for children younger than 18 months, but we do have a special section for parents with babies. All right, we are back now. I don't know what did you write as answer, but I'm going to show you the answer so that you can verify your, in your own books. These are the answers. For 11th, we have C. For 12th, B. For 13th, B as well. For 14th, A. And 15th, C. Okay. See, these MCQs are actually very short. These kind of MCQs do come in section 2. Section 3 will have also MCQs mainly, but a little bit longer one. I, I think you got an idea what is difficult and what is easy listening to section 2. So compared to this, section 1 is easier. If you get all the answer correct in here, most probably you'll get correct answer in section 1. But we cannot say anything for section 3 though. Yeah. Now section 3, as I said, in my opinion actually is the most difficult one. People say section 4 is difficult, but it is not because of question type. Section 3 is a conversation and maybe two or four people are involved yeah how they are involved let's talk about it in a while um this is difficult due to mainly mcqs see i told you earlier let's say this is the question and we have options longer than the questions what are you going to do you will take time to read the question and by the time you're reading the options already the audio has been played for the answer or the hint where your answer might lie is gone so what is the solution for that? Well, there is a tip or there is a trick kind of stuff that you can use in order to find the answer here. Don't worry about it for now. I will solve this problem for you. Yeah, you will get definitely good score in MCQs once you know how to do that. For now, you have to focus only on listening and understanding what really sections are and what might happen in each section. All right, that would be a good idea. Go step by steps, you know, steps are easy. Now, now let me tell you what is the meaning of steps though, first. So let's say these are the steps of getting to the expertise level. Initially, you don't know what you don't know. All right, here you know what you don't know. So this is the step we are right now. You have no idea what sections are. You have no idea if we have breaks even. So that is your knowing, oh, there are breaks. Now, I didn't know this, but I know now. You practice what you know. What does it mean? I have section one, two, three told you about, you know, now you know what you didn't know. Now you're gonna practice what you know. You're gonna practice the type of question we have. And once you practice, you reach the highest point that is expertise. What if you try to jump from here to here? Not gonna happen. Definitely not going to happen. The reason for that is you have no idea what's going to be asked in section 3. You have no idea if section 3 even exists and you're going to try to be an expert. Hmm, chances are you're going to fall back here. So I suggest you go step by step, knowing everything and then trying the questions. Okay, so these videos might be lack of exam. This video might not have much examples, but suggest me they are required for your own, you know, betterment. That is your better score all right 
Now I have not included any example in here. I would like to, but I don't want to. I don't want to scare you, honestly. Um, when we're understanding each question type, I'll let you know if this question type can come up in exam or not. Okay? And this is an academic context. What is the meaning of academic context? The meaning is that you will be listening something like two students speaking. So let's say two students speaking and one professor comes and uh, advises these two students. Or maybe just two students speaking and they're discussing, oh, I have a project. How can I solve this? How can I solve that? You have to listen to their talks and write the answers. So context will be academic. Talks will be related to academic. That is study related. Yeah. All right. Now comes section four, the last but not the least. In my opinion, this is the most interesting section. People call it difficult, but I find it a little bit easier than section three. The only difficulty I find it is the there's no break. Yeah, we'll discuss that. It's a monologue, hence a professor or an expert gonna talk about a research generally. This question has a research being dictated. So kind of a scientific paper being dictated and you will have plenty of questions like, uh, you know, you have fill in the blanks or summary completion kind of question. The reason it is difficult, as I said, is there are no breaks. You have to answer question number 31 to 40 in a single go. No breaks. This is where things get a little bit hazy. The reason is, see, we can't concentrate more than five minutes on an audio. But this will be playing for eight minutes, seven to eight minutes, the last section, continuous audio. And one person is speaking, again, this is a trouble. When two people are speaking, we can recognize who's speaking, who's not. But one person speaking on something academic, oh God, that can get boring as well as, you know, you might lose concentration. That's the reason I call it difficult. That's the only reason. Otherwise, the question type being asked here, fairly easy. Okay. As I said, fairly easy because it's summary completion question type. You can easily find the answers. MCQs are rare <coughs> and it is academic context that is, you know, study related. As I said, research being uh, spoken. So I don't think it's a big trouble for you once you know how to solve section three. Now, when I say academic context, I didn't mean that you'll be talking about rocket science or anything which you can't understand. Of course, you can understand. But little bit study related things, you know, college related or school related and anything like that, they'll be talking about that. For an example, um, formation of rock, how, what is the process? They'll talk about the process in the question types. They'll ask you about that. Yeah. And with this, we end the chapter, the introduction to the accents. Now, this is going to be a very short video, but an informative one, right? Let's see what are the various accents included in listening. That means what kind of S accents you'll be hearing in the listening module. There are possibly British accent, American accent, Australian accent, Canadian, Indian, and Russian. Now I'm not saying these are the only accents you'll be hearing. Possibly you might hear more, but the chances are these are the most used ones. Which one will be used for 80 to 90%? I think you know already which one, right? But we'll see that as well. But for now, remember, if you have an idea about these a little bit even, you're good to go. Why do we have accents and why are we studying them? We need to understand the audio. Yeah, that's the main reason. Anytime you listen to an accent, this is the most important part that you have to understand it. Trust me, if you do understand and all the accents which I've mentioned, not a problem, right? And most of you do. But when things go a little bit fast, you know, when somebody is speaking quickly, it gets a little bit difficult for us to understand accents. I I remember when I was watching Sherlock for the first time, oh, it was a horrible experience. Trust me, it was horrible. I had to include subtitles, but later it become it was into practice and I was fine. Now, what is the difference between pronunciation and accent? I'll tell you the difference. Here we have a word which is written this way. I'm going to pronounce it in a way. So this is called tomato in British accent. In American accent is called tomato. They try to say this. They, they are very clear about their T, the British. 
In a British accent, in American accent, they call it towards D. While in Indian accent and some of the Asian accent, we try to combine both and we call it tomato. So from tomato, from tomato, we call it tomato. So we mix both, right? That's this pronunciation in each accent. You see, accent is a style of speaking. Pronunciation is how you pronounce a word. If this is incorrect, you will lose marks in speaking probably, but in listening, you gotta get this one clear because you don't have to speak, you have to understand. All right, so that's the difference. And I hope you understand what I mean by that, okay? See, this is I was talking about earlier because the test is being created by Cambridge English, that is in UK, 80 to 90% will be British accent. That means all the audios, let's say, or not all, most of the audios will be British accent. Sometime when you listen to another person in the audio, it will be Indian accent, Canadian accent, or American accent, or maybe um, Russian accent. Very rarely though. So we have to get British accent clear rather than anything else, okay? Sadly, the problem is most of our movies that we watch are in American accent. I mean, the Hollywood movies, what I mean by that. And we get to know words from here. I suggest you start watching British accent movies like uh, you might have heard Harry, you might have seen Harry Potter and the accent which you hear in that movie is British accent. There are plenty of TV series uh, series that you can watch which are in British accent. That, those will help you to go through the accent and the sound of the accent, okay? Watch out when you search about it if it has British accent or American accent. You can search about the movie and figure it out by reading about it, all right? Let's see alphabet. There are many doubts or let's say there are many misconceptions what is the difference between alphabet, words and letters. So this is the first one I'm talking about, alphabet. Second one is the letter. And the third one is a word. So letter is actually each symbol in a set of alphabet. Yes, you heard me right. From A to Z is a set of alphabet. This A itself is called letter. Letter A, B is a letter, C is a letter. We combine many letters to form words, which makes sense. For example, cat is a word in which C is a letter, A is a letter and T is a letter. But they are taken from a set called alphabet. Never call it alphabets from now because that's incorrect. For that, we need many sets, right? From A to Z, then we need to take another language, take their set of alphabet. That's one alphabet set. So let me show you how the alphabet set looks like. You're very familiar with this from your childhood, right? The ABCs of uh, English. The thing is, we started with ABCs of English. Now, why do we need this in British accent? Sometime, what they're gonna do is they're gonna ask you to write the name by pronouncing it. For an example, they'll say, my name is Matthew. Now this is a name. A name will have to be pronounced, dictated to you, each letter separately. In that case, if you haven't read, uh, you haven't understood the alphabet in British accent, you're gonna stumble somewhere because the A or E is a little bit different than Indian or Asian alphabet set, yep. So let's start with the way we say in India or in Asia and the way it is said in British accent. It's called A, but in American, or um, my, my bad, in British accent, it's called A. They, they pull the back and they say, they call it like this, A. B is called B in here normally, but in British accent, it's called B, C, D, A. You see that the tone is like A, it's like going down from top. So A, F, G, H. A big difference come big difference comes here. It's I, not I. I is like literally dropping it down suddenly, but I. So this is A and I. Sometimes they make mis I mean we make mistake between I and A. This is A and this is I. When they speak it out in British accent, we misunderstand them. 
the watch out for these two okay j k l m n o p q r s t u v w x y z you can see now there's kind of i tone in every letter they pronounce and that's the way it is so next time when they say m a t h e w that is matthew yeah please watch out for these two these are the culprit for our mistakes i have seen plenty of the people who are writing the test they make mistake in this yeah moving ahead we have numbers as well which are important why are they important i'll tell you so when they are right when we are listening stuff we will be listening for phone numbers yeah we'll be listening for pin codes generally in section 1 when they are form filling which we will see in the coming video they're going to uh, they're going to dictate the numbers phone numbers and you have to write as answers so hence it's important for you to know about numbers yes especially one number and that is zero it's the biggest hero i would call it a villain actually most of the people you know make mistakes in here or they are confused what did they just say because zero we think is a zero it is pronounced in many ways so the first one is not or not depending on british and american not it's not just zero it sometimes is called not you might have heard in movies you might hear a four not four error this is very common one that they say they don't say 404 they call it 404 not four, right second one is null in little bit technical um, background is called null otherwise zero commonly and the last one very famous one in uk is o so the phone number here is 0456 and remaining away so they start with o 456 you might think what is this o now do i have to write o by the time you think this much already they have dictated the remaining of the number and you're gone you will be in trouble you're thinking what just happened did i miss everything and in this thing you'll panic and two answers are gone just because of this villain as i said initially it's either a hero or a villain yeah so what happens when they are dictating number how to take care of this there's something called mini pause that will be there when dictating number let me show you the difference how we think and how really a number are pronounced so we think number are pronounced like this 6356236295 no never numbers are not pronounced like this on television or in exam they are pronounced like this 6356236295 Six two nine five. You see, when I said this thing, there was a mini pause between these. So I said this way: six three five, six two three, six two nine five. You see, there was a pause here. Please write down numbers when there's a mini pause. So when they group, they group either three numbers or four numbers, or sometimes they also say like something like mm, double six. double two so this double or triple whatever it is they'll take breaks after that very tiny pause in that time you write it down just don't start writing immediately as soon as they start write it here here and here right i hope i'm clear about this this is going to help you to take the number or note down the number easily okay proceeding we have pronunciation Now see pronunciation is something i've discussed initially in this video we can't have the best pronunciation because you know the way we are we are non native speakers but still what we can do is if we are dedicated we can try to get as as better as possible yeah from our previous version that's how it should be where can we get the best pronunciation or the perfect pronunciation it's called dictionary.cambridge.org Now if you go to this website this is the best source in my opinion when you search a word you will get pronunciation as b and a in there and there will be an audio symbol in front of this thing what you will get to hear is each accent that you can speak for i mean 
where, where it is pronounced. So it will be in British accent and American accent both. Whatever is applicable to you, what do you think you are using, you will check. If and if you think you're wrong, replace it in your mind and keep repeating it. So what I generally do is I look at a word, for example, this one which we have seen initially. I read the word and I say, this is tomato for sure. But then I listen to in, in the website, in the British accent, they call it tomato. And American call it tomato. So definitely I'm wrong, right? Now, what to do with this website and how to practice? If you go to Wikipedia or any, um, you can search in Google itself, we have 1500 to 10,000 most commonly used English words. I would suggest you go in the middle, go for 5,000 most commonly used English words and keep searching these words in the website. So first you pronounce an, a word and you search in the website and check, oh, I was wrong. For that, you have to sit on the computer or your phone, pronounce the word first and check in the website. Okay, I was right. In that case, you take it. Okay, this word is done. I know this word. This word is done. I know. Maybe you might not know. Just cross it out. That means only practice required here, not other places, right? So this is how you're going to practice using dictionary.cambridge.org. They have a search bar. You can search and get the real pronunciation. We are still at listening module and today we're going to see a question type called form completion. Now, what is this form completion? Form completion is nothing. Let's say I call you to get information, right? So there is a form that I have to fill while listening to your information. What's your name? What is your email ID? What is your phone number? So I have to fill this form. It's mostly on a phone, right? You might have heard this when somebody calls you for a credit card or any information that have, have to be received on other side. This is called form completion. All right. Now, this is always in section one. If you don't know what is section one, I suggest you watch the video about listening sections. I have included all the information required to understand what sections are. There are total four sections, section one, section two, section three and section four. Difficulty level always increases from section one to section four. And because it always comes, I mean the question type that is form completion always in section one is the most easiest, though there are some tricks or pointers to understand, but it's comparatively easy than other question types, okay? In here, it will be a conversation like in section one always. So two people are Two people are talking on a call and they're exchanging information, right? As they are talking on call, remember the two sides, that is one who is calling and the one who is receiving the call, that is the caller and the receiver. So one is calling, one is receiving. The person who's receiving the call will have low volume. So you might have seen in movies, the person who is calling, you will get a clear voice However, on the other side, you might hear as if it is recorded. Same way here, you will get low volume on the other side. I suggest you, you keep your volume a little bit higher. Yeah, high volume, the, how can you do that? Remember, in exam, you will get headphones, okay? You have all the rights or you have control over the volume. Hence, I suggest you when you have section one, keep the volume a little bit higher. This is one simple, simple trip that can help you to get better score in section one, especially form completion, right? Next thing is example. Without looking at what kind of question you will be bombarded with, it will be hard for you to understand it. Let's see one now. This is how form completion looks like, okay? There will be a title, there will be instructions, and below they have questions, right? Let me play the audio. By the way, this is from IELTS.org USA. They have given some samples. So I've included just to give you information how it looks like. Okay, I'm gonna play the audio and you're gonna answer these questions as when you are listening to the audio. So you ready for that? Let's go for it. Section one. You will hear a conversation between a clerk at the inquiries desk of a transport company and a man who is asking for travel information. First, you have some time to look at questions 1, 
to five. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions one to five. Good morning, Travel Link. How can I help you? Good morning. I live in Bayswater, and I'd like to get to Harbour City tomorrow before eleven a.m. Well, to get to Bayswater. No, no. I live in Bayswater. My destination is Harbour City. Oh, sorry. Right. So that's Bayswater to Harbour City. Are you planning to travel by bus or train? I don't mind really. Whichever option is faster, I suppose. Well, if you catch a railway express, that'll get you there in under an hour. Let's see. Yes, if you can make the nine thirty a.m. express, I'd recommend you do that. Great. Which station does that leave from? Helendale is the nearest train station to you. Did you say Helensvale? No, Helendale. That's H E L E N D A L E. What's the best way to get to the Helendale station then? Well, hang on a minute while I look into that. Now it seems to me that you have two options. Option one would be to take the seven o six bus from the Bayswater Shopping Centre to Central Street. When you get there, you transfer to another bus, which will take you to the station. Or the second option, if you don't mind walking a couple of kilometres, is to go directly to Central Street and get straight on the bus going to the train station. Okay, which bus is that? The seven nine two will take you to the station. I guess the walk will be good for me, so that might be the better option. What time do I catch the seven nine two? There are two buses that should get you to the station on time, one just before nine o'clock and one just after. But look, at that time of the morning, it might be better to take the earlier one, just in case there's a traffic jam or something. The eight fifty five is probably safer than the nine o five. Yeah, I don't want to miss the train, so I'll be sure to get on the five to nine bus. And we are back. I hope you found all the answers, and I hope you found them correct because we're gonna look at the answers now. For the first one, it's nine thirty a.m. For the second one, Helendale. For the third one, Central Station. Fourth one, number or n o or hash. I mean a pound sign. You can call it hash, and then. Seven nine two. It's universally accepted, and hence you can also use it. And last one, eight fifty five a.m. Remember, if it's a spelling mistake here, it's incorrect, right? Let's see. Now let's see some pointers. What is what are these pointers? Pointers are tips that help you to get the answers easily. They make your life easy while you're looking for answers while listening to the audio. So you might, from now, you will be getting tips which are called pointers in your、um, all question types. So when I say pointers in my audio or in the video, what I mean is tips that can help you find the answers. Let's see the first one for this kind of question. Instructions are very important, and where are those instructions? Where are they hidden? Let's see the question type which you have seen recently. I mean previously in two points earlier. As I said, always read the instruction. But what to read? We'll see. You see, in here we have this question that you'll get in exam. In that, this one is the instruction. Yeah, these are the instruction that you'll get in exam. Write no more than two words and or a number for each answer. Let me just zoom in to get an idea what it means by that. What does it mean? No more than two words. Means you cannot go beyond two. You can write answer as one word or two words. For an example, I say, "cute cat." Well, cats are my favorite, so this is correct. If I add a cute cat, it's incorrect. So watch out. When they have mentioned not more than two words, it has to be two words or one word. What if they have mentioned not more than four words? Then it is four words allowed, so you can have one, two, three, or four max. 
You cannot write more than four words. Now, what is this last part? And or a number for each answer. When they say and or a number, it means that you can add a number to these two words. If it is a number. What I mean by that, I'll show you. See, we have an answer here, which we have seen earlier, 9.30 a.m., right? You see that 9.30 is a number and then a.m. is a word. Let's say we have an example where we say two little boats. This won't be a trouble. The reason is we have fulfilled the two words instruction or the uh, rule and then number is added this is still fine according to the instruction right you might be thinking oh this is three these are not three this is one word second word and or a number this is still fine okay i hope you understand what i mean by that good and it is really important if in case it comes like you have only one word to write you cannot write two words remember that now moving ahead we have to predict prediction is important what is the meaning of prediction? Let's see. So this is the question which you have seen recently. I mean the question paper. What would you predict for this answer? What kind of information can be predicted? The information that can be predicted is what will be the answer or the part of speech and who will be providing the answer. Why did I write who? See, this is always a conversation. I think we have seen that earlier that this is section one in section one it is conversation between two people so who will be providing you answer you can get an idea from predicting second thing what will be the answer just a guess or you can guess the part of speech now what are these part of speech i think you know what part of speech is if you don't in detail please go through the grammar video the first video itself will be helping you what are part of speech in detail right so we have nouns, verbs, adverbs, adjectives, pronouns. You must be knowing this eight, okay? If you don't, as I said, go to the video. Now you can predict. Expert, express train leaves at, it could be a time. The nearest station is, could be what? The name of a station, that's noun, right? Same way you predict the answer because you will be given time to read the question. Right, five of these questions, you will be given time. In that time, you predict, you expect an answer. It will get easier for you rather than just suddenly listen to the audio and write the answer. This has saved much time and much uh, answers just by prediction. Prediction, yeah. Second is, um, I mean, third is sequence. Now, what is the meaning of sequence? Let's see. Audio is always, always, always played in the sequence with the question. Let's see the questions again. When you look at this, we have question one, question two, three, four, five. When the audio is being played, they'll talk about this information, number one. Then they'll talk about this information, number two. There can be inf information between these, but what they can't do is they'll talk about information number four and then suddenly go back to one. They cannot. They have to go in the same sequence, always in every kind of question and listening they have to go in the same sequence. Remember that sequence is important and you should get an idea what it means. Okay, good. Now, if there are some blanks in the statement, I mean, then it is a question. What if there are no blanks? Still, it is important to understand the sequence. What I mean by this one is, let's say there are no blank, there's no blank here, they've given the answer here. You should be listening to this as well for a reason you have to maintain the sequence, right? What if this answer is provided by them and they continue talking about it and you say, oh, there's no question here. There's no blank here. I can go proceed here. No, because you might miss where is the next one coming. This gives you a hint, this number three, number 706 bus, when they describe it, now you know, okay, now I have to jump to this one because they have described this one. Hence, if there are no blanks provided in the statement, they won't call it number three, they will call this one three, but that is important for you to follow the sequence. Okay, good. Next one is unit and names. One of my favorite and most people make mistake in this one as well. Now, what is the meaning of unit? Let's say here we have seen some of the question. I just removed the um, 
the instructions. I just put this uh, directly questions. Express train leaves at some time. Now, in this case, they have not provided in the end the time. Is it a.m. or p.m.? And if in the audio they say 8 a.m. And in the answer you provide just 8, it's incorrect. Because they have mentioned the unit in the audio, not in the blank. Hence, for an ex another example, they say 8 kilos. So 8 kilogram is the answer instead of just writing 8. Here you can use the form short form kg, right? You can write 8 kg. But if they have not provided here k as kg in the end, you have to write 8 kg. Another example, they, have, they are saying it will, it's going to cost you $21. So if you don't write like this or the word dollars, then it's incorrect. So the rule is if it is provided the unit in the question or after the blank, you don't include it. If it is not provided, you do include it. So the rule is if it is provided after the blank, don't include it. If it is not provided, please include it. Right. So another example, you can say that um, the the thread was two meters long and they have mentioned like this the whole question and there's the blank here for two meters long now here see they have mentioned the meter you have to just write two or two if i write here two meters again i have mentioned it twice because question itself they have mentioned here that will be incorrect i hope i'm clear about this part now if they have provided, don't include it. If they have not provided, please include it. That will make it easier for you. Next one. So in here, you can say the same thing. You can check with your answers and see if they have not, if they have provided or not provided. In this example, they have not provided. Hence, you have to include it. And now check your answers. If you have not included your AMs and PMs, it's incorrect. Be harsh to yourself initially while checking the answers. Otherwise, you know, you'll get lenient and in exam, you get deductions. Now, what about names? If they have mentioned names, they've, they're going to dictate it. Yes. For an example, you have name called Matthew. They say, hi, my name is Matthew. My name is Matthew James, my full name. And James is provided as blank. Your task is to write James over there but you don't know what's, how to spell James, right? And they're gonna dictate it for you. All the names are dictated when they're answers. They'll say J-A-M-E-S, right? So remember, if it's dictated, probably it's an answer. Remember one more thing, this is important. Please be quick while writing the answers while, when the audio is being played. Uh, what I mean by this is, Let's say we have a question here and they are playing the audio and suddenly I heard the answer, right? When I hear the answer, I'm going to write it like this. When I'm writing like this, I'll try to be, if, if I am doing it incorrectly, I'll try to be as clear as possible in my question paper. I'll try to write answer properly. But remember, all the answers have to be copied in the answer sheet in the end you will get extra time for that don't worry about that hence try to write it as quick as possible don't worry about the handwriting it should be legible by you that's it in the question paper so the reason for that is so that you don't miss the audio for the next one the hint for the next one write the answer quickly and follow the audio as quick as possible in this way you might not lose the sequence or might not lose the flow of the audio else Chances are you're going to miss the next one. And once one answer is missed, well, next one is missed as well because you are in panic mode. I've heard from people they missed one or one answer or two answers and they missed five to six because of that. Because they lost the sequence, they lost the track and all the answers are lost. One single mistake of just, you know, trying to get your handwriting better, they lost it. Even in the question paper. Yeah, I, I think I have told you enough that you will get extra time to write the answers to the answer sheet that will be given separately. So what you write and how you write in the question paper doesn't matter much. Okay, and that's the end of the chapter. You're going to see 
table completion, which is a question type in listening module. Remember, we are going through all the question types and providing you pointers and the examples of listening modules. If you continue with us, you will see all the other modules as well, like reading, writing and speaking. OK, let's proceed. So what is this table completion anyway? You will be given a table and in where some of the information will be there, but some missing, right? So for example, we have here a, a statement provided and here there'll be a blank again statement provided. So table completion is nothing, but you complete the table, you fill in the table, right? Let's proceed then. It is similar to con sentence completion. For example, we have a sentence and we have some blank. Then we have another sentence with a blank. The only difference, but the only difference is this will be in the form of a table. So what will be the major differences when you're forming a table? Yes, you heard you thought of it. I think you got it right. It has to have columns as well as rows. That's the major difference in a table compared to sentences, right? Now let's see an example so that you get to get clear what will be asked in exam or what kind of question will come up. Table completion looks like this. In here, we have some question. I mean, we have some instructions to write. We have word count and here we have the questions. You see questions are written as numbers, as you can see here and here and here, all these things. Let me just clear it up so that you can do it. Now I'll be playing the audio for you to practice just beginning. I mean, of course, I'll be providing you pointers later, but first you just do it and see how it works. It'll take you not more than two minutes, right? So be ready for the audio. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 6 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 6 to 10. By the way, how much will I have to pay in fares? Well, you can get a ticket on the bus for $1.80 cash and you'll need $10 each way for the train. Wait, do you have a travel link card? No, but I can get one before tomorrow. OK, well that'll make it considerably cheaper then. The bus will cost $1.50 each way and the train will be... The train to Harbour City will still cost ten dollars because you'll be traveling during peak hours in the morning so no savings there i'm afraid however if you could come back at an off-peak time what does that mean well if you could start your return journey before 5 p.m or later than half past seven in the evening actually i wasn't planning on coming back till at least eight o'clock anyway oh in that case you can make quite a saving if you use your travel link card you did say you were planning to purchase one didn't you yes i'll pick one up later today good that would mean your return train journey would only cost you $7.15 with your card. Thank you. Is there anything else I can help you with? Actually, there is. Do you know if I can use the travel link card on ferries? If you're thinking of the Harbour City ferries that go back and forth between the North and South Bank, those are the commuter ferries, then yes. A one-way trip costs $4.50, but with your card you'd make a 20% saving and only pay $3.55. So $3.55 for the commuter ferry. What about the tour boats? You mean the tourist ferries that go upriver on sightseeing tours? No, they only take cash or credit card. They're not part of the Travel Link company. Oh, I see. I don't suppose you know the cost of a tour. In actual fact, I do, because I took a friend on the trip upriver just last week. We decided on the afternoon tour, and that was $35 each. But I understand that you can do the whole day for $65. Thank you. You've been a great help. My pleasure. Enjoy your day out. That is the end of section one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. OK, so we are back. I hope you find all the answers. And let's see what is the solution for this. Solution is number one, 1 1.80, seven, second, 7.30, third, 7.15, ninth, commuter, and tenth afternoon. 
okay if you got all correct wonderful if not don't worry the pointer is going to help you to go through this now what are these pointers we have discussed it earlier pointers are just tips or tricks or some kind of uh, advices that can um, help you to go through the answer of questions and find the answers easily or quickly yeah the first one is rows and columns most important in a table i think we talked about it that in a table there's the only difference than you know fill in the blanks you have rows and columns which provide information about what will be in below that so look at here let me just get rid of some of the parts so that we can focus on rows and columns and let me zoom in if you look here we have cash fare card fare so when they talk about cash fare they're going to talk about in this column when they talk about card fare they're going to talk about this column when they talk about transport what kind of transportation is used we are going to talk about this column now look at the rows right bus when they talk about bus cash fare they're going to talk about this row same way for train in peak they're going to talk about in this row this will give you information or the rows and columns will provide you information what will be here or in a way you can predict from here using rows and columns yes let me show you an example bus for card fare will be 150 for train peak will be 10 for both for train off peak it will be 10 it's the cash fare you can see it's what provides us information that is the column and the row when you consider this you come here this is the cash fare for the tra train which is off peak blank ferry that is the commuter ferry have we seen the answer will have 450 so rows and columns are important when you're given time initially that is some time for example 30 seconds they say please go through this kind of question please underline the rows and the columns that means what kind of information i'll be hearing i should be aware of that kind of info is important okay next one is is this, this thing i've shown you that we have bus and they have given bus for this we have 150 at for the card fare now next one is prediction prediction is of utmost important we have seen the same one in our previous one that is form completion what is prediction that you predict the answer which might be the answer or at least you get close to that here it's easier actually so when you look at it for this one let me just get rid of some of them and zoom in so that we can focus on so sixth one must be a number because they have mentioned dollar sign right seventh one must be a time you can predict it eighth one must be also money i mean some number and ninth one a kind of ferry ferry is a kind of boat which is used to transport people from one point to another in water in sea or river so this is this must be a type of ferry so hence you won't expect a number here if you expect a number it's incorrect if you expect a time it's incorrect you have to expect a type of ferry this is called predicting this expecting is called predicting it helps you to listen to the audio and come up with your answer all right the last but not the least is the unit in tables when we see units what i mean by units is look here they have mentioned dollar symbol here they have mentioned pm here they have mentioned dollar again first of all as we have seen in instructions in um uh, question type one which is form completion we talked about if unit is provided you don't have to write it now they're going to say let's say 150 you don't have to write again 150 dollars or have they provided pm you don't have to write pm or am again okay second thing that with the unit you can guess already what will be the answer so these units are very important for us not just for predicting but also take care of them if they have included them don't write it there if they have not included them and they are talking about it in the audio please mention them for an example they have not mentioned this so then you have to write dollar 150 if they have not mentioned this you have to say pm whatever pm it is here five or six or seven whatever it is right 
So I, I hope you got the meaning of this unit thing. One more thing which I have to talk about is the number of words mentioned in the instruction is also important. I didn't include it here because we have seen it earlier in question type one, that is form completion. If you have not gone through it, please go through it. Number of words are important and you should know how many I can use. For example, here there's just one required in this kind of question and hence we cannot write more than one. Okay. Cool. That's the end of the chapter. I know that was a sh uh, short one, but sometime what can we do? Pointers are not many and you can easily find the answers. Remember, we are still going through listening module and types of question we have with pointers, examples and everything. And today it's sentence completion. What is the meaning of sentence completion? You might have seen this in your schools or you know universities called fill in the blanks. I think it's quite familiar to you fill in the blanks rather than sentence completion where you have a statement and you have some blank in there after that. Remember these statements are separate. I mean, they are not connected to each other, right? A single sentence, which is not connected, like I said, so you'll be listening to an audio. You will have a statement with a blank in it. What I mean by connection is these two are not connected directly. What if we are forming a paragraph and we talk about one sentence and then have a blank in it and then talk about next ten sentence with a blank in it. So these are connected. You have to go in the sequence, but here they are not connected. Hence, I call it single sentence with no connection. They are not connected. That is called sentence completion. This is the typical example of what it looks like. We have here a sentence and a question. Now question might be mentioned here or close to the blank. It's the same thing. You have to search for this question here, 27, 28, 29, 30. On the top, they'll mention the number and instructions, right? Pointers, we'll see later. First, I would like you to go through this and see how much you get. And you will, you will get an idea. I mean, you will get an idea how this question has been taken care. Yeah. Let me play the audio, get ready for it. The other thing I wanted to ask you was, did you find it hard studying with the Open University? You mean because you're studying on your own most of the time? Mm. Well, it took me a while to get used to it. I found I needed to maintain a high level of motivation because it's so different from school. There's no one saying, why haven't you written your assignment yet? And that sort of thing. Oh, dear. You'll learn it, Paul. Another thing was that I got very good at time management because I had to fit time for studying round a full-time job. Well, I'm hoping to change to working part-time, so that'll help. Mm. What makes it easier is that the degree is made up of modules, so you can take time off between them if you need to. It isn't like a traditional three- or four-year course where you've got to do the whole thing of it in one go. Oh, that's good, because I'd like to spend six months travelling next year. Huh, it's all right for some. <laughs> then, even though you're mostly studying at home, remember you've got tutors to help you, and from time to time there are summer schools. They usually last a week. They're great, because you meet all the other people struggling with the same things as you. Oh. I've made some really good friends that way. Sounds good. Uh, so how do I apply? All right, so we are back. I hope you got all the answers correctly, number 27, 28, 29, and 30. See, here we have mentioned blanks almost in the end. Sometimes they do come here or even in the beginning. That doesn't mean there's a different type. It's the same type. The difference, I mean, the, the main co component is, is a single statement with a single blank. All right, there won't be two blanks ever. Nice, let's see the answers now. The answer number one is motivation. Second one, time management. Hyphen, it's up to you if you wanna keep. If you don't wanna keep, keep a blank, it's correct. Third one, that is 29th one is modules. And 13th, 30th is summer school or schools. Both are correct. When we form a bracket here, that means it's correct without it or with it. Now, if there's a spelling mistake, it's incorrect. Remember, if you have written exactly the same answers, it's correct. If you got four out of four, 
wonderful. If not, don't worry. We have pointers coming and you can practice some other state, uh, other questions which you'll mention later. Let's go with the pointers now, yeah? And pointers are the tips that can help you to find the answers easily. The first one, read and predict. This is the first one, read and predict. When you have an audio provided, or let's say when you have question provided, they're gonna definitely give you some time, okay? And then you can predict based on that. Now, let's understand both of them separately, what I mean by read and predict. So these are the questions that are provided to you. Before this, they will say, have a look at question number 27 to 30. Your task is to read through these places, right? We have here question three and four. I want you to read all of them, right? And go through the blank as well. What could be an answer for this blank? Let's read together. Studying with the open university demanded a great deal of what? Hard work or some kind of quality for sure. So in the question paper, write in bracket, or this will be a quality. Studying and working at same time improved Rachel's blank skill. Again, this will be a quality. They have already mentioned some kind of skill. But whose skill? Rachel's skill. You have to listen for information about Rachel. Right? Let's see the third one. It was helpful that the course was structured in, in what? In either language or in the time or in the college. Something related to the structure and course in some blank. She enjoyed meeting other students at either a time or a place because at is only used for these things, right? So you can predict either a time or a place. This is called reading through and predicting. Now you are given 30 seconds to read before the audio is being played, right? You have enough or let's say ample time to go through it. And predicting. Predicting helps you to listen for the information which is required for you. See, the audio which they are playing is not for fun or enjoyment. You know, what are they talking about? Any interesting topic? Because you're not going to get score or marks for understanding the audio. You will get only mark for, marks for writing the correct answer. Hence, you have to look for specific information. This is where this prediction and reading prior to the audio comes in. I hope you understand this thing. Yeah. Next one, we have... <clears throat> Uh, synonyms. Now, what is the meaning of this synonyms? Synonyms mean that sentence will be paraphrased, but, but let me just help you with that. Answers have to be exact words. Synonyms in a way that means you will have to, uh, you cannot provide answers as synonyms. Exact words have to be used, which they said in the audio. For an example, let's see what I mean by all of this. Here we have a blank and you have we have given answer as motivation, right? In the place of motivation, you thought inspiration you will write. That's incorrect. Inspiration cannot be the correct answer for a, for a reason. It's synonym for motivation, which they didn't even speak. So inspiration cannot be considered as correct answer. It has to be motivation. What I mean by um, paraphrasing, which we mentioned earlier, this is here paraphrased, is that this statement won't be said exactly the way it is. In the audio, they're not going to say studying with open university demanded a great deal of something. Of course, they can paraphrase it. For example, um, open university requires a lot of blank. Yes, so see, this is how paraphrased it is. They might put in in two sentences, right? They'll talk about universities, let's say open universities and say, um, it's a great place to study, but it requires. So these are two statements and they have mentioned the answer using those. Listen for the prediction which you have mentioned earlier. I mean, the, we have mentioned read and predict here, right? Predict those answers and eventually you will get the correct answer. Another tip I would like to give you here is, please listen for each statement in the audio. Some people, what they do is, they just listen for open university, that's it, don't. Here we have read the question, right? That means the blank. Studying with open university demanded a great deal of something. Where have they mentioned something about open university? 
where I have the mention regarding what they demand or what they require or what they expect from you, that's it you have to listen for. So listen for each statement one by one. Let's say I say something about the university. You connect with the blank. Is it correct? No, it's not filling any of the blank. Next statement in the audio. Is it correct? Yeah, maybe. Then you fill the answer. And as every blank and every most of the question we have mentioned, it will go in the sequence. Yes. So once they have mentioned 27, they'll proceed with 28 and they'll proceed with 29th. Same way all the time it has been followed. The sequence has to be followed. Once the once in one statement I found one answer, definitely audio will talk about the next one. So I'll talk about um about Rachel, right? And next time I'll talk about the helpfulness of the course that was a structure. Structured in what? In some way. I have kept it great so that I don't talk about it. We have enough three, right? Good. So this is about paraphrasing and synonyms. Please don't provide answers as synonyms. Exact words have to be used in the answers. Next one is grammar. Not just grammar. I am sure if it is grammatically incorrect, you cannot fill it. Try to do that, right? So we have this answer here. Instead of motivation, if you put something else, will it be correct answer? Sometimes people don't even understand this. What I mean is, let's say you're listening to this blank and you predicted earlier. Now, instead of prediction, what you do is just write something incorrectly. You predicted incorrectly. You made that mistake, no problem. But when you read it next time and you're providing the answer, it's like, oh, it doesn't make any sense. Let's see an example. Studying with the Open University demanded a great deal of, um, what? Let's call it uh, exercise. See, in this case, it is making sense. And when I say great deal of cats, it doesn't make any sense, right? This is making sense together. Exercise, cats or dogs or a name of a person doesn't, doesn't make sense because great deal of what? Grammatically, it's incorrect. In that case, you can check. Second thing, it has to be correct spelling, right? It, you have to spell the answer correctly. Instead of this spelling, if you, if you don't write A here, it's incorrect, you won't get the mark for that. All right, so these are the two things that you have to take care while writing, not just the grammar, but the spelling. If it is grammatically incorrect, you cannot provide it as an answer. It's also a hint that this is not the correct answer. Okay, and uh, that's the end of the chapter. This listening module has many questions and hence we have to take care of them. Now, this multiple choice actually is one of my favorite as well as least favorite. The reasons you will see soon. First of all, you will see, let's see what happens in multiple choice. There will be three options given to you and there will be one statement or a question. Remember the three options. If it has more than three options, it is called matching that will be a different question type which we have to discuss later. Now, difficulty level in this kind of question is definitely at a higher level. I mean, it's really difficult to this to this question, but if it is in section three, okay? If it is in section one, then it's not that difficult. Same goes for section two. But when it comes to section three, things get hard, okay? Section one is where you have a conversation. Section two is where we have a monologue. Section three, again, conversation, plus the size or the length of the text in MCQ, that is multiple choice questions, increases tremendously. And that's the reason it is most difficult in section three. Yeah, so this can be particularly seen here. And my target is to make you clear this one. If you could do, or if you could clear these kind of questions, or you could write, find the right answer for section three. Section one and two would be very easy. Same goes for section four. It's very similar to section three in case of multiple choice. All right. Now, let me tell you one thing, why it is difficult. The reason for it to be difficult is you have a lot to read as well as listen at the same time. What is the meaning of lot to read? Now, when we get multiple choice question, we have a question and some options, right? Now, these options sometimes are actually bigger than your question, and hence you have to read almost like a passage. At the same time, you are listening stuff. 
how would it work out then you know you are reading stuff as well as listening and you have a lot to read and find an answer on the top of it our reading speed is horrible you know our reading speed goes to almost like 150 words per minute which is really bad we'll see how to solve this problem for now let me show you an example so that we can understand what will be there in this kind of question by the way in this case i'm adding two examples we'll see one why two examples the first one is from section one you can see the question nine and ten uh, i think you remember where i said section one has one to ten is section one eleven to twenty is section two twenty one uh, to 30 is section 3 and 31 to 40 is section 4 and this one is 9 and 10 and this is taken from ielts.org just to show you what kind of question you will be getting let me play an audio where you can find answer for number 9 and 10 all right there we go okay right now Obviously, insurance is an important thing to consider, and our companies are able to offer very good rates in a number of different all-inclusive packages. Uh, sorry, could you explain a bit more? <laughs> yes, sorry. Um, there's really three rates according to quality of insurance cover. There's the highest comprehensive cover, which is premium rate. Then there's standard rate and then there's economy rate. That one will only cover the cost of the contents second hand. Oh, I've been stung before with economy insurance, so um, I'll go for the highest. Mm-hmm. And can I just check, would you want home delivery or to a local depot, or would you want to pick it up at the nearest port? The port would be fine. I've got transport that end. Fine. And will you be paying by credit card? Can I pay by check? And we are back. I hope you found an answer. One thing I would like to mention, okay, you don't have to write the answer as, let's say if the answer is economy, you don't have to write economy. You have to write A, the letter. That is A, B, C, these letters, okay? Good. So the answer for the first one is premium. For the second one is port. That is C and A. If you get it correct, wonderful. And I think you might have because this is section one, the easiest type. Let me take you to the next question type, which is taken from section three, or in fact, section four, very similar. 35 and 36 are the questions. Now see what happens here. The length of the question or the statement is shorter than the option. Yeah, you can see in 35 and 36 both. Now, let me play the audio and see if you can catch it. Research shows that when these groups first come into contact with a Western diet, their health suffers. Once they're exposed to our diet of refined carbohydrates and sugars, they quickly develop our lifestyle-related diseases. However, that does not mean that the human digestive system is suited to digesting only a few sources of food, nor that it cannot change to accommodate different food sources. In fact, the evidence would suggest exactly the opposite. As a species, we are able to make significant modifications to our digestive systems according to what foods are available in our local environment. Examples abound, and our ability to digest lactose is a good one. Lactose is a sugar that is found in milk, and it is digested in the human gut by the enzyme lactase. In communities in Europe, the Middle East and Africa that traditionally herd cattle and drink cow's milk, this enzyme is present and people can digest milk products. However, in places such as China and Thailand, which do not have this style of farming, the enzyme is lacking and most people have lactose intolerance. Another example is the ability to digest the sugars from starchy foods. We are back. Time to get the answers. For the first one, it's C. We can adapt to a range of diets. And number 36 is B. In the past, they didn't farm cows. If you got these answers, wonderful. If not, don't worry. We have pointers coming. We have some things that can help you to get these answers easily. Yeah. What are these things called? 
I think we have discussed them. Pointers. These things are called pointers. These are tips that can help you. Now, the first one is speed reading. Earlier, I was discussing with you that normally our speed is 150 words per minute. True. If you are an avid reader, your speed might go to 300, or I mean 350 to 400 words per minute. That's tremendously good compared to 150. We all lie between this, so maybe 200 words per minute, which is not good enough for our MCQs or multiple choice questions. We have to reach anywhere between 350 to 400. The biggest reason, reason for us to um, not get the speed is our childhood. We never learn how to read quickly. Yeah, and there's a lot to read. There, there is always always a scope to read and learn how to read it. We never learn how to read. We just learned, oh, we have to read this way. We learned alphabet, we learn language, but never learn how to read. Because I think 80 to 90% were not even into books. You are into videos or games. So that's what happens. Let me change it today. Let me try to tell you or help you with the technique that can help you as well. This is a simple statement, right? Let's try to read it the way you read and the way we did before even applying the speed reading. This is a long sentence as we need to practice speed reading for IELTS listening. You see, what did I do or what, how did I read this one? I read it this way that I club most important information together. So this is a long sentence as we need to practice speed reading for IELTS listening. The things I have underlined are what generally what people combine together to form a phrase. That is, this is a long sentence as we need to practice speed reading for IELTS listening. Right, see how many breaks they are taking. One, two, three, four, five, six, almost six breaks. These breaks do take time, right? Let me give you another example or make it better. Now look here, we'll try to go as fast as possible, take half the number of the breaks. This is a long sentence. So we read, this is a long sentence as we need to practice speed reading for us listening. We took this time only two breaks. Compared to the earlier ones, we are taking just really less number of breaks. This will increase your speed in reading. Secondly, our speed is limited to our speech, right? So when I'm speaking it out, I cannot think while looking at it. So always in exam, please read in your mind or in your brain. Don't read it out loud or even don't just mutter it because firstly, it's gonna disturb others. I've seen examples of that. Second thing is you will read it faster because in your brain, you can read it faster rather than reading it out loud, okay? Good, this is one technique that can help. You have to take some of the examples or let's say sentences and practice with them. And uh, speed reading comes from practice. It's not just a technique that I told you and you can get it done, okay? Now, second information or second, let's say, pointer is concising the information. How to shorten the information? Because without shortening, it is going to be a little bit difficult, even with speed reading, right? Now, we have, this is the earlier question I've shown you in section three. This was from section three, remember? We have huge, I mean, huge question and huge uh, example. Let's just get rid of the instructions over here and also the Question number 35, I just want to take care of 36 here and see how we're going to concise this first statement that is Thai people have difficulty digesting milk because, now this is the whole statement which we have in the question. How can we concise this? We only take important information. Thai difficulty digesting milk. Why? Maybe they have too much lactose in their body. We make it too lot lactose in bodies. Second, in the past they didn't farm cows. Past no farm cows. Third, the saliva lacks certain enzymes. Saliva lacks enzymes. You see, we try to fit as little words as possible and make sense of the passage, I mean the question and the options. 
Now these are almost less than half of the words which you have seen in the question. This is called concising the information. In exam, you won't be definitely writing it again, but what you can do is just underline it. For example, Thai, difficulty, digesting, milk. Options, let's look at it. Instead of too much, you just write too much, or you can write lot, lactose, bodies. Past, didn't, cause. Saliva, certain, enzymes, done. Now see how many words there are, not many, right? This is how you concise the information. And when information is concised, you can read it, fa read it faster, process it faster, as well as listen the audio along with it. Moving ahead, we have another thing that we have to understand in multiple choice. Because we have choice that is options, we have to understand that. If you can look at these questions, we have how many? Three options. It's always three options. This is the simple one, right? And look at these. Oh, they're they are huge, right? Too many options. Okay. First thing, remember, you don't ever have to write the full answer as the answer. You have to write either A, B, or C. Okay. Second thing, I think I already told you how to concise the option. Last thing, which we didn't discuss in concise is if the option is too long and you don't have any time to concise, what you can do is skip it right what is the meaning of skipping let me explain <clears throat> so we have a question here and we're going to listen about this question rather than th waiting for any option what well, how they do is you might have already gone through the example they're going to talk about this they're going to talk about something about this or certain words and they're going to also talk about number c they try to distract you if you're distracted, you're going to choose the incorrect answer because you heard food or diet or unhealthy, any of these words. My suggestion is if the options are too long, if you can't concise, what you should do is just look for the answer rather than connecting with options. So research evidence suggests that now you look for and listen into the audio and listen about research evidence. That's it. What do they suggest? This is also important, the verb that is they're using, right? And then you keep searching what are they suggesting. When you find answer, just write in your notebook, oh, they're suggesting this, and then later combine or contrast with this. Same goes for the next question. Without reading the option, you have saved plenty of the time, and hence you can listen to the next question easily. I mean, next part which you're in the audio and also read the next question. Some people just keep reading the options. It's not a good thing. Second thing about option is, when you're given time, like for example, they say, oh, now you have 30 seconds to read question number 31 to 40. In this time, if you have options between these, I mean, multiple choice questions in between these, let's say 35 to 40 are multiple choice. Never read options in that time, always read questions. That is number 35 is the question and you read it. 36 is the question you read it. You never read the options because you're not gonna rem remember them, right? Your task is to just read the question, try to understand it. Next one, read the question, try to understand it. That's it. If the options are way too huge. If the options are okay sized, you can use the concise method and shorten them as possible. If the options are way too short, like we have seen previously, now if you look here, that options are too short. This is easy. You can connect with the audio. You don't need to skip the audio. I mean, the options, it's fairly easy. It comes in section one, right? But section three is a trouble, yeah? Now proceeding is distractions, big, big trouble. If you look at this, the words, what they're gonna use is, they're gonna talk about Thai people having difficulty digesting milk for sure. This is the main theme in the audio. But while discussing the options, what they're gonna do is, they're gonna talk about too much lactose, they're gonna talk about farm cows, they're gonna talk about enzymes, every word they're gonna talk about. But in what sense? Well, in different sense. That means they might not talk about lactose in their body, they might talk about lactose somewhere else. They might not talk about farming cows in the past. So your task is to get the distraction in the side. And how can you do that? 
what I generally suggest or what I generally do is I listen for each statement. So we have a, an audio, one statement is over, next statement starts. Then we have plenty of statements aligned, right? I always do one thing. I listen to one statement and check, does it connect anyway with this question that Thai people having difficulty digesting milk? Nah, then I skip it, whatever. Next one, I listen to the next statement. I never jump to the option listening to one part of it or just one sentence. If it is connecting with the question, now I have to get attentive. Let's say this one has something about digesting milk, you know, and Thai people both. Oh, now I have to be paying attention maybe to this one and this one both. Then I can choose the answer easily. That's how you can remove the distractions. If this is not here in the second statement, you go to the third statement. In the audio, I think you can recognize when the statement has ended. They take a mini break that is like a full stop. Okay, these are some of the distractions and this is how you can reduce them. The last one, how to practice very important i've seen many people you know doing eight to nine or to even ten tests in a row like within a week or two weeks and they still are scoring 24 to 26 out of 40 in listening and they keep coming to me like why is this happening i tell them one thing you have to ask yourself two questions you have to recognize first of all what went wrong you know why did you not get the right answer and <clears throat> these two questions are why did I not get the right answer what was the reason at that time and that you have to do as soon as you finish the test second question why did I fall for the wrong answer see it's pretty simple but it's so uh, elegant that it makes sense by itself so why did I not get the right answer and why did I fall for the wrong answer if you know why, what was the reason for you, oh, the distraction was the reason, never you're going to fall for such distraction. If you know what the reason was because they have similar ideas, you're going to next time understand similar ideas. Right? So these two questions you should always answer as soon as you get your score or test done. So I today I practice listening and I get 34 out of, out of 40. I won't celebrate to get 34. Now, I'm not saying you should, you should always be sad. I'm just saying, why did I get the six deductions? The reason could be the solution. What if you keep getting 34 every time or 33 and an exam, you get the six kind of questions. This you, would, you got six deduction, right? Out of 40. So you got six, right? Next time you got six. What if these kind of 12 questions asked in exam? How much do you think you'll get? You'll get 26 out of 40. That's so sad. Though you have practiced, you didn't practice in a way. So I hope you understand. First of all, understand where you went wrong. Second, answer the two questions. Why did I get the wrong right answer? And why did I not get the right answer? And why did I fall for the wrong answer? Okay, and that's how we're gonna, we gonna work on our multiple choice questions. Short answers, how to find solutions for short answer kind of questions in listening modules yeah this kind of question actually can be asked as w questions okay i think you know what w questions are right which has w words in them like what why where when and all this kind of question the answers are no longer than no longer than four words what I mean by no longer than four words, when they are providing us instructions, the answers won't be more than four words. They'll say, write to answer no longer than three words, no more than two words. So your limit will go maximum to four words. That's why they are short question answers. Okay. Now moving on, they're not that difficult compared to MCQs or multiple choice questions, which we have seen earlier. The reason for them not being difficult is there's just one single question. All you have to do is just read the question and easily find the answer. And that is why it's not that difficult. Okay. Now let's see an example so that you can easily understand what I mean by a simple question kind of answer. This is where what you see here. We have question what two factors can make social contact in foreign country difficult. 
You see, this is a direct question. It could be two factors, it could be one factor. Here they have mentioned two factors. It could be one factor they might ask, but it is a direct question for short answer. Now look in the instruction, they have mentioned three words. So watch out for that, okay? I'm gonna play the audio and let you finish these, these questions 11 to 16. Get ready for the audio. You will hear an extract from a talk given to a group who are going to stay in the UK. Good evening and welcome to the British Council. My name is John Parker and I've been asked to talk to you briefly about certain aspects of life in the UK before you actually go there. So I'm going to talk first about the best ways of making social contacts there. Now, you might be wondering why it should be necessary. After all, we meet people all the time. But when you're living in a foreign country, it can be more difficult, not just because of the language, but because customs may be different. If you're going to work in the UK, you will probably be living in private accommodation, so it won't be quite so easy to meet people. But there are still things that you can do to help yourself. First of all, you can get involved in activities in your local community, join a group of some kind. For example, you'll probably find that there are theatre groups who might be looking for actors, set designers and so on. Or if you play an instrument, you could join music groups in your area. Or if you like the idea of finding out about local history, there'll be a group for that too. These are just examples. And the best place to get information about things like this are either the town hall or the public library. Libraries in the UK perform quite a broad range of functions nowadays. They're not just confined to lending books, although that's their main role, of course. Great. And we are back. I hope you find all the answers. Let's see the answers itself, themselves. The first one, that is 11th, is language. 12th is customs. 13th is music or music groups. 14th is local history groups. 15th, the public, you can ignore if you want. Library or libraries. Right, as we have three words, we can write the public library or the public libraries. And the last one, the town hall or just town hall. If you got full, I mean, Six out of six, wonderful. If not, don't worry. Like always, we're gonna provide you pointers. Those are gonna help you to get the answers correctly. Okay, cool. Now, pointers are again the same thing as we discussed earlier. These are the tips that gonna help you to find answers easily. The first one is number of words, or let's say instructions. So this is our question, right? In here, these are questions. This above is instructions. So we'll get rid of the questions and let's just zoom in here. You see how many words do we have here? Three words and or a number. In a previous video, I have explained this, the, what is the meaning of and or a number? If you can, please go back to the other video. If not, let me explain it here. You cannot write more than three words. Your answer must be between one to three words. Secondly, if it is a number, you can add it to the word. For example, on the boat will fulfill the requirement of not more than three words. But if you add one more number here to on the four, on the boat, it's still correct because we, have, we, can, we are allowed to use a number apart from these three words. That's what it means, right? So you can choose answer accordingly. That is what it, the instructions on number of words mean, okay? Next one is the W question. It's important to understand the question. See, our problem is actually, we don't listen to reply. We don't listen to understand. We listen to reply. When you listen to understand, it gets easier. Not just in IELTS, I guess, in everywhere in life or in relationships. When we listen to just reply, we tend to just get to the point and just get to our, you know, throw our answers to them. Not a good idea. Same goes here in IELTS. When you listen to the question, please try to understand what the question is and guess the answer for the W question. Now, what does it mean by guessing the answer? So we have some questions here. Okay, I'm gonna get rid of the instructions and let me zoom in here. We have here, what two factors can make social contact in foreign country difficult? Here, the question word is what? This is important. Second is the information here, factors. So all you have to listen to is what factors, hmm, what factors social contact 
foreign country difficult. That's it. So you can guess what are the factors are they talking about. So here you have to look for what factors. In second one, you can see which community group. So there must be names for community groups, you know. So that first they have given example theater. Watch out for these examples as well. Now we have 13 and 14 you have to provide as community group. Number third, in which places? So in which two places means again, they have to talk about places. So you see, this is how we guess the answer by understanding the question itself. Now, while you're listening to the audio, of course, you cannot read everything at the same time. You are supposed to read this when you are given 30 seconds before you go for the question slot. Let's say they'll say, um, please read the question between 21 to 25 and then you hear the audio. So in this 30 seconds, in these 30 seconds, what you're supposed to do is read the questions, underline what is the important information like we did here in the case of this one, what factors in here, which community groups and here in which places. You see, this information is going to be very helpful for us in future, in the coming task. Yeah. All right. The next pointer is stay ahead of the audio. What is the meaning of staying ahead of the audio? The meaning is that you read one question in advance. While you're listening to the audio, please, before the audio starts, as soon as possible, read this question and this question for sure, at least that is the one and the next one to it. As soon as you find the answer for this one, you jump to this one, right? When you already have read this one, so it's get easier for you. When you're reading this and you find the answer, immediately jump to this one. So staying ahead of the audio will help you. In the previous video, we have uh, shown you what is the meaning of speed reading. Please go through it. It will help you to read as quick as possible. So you will be able to finish this sentence within the span of like two to three seconds. Okay, that will be really fast. This method has been explained in the previous video. I suggest you go back and read or listen to the, uh, the whole video and understand the method. Okay. Proceeding, we have paraphrases. What is the meaning of paraphrasing? Paraphrasing is when we um, change, we don't change the meaning of a statement, but we provide it in different words. That is called paraphrasing. Now, most sentences which you hear in the audio are paraphrased. That means you're not going to hear exact question or exact words in your statement. So let's see an example. These are some questions. Yeah, let me get rid of some of them and just let's take out of this question. Options are not important for us. Now, this is the question which we have in exam. What are the things they could change? How they could put this question or provide this information in the audio? They might something say something like this. Which aspects can make it hard to have a social contact in a foreign country? Now see, we changed two factors to social aspects, two aspects. Social contact, that is fine. We can keep it same. They might keep it same. Foreign country, similar, but make it difficult, make it hard. Yeah. So this is just our interpretation. All could be possibly just to show you that this could be said in this way in exam that you might hear the audio in this form, right? This is how it is paraphrased. I hope you understand what I mean by that. They're never going to provide you the exact words in the question. You have to listen to understand the audio. All right. Now, the next one is very similar to paraphrasing, but this is for words. That is, they will be using synonyms of the words, right? With example, it will get clear. Now, let's take three of these example and eliminate two of them. And let's talk about this. Let me zoom in here. If you look at it here, we have certain words that we can find synonym of. They could change those words. Here we have types, could be kinds. Instead of community, they might use neighborhood. Instead of, so, so you see that how these synonyms are used in, stay in, the, in the audio itself. We should be ready for such synonyms. But let me tell you one more thing. Yes, you might hear synonyms in the audio, but please don't write anything which is not you didn't hear in the audio. Okay, 
If you didn't hear anything, don't write it. If you did hear the word, write it. Writing a synonym of a word as answer is incorrect. You are supposed to write the answer itself, what you heard. What I'm trying to explain here is, in the question, you might see this as your question, but in audio, you might hear this in order to explain this part. Okay, this is how they're gonna use synonyms, right? Good. The last but not the least are the spellings. If you have spelling mistakes as an answer, in an answer, it's definitely incorrect. So let's see. Yeah, of course, incorrect answer, that means no score. So you get zero in that question. And in listening, you know one correct answer, you get one point. And do you remember how many points do we have total? 40 questions, hence 40 points, right? Okay, this is, this is what we did today, that is languages and custom. Now, if you look at it, what if, let me just get rid of this to zoom in. What if we write instead of language, languages? Incorrect. What if in custom we write customs? You know, it should, it should fit uh, what they have said. Second thing, it should be fitting according to the spelling. Now, instead of music, what if I write like this? It's incorrect. So just a tiny mistake can ruin your answer. Spelling mistakes have to be taken care. They cannot, cannot be considered, oh, I did hear the answer by mistake. I wrote incorrect spelling. No, sorry. One more thing I would like to mention here in listening, please try to provide all. <coughs> One more thing I would like to clear is please try to provide in listening all answers as uppercase. So for example, we have music groups here. Try to write in this way rather than this way. The reason for that is they don't have penalty for writing in all caps lock or all uppercase. But in case if you make mistake in writing first letter capital or not capital, it is incorrect. For an example, all the proper uh, nouns that those are names should have first letter capitalized. Otherwise, you don't need to. Now, who will think of these rules while they are writing the answer? No one. So I suggest write all of the words, all of the letters capital that will make it better. Okay? There's no penalty for writing all of them capital. Okay? Cool. So that was the end of the chapter, map leveling. So you have to label a map or you have to provide information about the map through the audio. Okay? Let me just explain what this map leveling is. You will be listening for directions. You will be listening for information in a map and you have to fill some information in a map which is not complete. So for an example, we have a map here. We'll see example in detail with proper drawing. Don't worry about that. I'm just showing you here. We have a map here of a place. We have some buildings and there are some missing answers you know this is number 11 this is number 12 and you'll be listening to an audio now in the audio you'll be having in the exam you'll be having options now choose these options which one is fitting to which one 11 or 12 using the direction they are providing in the audio this is how you level a map okay it's not that difficult for a reason because i guess after practice it gets easier but originally it's not that difficult because you don't have to read much in this kind of question. If it is getting difficult for you, definitely you are missing the technical part of the question. That means you're not using the right tip or right technique. Once you go through this video, it will definitely get easier. Trust me, compared to the last time, okay? Now there are two types in listening for the maps. Right, the first one is when we have question in the image and second one is when we have question outside the image. What is the meaning of this? Let me show you an example. Here, if you look, we have question in the image. 14th is the number of question. 15th, 13th, 12th, 11th, all are the number of question here. Options are outside the image, as you can see here. So you'll be listening an audio and try to fit which one is correct for 11th either A to I, again for 12. So the person who is here will be talking first about, oh, we are standing at the entrance. And then when we go straight, we on the left comes, let's say multimedia room. So the answer for 11 is F. 
I'm just giving an example. I'm not saying exactly that's the answer. Now, if we look at the just opposite, we have a computer room. So we have computers here, number C. That's how they're gonna play the audio. I'm gonna show you a real example. Don't worry about that. This is just to show you what are the types in this kind of question. First one is question in the image, right? Why do we have to do this? Understanding the types, we'll see later. Second one is question outside the image. Now we have taken the same image. What if 11th is here, 12th is here, 13th is here, 14th is here. We don't have this all, okay? And we have here A, B, C, D, E. Now think about it. Questions are outside, options are inside. The difference between these will be, now let's go back to the previous one. When I'm playing the audio, you must be knowing by now, but if you're listening to all the uh, classes, that audio always plays in the sequence of the question, not the options. So what's gonna happen? I'm gonna play from 11 to 12. I'm gonna give information from 11 to 12, and then 12 to 13, 13 to 14. I can talk about fiction and seminar room, but I can never go to 15 without talking about 14. You understand my point? 14th to 15th, like this. It'll always go in the sequence. However, in the case of here, that is outside the image, the sequence will be followed from here because questions are here. So this might get a little bit difficult because let's say I talk about art collection, which is here, and suddenly I jump to here. Or I could jump here after that because there's no sequence following in the image. However, it is there in here, outside the image. So if you get this kind of question, you are lucky. If you get this kind of question, well, it's fine. After practice and understanding some tips, you can get it done. Now, let's see, see some examples so that you can get um, accustomed to the question type. This is the example which you have seen earlier, but definitely the answer I provided you is not the correct one. I just guessed it to make you understand. So don't just write F there, all right? Good. I'm gonna play the audio so that you can Go through it. Good luck. You will hear the librarian of a new town library talking to a group of people who are visiting the library. Okay, everyone. So, here we are at the entrance to the town library. My name is Anne, and I'm the chief librarian here. And you'll usually find me at the desk just by the main entrance here. So, I'd like to tell you a bit about the way the library is organised and what you'll find where. And you should all have a plan in front of you. Well, as you see, my desk is just on your right as you go in. And opposite this, the first room on your left has an excellent collection of reference books and is also a place where people can read or study peacefully. Just beyond the librarian's desk on the right is a room where we have up-to-date periodicals, such as newspapers and magazines. And this room also has a photocopier, in case you want to copy any of the articles. If you carry straight on, You'll come into a large room, and this is the main library area. There is fiction in the shelves on the left, and non-fiction materials on your right, and on the shelves on the far wall, there is an excellent collection of books relating to local history. We're hoping to add a section on local tourist attractions too, later in the year. Through the far door in the library, just past the fiction shelves, is a seminar room, and that can be booked for meetings or talks. And next door to that is the children's library, which has a good collection of stories and picture books for the under-11s. Then there's a large room to the right of the library area. That's the multimedia collection, where you can borrow DVDs and so on, and we also have CD-ROMs you can borrow to use on your computer at home. It was originally the art collection, 
but that's been moved to another building. And that's about it. Oh, uh, there's also the library office on the left of the librarian's desk. Ah, uh, OK. Now, does anyone have any questions? Uh, yes, thank you, sir. All right, so we are back here. Let's see the answers, yeah? I hope you're ready with your book and your answers after listening to the audio. So the answer for the first one, which is 11th, is H. Well, pretty far from what we guessed. Reference book. For 12th, we have G, which is periodic uh, uh, periodicals. 13th is D which is local history collection. Please don't write full answer as the answer. Just write the option. Option is correct. 14th is B, children's book books. And 15th is F, which is multimedia. Okay, this is 15th. So I hope you got all correct answer. If you didn't, go through the instructions or pointers and do similar examples and see how it helped you, okay? Let's see the pointers or the tips that can help you to go through this question. Tips in here are very important for a reason. Most of the people are missing this kind of answer or are missing this kind of uh, question type because they understand English, but they might not be understanding the directions itself. So let's see. First of all, never ever miss the origin or the starting point. It is very important. Without that, you might not even know where the audio started. So this is where we started talking about and we have a whole image here. If we don't recognize where the starting point is, where are we gonna go? I don't know, we'll miss here. We'll jump there or here and it's all messed up. I have seen people starting their listening in maps and when they start, if they miss this point, they get almost five to six incorrect out of seven. The reason is they don't know what is coming next. Okay, so let's take an example here. If the audio is being played from here, you should be knowing. What if the audio starts from, all right, we are at the librarian's desk. You should be knowing. Pay close attention to the initial part. That's really important, okay? Now the second one is, most common mistake is people don't follow. People don't follow the instructions. Instead, they look at the picture. What do, what do you mean by looking at the picture is they don't even put a pencil or their finger at the, at the paper or the screen. What they do is they just look at it as if they have visual memory. They don't. So please use a pointer to follow the image. Let me show you an example. So earlier we have seen the, the audio, but um, we'll create our own audio to make it clear. I'll keep my finger like this. So we are at the entrance. Once we end, enter inside, on the right side, we have librarian's desk. But when we go on the left side, we have the reference books. Great. Proceeding, if we go straight, we have librarian area. But below it, on the right side, we have something else. See, how did we follow the whole instruction and we never missed a point? But if I'm looking, I might miss one thing. And in maps, if you miss one single point, you miss everything. So I suggest you please follow the audio using a pointer. Now a pointer can be a pencil, can be a pen. I suggest pencil though, or could be a finger as well, right? That like I have to just pointer. As soon as I find the answer, I stop, write the answer. And again, the pointer continues. So I would suggest instead of just looking at the eyes, use a pointer. Now, what if there's, there are no blanks? Let's say for an example here. There's no answer here. There's no question here. So you might think this is not important. It is really important. The reason for it to be important is to follow the sequence. So for a 13th, I went to here. I went here and then from here, I went seminar room and then here. Now see, close to fixing and seminar room, there's nothing. Still, if I don't follow, I might not find this answer as well as this answer. That's the reason I always follow both of them, everything. So these are the landmarks or the information which is important. You should be reading these as well, okay? As I said, and this same thing came up, that is landmarks. Landmarks are like guiding points for us in images. 
right keep an eye on the landmark and you will find your way so the audio is being played not with keeping just the direction in mind they'll say the close by landmarks or the information points we call them landmarks in images for example we enter on the right side we have librarian desk now you got a reference oh they're talking about this but the opposite of that is something you see reference is important if you go straight to the line we get to library area oh they're talking about this point and we see look at the right of it we get non-fiction if you look at the left of it we get fiction but if you go going straight we find the point now look they use one two and three references in order to provide one answer and this is what i mean by following the landmarks okay that's going to help you to find the answer easily cool next one is um basic vocabulary related to vocabulary i mean sorry basic direction related to vocabulary i, I was just focusing on vocabulary and i said it twice sorry for that see most of us don't go through basic vocabulary because as a non-native speakers i just need left right straight and up and down that's it i mean while finding direction rarely we go through cross and go along so this is the vocabulary what i want you to do is stop here and just copy all of them and see how they're used if you don't want this all you can do is see there's a vocabulary course also created which we have provided you you can look into it and all of them are explained in detail okay see go straight turn left go past that means we go cross all cross go along along with something right around the corner between behind turn back go back same way now what i mean by this i'll give you an example okay so when you go to assert this something like this on a road in between we have some kind of statue now i want to go here and i'm here in our language we'll go just go straight don't worry about the the, the building in between just go around anywhere straight this is not how instructions are being provided they'll say go straight on the roundabout or at the roundabout take the second exit so this is the first exit this is the second exit and this is how the google map uses the instructions but because we never use these instructions in everyday life what happens we don't understand them in the audio as well and we get stuck it's important to understand these kind of words while we are going through this kind of question okay good so lastly we have confusion with directions by what i mean by confusion with directions biggest confusion actually are east west north and south while we are in a hurry we are listening to an audio we might think of east as west or we might not be able to point out okay my logic says is use your country's map for an example look at india itself we have north here if north is here automatically on the right it's east on the west on this side is west so if north is here definitely east is here west is here south is here you must be knowing your country as well keep your country's map in your mind and you will never make a mistake in west or east right now stand here where are you standing and visualize your country's map so think of your country's map in your mind and where you're staying standing you just find one direction rest is all gonna get easier for you right good so that is how we're gonna do okay in this chapter we're going to see flow charts this kind of question actually is interesting due to its diagram as well as blanks in it and this is still a listening module all right now what happens in flow chart is let me show you an example here there is kind of a flow where information is there in a sequence right so there's a diagram where we have a box where we provide information and with an arrow it shows the direction of the information so i'll say there's a process being described in the form of an image i see i draw drew this image we have an arrow showing the direction of the information i provide a blank here that will you have to that will be filled while listening to the audio this is what flowchart is information in a sequence okay now this generally comes up in section two and three hence it can be a little bit difficult or can be 
easy, you know, relatively compared to the third one. I would still call it in the medium category, not as difficult as multiple choice questions, not as easy as blanks. It's kind of okay. All right. Now let's see an example to get a better idea of what I just described initially or try to describe. Now look at this. See this, there's a something called diagram or title of the flowchart that is session outline. The first step itself calls, talks about project topic. Then we have tutorial structure. You see there's a sequence being maintained and this is what we call flowchart. I'm going to play the audio and your task is to find the answer number 21, 22, 23 and 24. All right, get ready. Good luck. Section three. You will hear a conversation between a peer tutor and an engineering student who needs help with a project. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 24. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 24. Hi John, thanks for seeing me today. I'm really struggling with my project. I have to come up with a design for a water treatment system and I'm really not sure what I'm expected to do. Well, as peer tutors, we've been taught to follow a process in these tutorials, okay? The first step is to look closely at the task instructions. That sounds good. I'm also, well, we've been told to do some research, but I don't know where to start. It's always hard to start with. We've got about 45 minutes today. That should give us some time to go over it. Have you done much research before? No, this is my first project like this, and I'm really stressing out about it. I went to a seminar about research at the start of the year, but I've forgotten most of it. Well, that's fine, because the next step in our tutorial will be to consider some common research strategies that you can use to get started. With engineering, a lot of the projects you do are practical, so you can think about how you can access other people's write-ups of similar projects. Yes, that sounds useful. How do I find those? Well. There's always the online databases, but you need to know what search terms to use. So, can you think of any useful terms? Um, Cameroon, I guess? And maybe grey water? Yes, good. But those might not give you many hits. What about the type of research? I've always found it helpful to search for case studies, you know? There's probably a whole lot of those on systems set up for other villages in developing countries that you could look at. I've got a couple here actually. They're on different topics, but we can look at the structure and develop some useful ways to focus your research. Is there anything else you'd like to look at today? Um, hmm. I can't think of anything right now. That all sounds good. Great. Then the next step is to come up with an action plan. How long have you got? To finish the project? Four weeks, I think. It's due on the 6th. Great, we are back and I hope you got all of them correct. Now we're going to see the answer and you can check your own answers as well in your book. The first one, which is number 21st, is task instructions. Second one is strategies. Third is case studies and fourth is action plan. Now check in your book if you got all of them correct. If you have made a spelling mistake, keep it as incorrect for now. If you have not included S, also incorrect. It has to be exactly the same. Now, if I have included task instructions instead of just instructions, it's correct because I have, it is provided no more than two words in the instructions. So I think it's fine, right? Not a problem. If it was provided no more than one word, then task instructions, this answer will be incorrect. You have to just say instructions. Okay, cool. After that, we have to see the pointers. Pointers, as I said, are the trips and tricks that are going to help you to get the answers correct easily. 
All right. The first one is definitely headings. Headings or something we call title gonna provide you with information about what the flowchart is. Let's let's see an example here itself so that it gets clear to you. See, that helps you to understand the flowchart, right? So we have a flowchart here in which we have instructions like this. I mean, flow like this, arrow is going down. On the top, there must be a title. This title is gonna help you to understand the flowchart. In the example which we did, we have something called session outline. So when in the audio, I'm talking about session outline, definitely we have to you know pay attention to it. This is how we should understand that what can we expect from the answer. Let's say for an example, steps to create some kind of chemical. That means we have to listen for steps only for chemical. So the title or the heading is important. There are subheadings as well, like project topics, step one, step two, or tutorial structure, also important because they're gonna help you to keep as you know landmark or pointer where you have to reach and then proceed. All right, the next one is the sequence. It's obviously clear by now if you have been going through it that sequence is most important for you to understand here, right? In this question, it is even more uh, more important for a reason. There, there are arrows, right? These arrows are indicating from one process to another. And if this is not the sequence, then what is, right? Let's see an example. We have here first step. Definitely we have to go to the next step. And next step is about what? Tutorial structure. That means this is the step one. Then we go to the next step. What is it about? About the research. Hence, sequence is always maintained in audios and even in the flowchart. They're not gonna be talking about that first. I mean this first and then go back to step one and then come to step three. It's not possible. What they're gonna do is talk about this first and then next one and then you know the same way the order will be maintained okay cool you have to do one more thing you have to follow the speaker even if there are no blanks in the sequence what i mean by no blanks again the example if you look at the first statement then there's no question here right project topic design a water treatment system they're going to talk about it there are no blanks you should hear, you should pay attention to it. The reason is you shouldn't be you shouldn't be doing this. I mean, you should be doing it because I don't want you to miss the track or lose the track of the audio. Let's say you found the answer for the 21st one and you found the answer for the 22nd one. Now, you're, I understand you want to get the answer of 23rd one, but there's information between the 22nd and 23rd. You should also read this information to understand, oh, this information is over. Hence, I can go to the next one after that. What if you don't read this? You'll be confused. So even if there are no questions in any statement, it's important that you read them. You follow the sequence, okay? Just for your benefit so that you don't lose track in the this kind of question that is flowchart. Cool, the next one is predicting the answer. This has been similar to many of the other um, questions we have where the question is blank based, like summary completion, sentence completion, flowchart completion is this one. So we have to predict based on the blank. Now, if you look at the 21st one, go over something. It could be a wall, it could be some kind of shape, some kind of thing. You have to go over something. Think about research what? research something research topic research opinion whatever it is right same way you can develop you can think of the last one develop and something or oh, see another hint they have provided us is this n so definitely it's going to start with either sounding as a vowel or with a vowel okay so this is predicting the answer and see as i said n it must start must be starting with uh, a vowel or sounding as a vowel, that's why it's called action plan. See, second one, go over something that is instructions. So all of the answers are making sense according to the one or two words before the blank. 
You see, research strategies, an action plan. So there you go. Predicting an answer will help you before you even listen to the audio in the 30 second time you're provided before the question being played. So they're going to say, you have 30 seconds to read the question 21 to 24. Then you can read the questions, underline the important things that are two to three words before the blanks and predict the answer. Okay, good. The last one is similar pointers. What is the meaning of similar pointers? We have described pointers from earlier question, you know, under earlier types of question, for example, sentence completion, or let's say MCQs, where we have talked about a number of words, we have talked about many things like quick reading, or let's say um, speed reading, all these pointers will be applicable to this kind of question as well. I just didn't want to repeat the, those like 10 times. So I've already repeated them most of the time. But the, here, you should go back and watch the video. If you have watched the video and you want to revise, wonderful. That will help you to understand the previous question as well as this question. Yes, so please go back, watch video number 9, 10, 11. You will get all the pointers clear and you will be able to solve this question even quicker. Okay, great then. Now, as I said, following mainly about sentence completion will finish most of the pointers. You know, because it has all the word count information about how to find blanks, because these are blanks, more or less, right? If we look at flowchart, we have sentences in boxes, but they are blanks. They are sentence completion with sequence, isn't it? So that way you can take pointers from sentence completion and find this answer, find the answer for this kind of question. All right, great. And that will be the end of the chapter. Matching is little bit tricky because of its types and we are still at listening module we are solving the question types in listening module right now what is this matching it sounds really um weird and we can get we can get lost in the world itself but let me show you an example to get it clear matching actually is we have a question and we have plenty of options to match with I think you must have studied in your childhood when we have one question and it has some parts in it and then we have some options and you have to match the information with it. Now in IELTS, it's not necessary to have same number of options to match with. You can have multiple options or you can have more options and less questions. We'll see those these types. Yeah, good. Now there are two main types. And these types have completely different pointers or uh, tips and tricks. So pay attention. We'll be seeing each type with an example and how to solve these types. Now here we have two kinds of two types of questions for this same matching. The first one is where options will repeat and second where options won't repeat or will not repeat. Yes. Let me show you what it means by them and we'll see examples at the same time and then we'll provide pointers for that. Type one, where options will repeat and option will not repeat. Both of them I'm showing you here. Look at this one, this question where we have mentioned section three. You see 21, 22, 23, 24 and 25, five questions. And here we have three options. You see that definitely they will repeat. If they have mentioned, you may choose any letter more than once. But however, here we have four questions and we have five options here we have three options hence we have to repeat it here however options might not repeat definitely will not repeat in fact there will be less options you know to choose there are more options to choose from and hence we have to ignore one of them or two of them depending on the question so these are the two types now let's start with the pointers along with the example type one where we have to repeat the option you see that you have to choose you may choose any letter more than once okay now i'm gonna let you listen to the audio and try to find the answer your way and then we'll try to solve it using our tips or the pointers okay let me play the audio you will hear a communication studies student talking to his tutor about optional courses for the next semester come in Oh, hello, Jack. Have a seat. Right. 
You said you wanted to see me to talk about your options next semester? That's right. We have to decide by the end of next week. Really, I'd like to do all five options, but we have to choose two, don't we? Yes, but the choice depends on your major, to some extent. You're majoring in communication studies, aren't you? That's right. So, for example, the media studies option will cover quite a lot of the same area you did in the core module on mass communications this semester, the development of the media through the last two centuries in relation to political and social issues. Hmm. Well, that was interesting, but I've decided I'd rather do something completely new. There's a women's studies option, isn't there?、Uh, yes, women and power. Again, it has a historical focus. It aims to contextualize women's studies by looking at the legal and social situation in the 19th and early 20th centuries. So it would be useful if I intended to specialize in women's studies, but I'm not sure I do actually. Well, it might still be useful to give you an idea of the issues involved. It's taught by Dr. Steed. Oh, really? I'll sign up for that then.、Hmm. What about the option on culture and society? Uh, that addresses the historical debate on the place of culture since the Industrial Revolution in Britain. So a historical focus again. <laughs> Do I get the message you're not so keen on history? Well, it's just that we seem to have done quite a lot this semester. Anyway, I'll think about that one. If you're interested in a course focusing on current issues, there's the option on identity and popular culture. That approaches the subject through things like contemporary film, adverts, soap operas, and so on.、Hmm, that sounds interesting. Can you tell me who runs it? Well, it's normally Dr. Stevens, but he's on sabbatical next semester, so I'm not sure who will be running it. It should be decided by next week, though. Right. Well, I might wait until then to decide. And the last option is introduction to cultural theory, isn't it? I'm quite interested in that too. I was talking to one of the second-year students, and she said it was really useful. It made a lot of things fall into place. Yes, but in fact, in your major, you'll have covered a lot of that already in Communications 102, so that might be less useful than some of the others. Oh,、uh, I'll forget about that one then. Hmm. Now, while you're here, we could also discuss how you're getting on with your core module assignment. Good, we are back. I hope you could find the tricky one because see the options are themselves、um, easy to understand but can get、um, confusing at the same time. So the answer for the first one is C, that is twenty first. Twenty second is A. Twenty third is B. Twenty fourth is B as well, and twenty fifth is C. If you're thinking that this is the only one time question, you know, one time that you're having this kind of question, where he'll definitely do it, he may or may not do it, and he won't do it, will be coming an option. Then you're wrong. Very commonly, this kind of question do come. You know, where we have this、um, probability and possibility is an option. Okay. Now, always and always underline the probability, possibility, and certainty. What is the meaning of these? Three words. The meaning is, it might happen, it will happen, it will not happen. Yeah, these are the three things. Let me show you again. He'll definitely do it. He may or may not do it, or he won't do it. Now, what does it mean by that? So when they're playing the audio, they they're gonna talk about something about this guy Jack, and media studies. He gonna talk. They're gonna as we have heard in the audio. He might not do media media studies for some reason. They'll explain the reasons. Reason second one, women and power. They he might do it or he might not do it. Right. So the same way it will continue, and you have to find the answer for each. Another tip for this is please understand the sequence. What do you think the sequence will be followed in the options? No,、nope. sequence will be followed in the question from twenty one to twenty five. So. Basically, what can happen is they'll talk about media studies first, then women and power, and then culture and society. Finally, identity and popular culture, and finally the last one that is twenty fifth. So listen to the sequence. Once you hear this media studies, as soon as talks about media studies are over, please proceed to the next one. Once these talks are over, proceed to the next one. This is how they follow the sequence. Okay.
Next type is listen to the both speakers if they have them. Like sometime in section three, now if you look at it, this is um, definitely section three. In section three, you are supposed to have two speakers. Right, this is a conversation. So there'll be two people speaking. Sometime I provide, let's say Jack will provide an answer. Um, he'll definitely do it, but the other person may ask him question and it will lead to he might not do something like one in power. You get my point what I'm saying here. There are two speakers. One speaker might provide an answer as A, but other person's interference could create the answer as B or C. So please listen to both speakers if they are present, because in section three they are present. Okay, good. Now look at let's look at type two. In type two, we have where options never repeat. We have four questions, five options. So I'm gonna play the audio. Go for it. You will hear a man talking to an official at a tourist information office. Can I help you? Yes, I was wanting somewhere to stay for a few days, a four or five star hotel. Can you tell me something about the possibilities? OK, right. Well, there are five hotels that might interest you. Were you wanting a city centre location or would you be interested in something a bit further out? Well, I do have a car, so I could go for either. Well, there are two central hotels in the range you're looking for. There's Carlton House and the Imperial. They're both near the main square. But if you've got your own transport, you might be interested in the Royal Oak. That's out in the country, about 10 kilometres away. Very peaceful. Um, then there's the Bridge Hotel and the Majestic. Uh, they're both in town, but not in the centre. They're out on the airport road. Hmm, that might be a bit far out, actually. OK, now the other two you mentioned in the city centre. Can you tell me a bit about them? Well, they're both excellent hotels. If you want something with a bit of character, Carlton House is quite unusual. It's a very old building that was originally a large private house. It was bought by the Vannies chain and they completely refurbished it. They took their first guests just a few months ago, but it's already got an excellent reputation. That's a five-star hotel. Or there's the Imperial, which is a much more modern building. That also has its own gym and it also has internet connection and meeting rooms. It's used for conferences and corporate events as well as private guests. That's five star as well. Does it have a swimming pool as well as a gym? No, the Royal Oak has an outdoor pool, which is lovely in the summer, but the only hotel with an indoor pool is the Bridge Hotel. It doesn't have a gym, though. The Majestic is planning to build a swimming pool and a fitness centre, but it's not finished yet. I see. Well, I think I'll probably go for one of the city centre hotels. Cool, we are back. Let me see if you got the right answer and you can check yourself, right? The first one is E, second one is B, third one is C and fourth one is A. I hope you got all of them correct. If not, let's see the pointers. The first one is please don't forget to read the question. I know this is very simple and obvious, but look at the question where it is. You will see all of this text. I don't know where the question is. Question is here, hidden. Which hotel matches each description? Oh, like this is the question, really? We thought the questions are here. Yes, those are questions, but this is like very important information for you to understand the question. Right, good. So read this part, find this part, where is the question mark so that you can match them, okay? Second thing is write the option as answer. Sometimes what people do is they write, let's say the first one answer is B, They'll write this one fully instead of B, the Carlton House. It's incorrect if you write the Carlton House. You have to write B as the correct one. That is B here, C. So write the option, uh, not the whole word, rather the letter. Okay, good. Next one is please understand the sequence like we did in type one. Sequence will be maintained here, not here. So they'll be talking about 
is in a rural area or only open recently, offers facility for business functions, sequence will be maintained here, not here. You have to fo we'll focus on that part. So first they talk about this and they provide you answer for that in the audio. Then they talk about this and answer for this one. Okay, cool. Now, in the case of doubt, I would suggest to you to keep you keep two answers. Why I'm asking you to keep two answers is, see, when you, let's say, you, for the first one, you found A and B both as answers, potential answers, not the answers. And in the second one, you're pretty sure that B is the answer. Then you can definitely eliminate B now and definitely the answer is A. So in the case of doubt, please, you can put two answers as the correct answer. More likely, the situation will be that you will get the correct answer when you proceed. Okay, good. Uh, finally, I would say we have understood uh, all the question types in listening. Firstly, reading comes second in the list. So first comes listening, then reading, and then writing, and then the break. That means after some day or another, that means some different day we have speaking. So reading comes always second, and hence pressure is always increased. Because by the time you finish listening, you are already a little bit tired. So watch out for that part first of all, okay? Secondly, let's see what happens in reading. There are total 40 questions in reading, okay? And they are divided in three sections. They are divided in three sections for a reason, because they have to set in paragraphs, right? And these paragraphs together form passages. There are three passages in case of uh, academic, and five passages in case of general training. Now you're thinking, what are these things? These are two different flavors of IELTS. As I said earlier, if you have not seen introductory video, you won't be able to understand what is this. These are two types. If you're going for studies, take academic exam. If you're going for work, please take, or immigration, take general training, right? So when you go for academic and general training, reading and writing has some I mean, uh, reading and uh, writing has sub some differences. Today, we're going to talk about the differences in reading itself because we are discussing reading. So we'll see what are the differences for academic and general training, and then we proceed with normal reading uh, question types and all. Okay. First of all, the number of passages that are provided in reading are different in academic and general training. In general training, there will be five passages that will be provided from which you will be answering questions. In academic, these are three passages. Secondly, these passages come from what context? Work-related context, uh, advertisements, and television. So context is the difference. So it's everyday context. You can write everyday context. Here, it's always academic context. That means your study-related context. So all, all the passages are being taken from textbooks or journals or probably uh, some research paper. So remember, these are the two major differences. Apart from that, there's a common difference for scoring. When I'm discussing scoring, I'll discuss about it. But remember, in general training, it's a little bit stricter. That means if you get less marks, you get lower bands. If you get a little bit OK marks here, it's fine. So if I get 30 out of 40, uh, out of the 40 questions, I'll get anything between 6.5 bands to 7 bands but here, 7 to 7.5 bands. There's a set number for that. I'm just guessing the number, but it is always lower in general training. Academic is higher because the size of the passage is huge. It's a little bit difficult. Here, the five passages, but smaller passages. Okay, now let's get back to the structure to understand how it works and how much time it takes for both kinds. These were the only differences. Rest is all same. So all of you can watch the video together. All right. So as I said earlier, 40 questions and you get 60 minutes to solve all the answers. Okay, you will be given a question paper as well as an answer sheet. When I'm providing you examples of the question, I'll also show you how answer sheet looks like. It's a blank sheet with blank, I mean numbers where you have to fill uh, for the answers. The generally answers are in one word, two words or three words maximum, maximum four words or ABC depending on MCQs. So answers are being filled in that answer sheet. Question paper, you just have to read and figure it out. Now what happens is, you'll be given passages, okay? So you'll be given passages on one paper. Let's say this is your booklet. My handwriting, my drawing is awesome as well, like my handwriting. So we have these passages here, and in that we have these, this is one paragraph, paragraph two, and here are some questions. So one is a blank, so let's say this is a blank. 
two is also a blank we have blanks here and then the section changes so these are the things you have to do you have to find out where this answer lies in the passage right this is the simple thing that you have to do but of course there are plenty of question types plenty of difficulties distractions little bit difficult language and biggest trouble time why is time such a biggest trouble and how to solve it will to will see in a while okay in listen in listening if you have seen listening video you must be knowing that difficulty level increase with increase in sections and there are three sections in reading but in reading difficulty level is not set based on section so difficulty level is random okay remember that in here difficulty level is random it can change with any passage however in some parts last section is a little bit longer in like for example general training apart from that difficulty level is really random no set thing okay great now let me tell you what are the criteria of checking the paper criteria are simple first thing they see is have you written the answer correctly okay how do they check correctly first of all there must be an answer second thing it is grammatically correct second thing is the word count is correct if you have word kind of question that means you write in two words or three words they must have mentioned not more than one word or two word or three word okay so watch out for that thing so word count is correct and also spelling is correct right and if these three three things are fulfilling you will get one mark for one correct answer right and out of 40 you get some score so if you get 40 out of 40 you get full nine bands if you get less than that so bands get reduced and band reduce it to one is the lowest nine is the highest okay zero zero you get only when you have not attained the exam generally you don't get zero as, a, as the score one you get and at the lowest nine you get the highest and the score went i'll show you later for now remember if you get 40 out of 40 you get nine bands okay now let's coming to the biggest problem what happens is you will be seeing passages right and you will be having questions so basically we have 40 questions and 60 minutes when we look into this we have not more than one minute and a half actually uh, and to be very precise it's actually one minute because you have to later copy the answers to the answer sheet first you write in your rough or your question sheet the answers and then later you copy them into the answer sheet so this reduces to 60 seconds to find a question which is not much because you have to read huge passages that is not a easy task that's why time is always an issue think about it if i give you instead of 60 minutes i give you 120 minutes don't you think it will be easier for you to find the answers easily because you have a lot of time you can read the passages again and again so what is this time issue and why do we have it for that let me just give you an example okay i mean i'm gonna i'm gonna show the another screen one example try to solve it as quick as possible and see how long does it take you to finish it okay i'm gonna take you to the another screen let's see it great all right so if you have not done the example please go back again do it because I want you to get the gist of it. How long does it take and what mistakes you might be making? Now you might, you might be thinking the biggest time waster is my passage. That means I'm looking my, uh, the question into the passage and trying to find the answer. Actually, no, the biggest time waster was that you didn't remember the question. Most of us don't even read the question. What we do is we just look at the question. Okay. So we'll discuss later the general strategy. First of all, let's solve this time issue in most of the types of the question. If you look at the question and we go back to the passage, it's like you look at the ticket, but you don't look at the ticket number. So how would you know your seat number? I mean, you, you don't look at seat number. You just generally look at the ticket. I have a ticket and you put it back in your pocket. Same way, when you look at a question, you have no idea what the question really is. So there's a simple method. We call it remembering the question. You must be thinking, why do I have to remember the question? This is not a remember test. I mean, memory test. In a way, yes, it is for us how to solve the question. This is the trick. If you look at the question, there must be a verb available. Please remember this verb is like a connecting thing that for part one, that is the subject, part two, that is the object or the information. If you can remember the question or the blank, 
it's easy for you to go to the passage and remember and write the, and find the whole thing without even looking at the question. What you must be doing is look into the question one time and go to the passage and read, try to find it. And if you might have found it, you're not sure yet. You come back to the question. You try to solve it. Oh, I wasted a lot of time. And again, you read the question properly this time. In the second, third time, you get the answer. Instead of that, what would we do is we read the question and remember it in a way that we don't have to come back to the question. Okay, let me show you an example how we're gonna do and let's see a blank itself in on the board itself. I'm not gonna take you another screen. So if there's a statement called um, most cars in the world use the best metal. So if this is the blank, let's say something is a blank out of these words, what are you gonna do? You have to remember the verb. That's it, the rest of the things will be easier for you. Why? If you remember the word use, you know something uses something. So that something and something can be filled. Why? You know, most cars use best metal. Simple. If you try to remember every word and each and every word, you don't know where to connect to what. Here, this is like a glue. This glues the first part to the second part. If you remember this word, you know what it is connecting with. And this way, you remember the whole blank or the statement. You go to the passage and try to find, you remember everything now within seven seconds, five to seven seconds, and you don't need to waste time by coming back to the question. You're sure that this is what the blank is. And this way, trust me, you save almost 30 to 40 seconds. And if you save every time 30 to 40 seconds in your blanks, the, compared to the way you were doing earlier, well, you have almost, almost finished your paper by 25 to 30 minutes. I have seen people doing that. So I'm telling you, I'm not click, creating things out of my uh, inner mouth. So out of, not my, out of my pockets, but people have done that using this method. We're gonna start with question types of reading module. And the first one is matching the headings. This question type actually has given nightmares to students. The reason for that is, well, you will see by yourself, right? So the matching heading question type is most common one among with true or false not given. In this question type, what you get to see is a passage, like all reading question types we have discussed in the uh, set a video before this. So you can watch the video if you have no idea what happens in IELTS reading. You got to read a passage and from that passage, which is full of paragraphs, of course, you have to understand information. You have to concise it and you have to provide a title or heading for each paragraph. So let me just visually show you, try to show you visually. So we have here a single paragraph for more three and four like this. These are on the different pages and we have some headings. Now, what is the heading for this one? We don't know. They might, they have given a B C and D and we have some headings, right? Your task is to match these headings with the paragraphs here. Like for example, this heading is matching this one. So I will call uh, maybe this one as B, this one as C, I think you got my point, right? So the question will be, let's say number 12, 13, 14, and 15, which will be paragraph A, paragraph B, which is this one, which is the next one. So this is how the question of heading uh, works. If I show you an example, it will be much better, right? So which is the next one. Now in this example, I couldn't fit too many uh, paragraphs in one go because you know you have to read from the screen itself. So don't underestimate this, that this will be the same one in the exam or similar one. In exam, you will get such paragraphs, which I'm showing here. This is a single paragraph here, okay? In exam, you might get almost five to six like these and you have to, and there'll be a here, A or B, and you'll be asked question, which is matching? Your task is to match paragraph A, which is the whole one, with any of these. So answer is just one of them. I hope you understand what I mean by that. Yeah, let me clear it up first for you. Okay, so your task, you understand now, right? That you have to match 
the heading from the right side to the passage on the left side. Okay, I'll give you not more than a one and a half minute, right? I'll, I'll continue the video without saying anything and you can solve it. Good luck. Okay, I'm back and let's see if you got it or not. Yeah, the answer for this one is the last one. That is number three, a proposal to take control away from the driver. You might have given the right answer or incorrect answer. It's all right. Remember, after you understand the pointers and you do it again, you can recognize your mistakes as well as understand, oh, why didn't I go for this one? It's obvious, right? So the pointers or the tips are number one, always solve this type first, you know, this kind of questions you should always solve first. You must be thinking why. Remember when we have huge paragraphs, even uh, passages, even in general training or academic, you have other questions attached to it. So let's say this is paragraph one, two, three, four, and we have question one, two, three, four, five based on um, headings. And then we have question one, two, three, four, five or six for blanks. And then we have some more, you know, there'll be 13 questions in each section, 13 to 14 in reading in academic and in general training in last section, they will have same 13, 14. If I'm reading all the paragraphs, you got to get all the information, what is happening inside, right? In other question types, we don't read everything, but in this question type, you have to read everything, like all the details. Now, if you have read all the paragraphs or the whole passage you have read, you can definitely guess where the answer lies in blanks and other question types. This is like a boon for you. You don't have to read again. I hope you're understanding what I'm saying. So if you're getting this kind of paragraph question, a heading question, don't be scared. In fact, this is nice. I mean, they are nice to you if they include other question types. Okay. Second one, this is the only question part or question type where we read the paragraph first. Now, what is the meaning of reading the paragraph first? I have, let's say four paragraphs to read from in the whole passage. And this is, and we have some questions like blanks. Now, if you look at blanks, I am definitely not going to read the paragraphs first because they don't make any sense. I'm wasting my time. So what I will do is I'll read the blank first and try to find specific information from the paragraph or the, any other paragraph one or two. Appropriately, you'll find the answer. But in this type, think about it. 
if I read the options or the headings, I have to match how many paragraphs? Four. I match this one, it doesn't work. I match second one, it doesn't work. Maybe it does. That, you know, I go on like a counter. Then I go to the next one, next heading and try to match with everyone. This is gonna, you know, waste a lot of time of yours. If you read one single paragraph, how many headings do you have to read? These are like few words. Heading one, two, three. Oh, this one connects. Next one. So always read the paragraph first, only in this kind of question. Please never read the paragraph first. I am not encouraging you to read the whole story. I'm encouraging you to read only certain uh, in, um, in, you know, other questions, just a question first and then paragraph. But in this one, please remember paragraph first. I can't emphasize more paragraph first. See, this is what I mean. This is an exception. It doesn't happen every day. In, I mean, in every question, we have almost seven to eight kind of question types. I mean, total question types. We never do this. We never read the paragraph first. In fact, we always make sure that we never read the paragraph first. But here, we make sure we do that. You understand what my point is, right? I hope so. If not, please comment or ask in my email ID. Yeah. Moreover, we have to understand the theme of the paragraph. What I mean by theme of the paragraph is you'll understand in a while and I'm giving an example. Let's say I'm trying to write a paragraph about me or myself, right? And I say the sentence, I wake up at six in the morning and go for uh, the gym at 6.30, right? Now, if I ask you, what is this paragraph about? Go ahead, you can start your guesses. Most of you will guess about my daily schedule because I started this way. So you'll talk about my daily routine maybe, or you'll talk about my schedule. So the paragraph is about this. See, what can happen is in the next sentence, I can add something in a way that you can't even guess that, right? What I mean is I'm going to just talk about gym and notice that I wake up at six in the morning and go for the gym at 6.30. I reach the gym at seven, and we have a small chit chat till 7.30 with my friend. After this, what I do is generally have some bench presses, uh, uh, bench presses and then I have some push-ups. After that, following to this, and I keep continuing, uh, I keep going on and keep talking about gym, you know, what, I, what exercises I do and all those stuff. So is it about my routine or schedule? Of course not. It's about the gym. It's about how, I'm, how much I love exercises, right? And how much I love doing it. So you might be thinking, oh, this sentence gave me all the information. No. In paragraphs, what gives you the information is the glue or the connecting information. You know, like for example, the first sentence talked about this. There was something called gym, but you thought of all other things. Then I... And can I send the next paragraph uh, sentence to you? Then what do you think is, okay, he wasn't talking about routine. He was talking about his gym. And next to that, again, gym, this is called the glue or connecting information. This provides you more, um, you know, detailed description of the paragraph rather than just single sentence. Yes, this is called theme of the paragraph, right? Now, last one, headings. Headings are really important. What is the meaning of, what are the meaning of headings? See these, what we do is we try to justify each word of the heading with the paragraph. We never do single word justification. So let me show you what we have done earlier. How different, let's see just the heading. I mean, we have written the solution here. How different countries have dealt with traffic congestion. We can't just look at countries or dealt or traffic congestion. We try to look at how different countries, different countries have dealt with traffic congestion. You just, we just can't look at traffic congestion. Second one, the impact of driver behavior on traffic speed. So not just driver behavior, but where on traffic speed. You're understanding my point. When you're searching for this information, you cannot just look at one or two words. You have to read, you have to understand the other words which can create uh, a difference in your answer. The last one, a proposal to, the con to take control away from the driver. Now, there are three things here in this kind of question. The first one is the proposal itself. 
for what to take control away from the driver so a proposal that takes control away from the driver three different things you can't just look into uh, control away from driver it has to be a proposal right the last I would say which I have not mentioned here but I would like to these words will not might not be exactly there that there is a control away they have mentioned the word control away in the um, passage itself you see coincidentally the proposal is mentioned here right but they have never mentioned control away they have never mentioned uh, anything apart from that right what i mean is they might change the wordings they might paraphrase it they might create their own language your task is to understand the language and then proceed you have to read the whole thing what they're testing here is how to concise information concise means shorten the information the problem with this kind of a thing is what we generally do is we try to listen or try to read and try to get our own uh, perspective of it rather than putting their point in first i hope i i think i'm making sense in this when you read it try to explain it to yourself what did you read if you didn't you might have two kinds of problems first one could be you have language issue that means you can't understand language Second could be that you are really quick to judge things. You read something and you think of, okay, I know the answer. This used to happen to me, you know, when I was in 10th or 11th grade, I used to just read a little bit and then guess the answer. It really hindered me a lot in my score. It was a trouble for me. Don't do that, please. In 10th or 11th, we had a lot of tests and I understood in the test, small test, unit test. But here it's a lot on stake, okay? So I suggest you not to do it initially. In practice, of course, you can make these mistakes, right? But in real tests, we cannot expect this because you have paid a lot. Second thing, there are a lot of hopes. Third, there's a lot of pressure. So this is where the practice comes in. There are many um, sources where you can get this when we have described in, uh, in the documents themselves. So there you can see if you practice your way plus connect my uh, the methods we have uh, provided here pointers and stuff together they will create a unique method for yourself and you can solve them all right uh, and that's the end of the chapter true false and not given and yes no and not given they're similar but not the same but we're going to talk both in the one go and we can solve them together now let me tell you what happens in true false not given what you're supposed to get is you'll be getting a statement, right? And you have to match this statement or confirm it according to the passage, right? So I write here something and I have a passage which has a lot of paragraphs in it. I check if this sentence is matching with any of these uh, passages or any information we have, right? So let me just tell you one more thing. Most people have misconceptions that if I write true, false, not given, or if I write yes, no, not given, it's one and the same. No, it's not one and the same. This is one of the biggest mistakes people make. If the question says that clearly it's true, false, and not given, you're supposed to write this one. If the question says yes, no, and not given, you're supposed to write this one. Don't worry. If you don't understand the question, don't worry about it. We'll still explain more. But when I say in the question itself, in the instructions, they'll mention if it is this type or that type. Now, what's the difference? More difference, detailed difference so that you don't forget it. When the paragraph or the passage is about a fact, they always use this one. When the passage is about uh, a, an opinion, they talk about yes, no, not given. Let's uh, understand it uh, using a sentence. Sun rises in the east. If I ask you, will I say, is it yes or no? Or will I say, is it true? Of course, I'll say, is it true? Because it's a fact. And if I ask you, are you hungry? Or let's say, um, what do you think about it? You say this way, that way. This is your opinion. I'll say yes or no. You get my point. For facts and figures, we say true or false. For opinions, we say yes or no. That's the only difference we have in this kind of question. 
So the paragraphs will change rather than anything else. These paragraphs will be fact-based paragraphs and the paragraphs for yes, no, not given will be opinion-based paragraphs. So one writer may be guessing this might have happened or that might have happened. In that case, you will have a yes, no, not given. You cannot interchange the answers in the answer sheet. Instead of true, false, you cannot write yes, no, not given. I have seen plenty of people doing it and they do get reduction for this and say, why didn't I get in reading seven or 7.5 or eight even? The reason is you made mistake in seven questions, which are true or false not given. And guess what? Done. It's gone. Yeah. So, and one more thing, similar uh, mistakes people make is never write in short. They write like this, T, F, N, G. Come on. You have them, you have enough time to write the answers in the answer sheet. You gotta write full. It takes like microseconds almost, like one second to write true. It, it, it doesn't take long, see, instead of this. Same thing goes for yes, no, not given. I suggest you write full rather than this. So this is wrong, this is right. This is right and this is wrong. Okay, please write full, never write in short. Now, this is how the instructions look like. Do the following statements agree with the information given? You see this word, agree with the information given in reading passage one, two, whatever the number is, it depends on the exam, but this is how it goes. In boxes one, two, three on your answer sheet, write this. So these are number of questions. One, two, three, 11 to 15, whatever it is, you'll provide you. True, if the statement agrees with the information, Okay, false if the statement contradicts with the information. Not given if there's no information on this. Now I think you can understand even better now. If you find the sentence, well and good. Now we have two conditions. I think you know what um, flowchart is. So first, look for information. If you found the information, we have two conditions, right? If found, yes and no. So no and yes. Let's say I found the information. Again, we have two conditions here again. That does the statement agree with the information? Yes, then it is true. If the statement doesn't agree with, uh, doesn't agree or contradicts, it's false. And here on the other side, did you find the information? No, I didn't. So it's not given. It sounds so simple, right? It's not. There are a lot of confusions that you will see what, what these confusions are. So with an example, these confusions will be uh, cleared. What gonna happen? Now look, we have three questions. Like I showed, I showed you this this kind of question. I mean, uh, in instructions. Uh, these are the questions. Okay. And now, what your task is? Just read the first question, which is here, and then match it with the the information given on the other side, left side, right? So questions are on the right side, information on the left side. Your task is to match and give, provide answer as true, false, and not given. From day one, keep practicing writing as true, false, and not given. Okay? So your task is to write answers for one, two, and three, and you will not get more than, I would say, four minutes or five minutes, because I understand these question types can take longer, but still, you shouldn't take more than four to five minutes, okay? So I'll stop the video and you can continue solving it, looking at the screen.
I hope you finished it on time. Time is an issue as always in, um, you know, reading uh, type question. I mean, reading module itself. So let's see the answers now. The answer for the first one, Marie Curie's husband was a joint winner of both Marie Curie's Nobel Prize. False. Yeah, false. Marie Curie became interested in science when she was a child. Not given. Like this. And Marie Curie was able to attend the uh, Sorbonne because of her sis sister's financial contribution. True. See, I told you earlier in his introduction that if question type is about a fact, they will definitely use true, false, not given. You see that? Marie Curie was a real person. She did something real. That's why it's a fact. You cannot base it on opinions. That's why it, it has true, false, not given rather than yes, no, not given. Okay. The next one is pointers. Yes. Now we have to see how to solve these questions. If you get them correct, well and good. Maybe you're lucky. Maybe you're right. Maybe you know how to solve this question. Maybe others don't. Or you need to see more examples. Pointers will be for all kind of questions of this type. Let's see the worst case scenario. Okay. Worst case scenario is you are left with three minutes and you're left with seven questions of true, false, not given. I'm writing in short, never write in short. Okay. Just to make you understand. What would you do? Would you want to be left with true, false, not given seven question or true seven true uh, fill in the blanks? If I was in the situation, I will definitely want to be left with true, false, not given in the last three minutes. What I mean by this is we don't have much time and we are left with which question type depends on us. Never do these kind of questions first. The reason for that is, let's say I have no time. What would I do? I can guess. We have true, false, not given or yes, no, not given. I can choose any of the three and chances of getting correct is 33%. Are 33%. For all of them, the chances, 33%. You can see that. However, in the case of blanks or any other question type, chances are like not possible at all. How would you guess a blank? So this is the blank. How would you guess it without knowing about it? So you're getting my point. Let's say I'm left with seven. What would I do is I will just write all of them true. What will I get is probably two correct. If I'm lucky, three out of six or seven. Here, chances almost zero. Like no chance you will get any blank correct by just by guessing any word randomly. Here, random guesses will get you two to three correct answers. True, you got my point what I mean by guessing? Now, we gonna, you know, make it better. Better than guessing. So let's say I'm left with three minutes and we have seven questions. I'll try to solve two questions. And in the first one, we'll try to solve two questions. We have three minutes left and we have seven total questions. Understand the situation, yeah? This is like a movie. And I tried solving first one and second one and I am pretty sure that this is true and this one is false. Now what's left? Not given, right? So for the third, fourth, fifth and sixth, I'll write all of them not given because chances are that at least two of them or one of them will be not given, right? So you get my point, what I mean by that, that this is better than guessing. This is like getting to the next level of guessing. That means you got two correct, definitely one or two correct again. So chances of out of six, you will get four correct. This remember is the worst case scenario. We are not saying that you should do it in the exam, right? Don't get lazy. Yeah, be crazy. So let's see another method. I hope you understand the earlier one. That was, that was tricky, right? This is also tricky. This is going to help you to get things quicker or fast. The verb method I feel is to understand the verb method. You got to understand the reason for wasting time. Very important information. Please pay attention here. This is going to be helpful in any question type you have in uh, reading to remember the question itself or any sentence, not just in IELTS or anything. 
in any language if you want to remember a sentence the verb method gonna be applicable for now we're gonna talk about IELTS perspective now this is one of the few sentences we have seen earlier Mary became interested in science when she was a child Mary was able to attend the Sorbonne because of her sister's final contribution right your task in this method is sorry my bad your task in this uh, method is find out where the verb is became right here or you can connect with became interested able to done these are the verbs we, we connected them we understood them this, these are the verbs what your next task should be after number task number one find the verb Task number two, if you don't know what verbs are, I mean, you should watch the grammar series which we have provided in the same uh, place and that will help you for sure. In the parts of speech uh, video, everything is being explained in detail what verbs are and how they, uh, what are the types of it. So please go through that. Now, Mary was able to attend the server. Now, second task in understanding this method is after you understand the verb, create questions for yourself. Who became interested in what and when? So, who became, we should remember this, interested as well because I said together, they are together, in what and when? Now, when you say it this way, I don't need to remember everything in a sentence. I remember by giving the answer. Mary became interested in science when she was a child why am i asking you to remember so the third one is to remember so definitely after this you will be e it'll be easier for you to remember let's take another example and i'll explain why why am i asking you to do all this someone was able to attend somewhere because of someone or something Someone was able to attend somewhere because of something. Now you can fill in the blanks in there's someone and some words. And you don't have to remember this more than like, I don't know, one minute maximum. Now let's explain why this word, word method works and why do we need it. You have paragraphs, right, on different page and you have questions or statements on the other page. The biggest time waster in this kind of questions in reading is turning pages turning pages takes a lot of time so i go from question i read the question i don't even understand i just read it here first i'll go back to passage and try to find the information directly when i found some information relevant information right so what will i do i'll say oh maybe i didn't understand the question itself i'll go back to the question you go back to the question and you try to find the information that you were missing. You understand the question now, come back again. This cycle or the sit circle goes on for at least thrice. The reason it goes on for thrice is you didn't understand the question or you didn't remember the question. This is very similar to what happens when you go to uh, catch a train early. So let's say I am um, planning to go somewhere and I reach the train station half an hour early. I'll keep checking, you know, in my in my pocket if I have my ticket and what's the name of the, I mean, number of the my seat. Let's say B2 and some number, 23. I'll keep checking it for like every 15 minute, minutes and when I enter the train, I still will confirm. Why am I doing this? Don't I have a brain to remember it? Because I didn't focus. Same thing here. You do have brain, but for you, question is not important. Important is answer. But you forgot, without question, how would you provide answer? Like you keep forgetting the ticket, you keep forgetting the statement itself. And that is the reason you can't find the answer quickly. With the verb method, you can easily remember the whole statement, at least for one minute. If you think about it, who became interested in what and when, now you can answer it by yourself. See, without even looking, you can close your eyes and answer the question. This is how 
you should remember the statement just for one minute while you're solving the question and then move ahead. Change your why and what's. And easily you can find information in the passage without even going even once, you know, back to the, the question types. You understand how verb method can create an impact in your um, question types or, you know, in your reading test. This is my favorite method in reading, which saves a lot of time. Now, um, true or yes, what's the difference? I think you know what's the difference now. Fact-based and opinion-based. Yes, you're right. Let's see difference between true and yes and how to find the answer. We have here true, right? Mentioned here. Mary Curie's husband was a joint winner of both Mary's Nobel Prize. I think we have seen this. It wasn't true. This one was true. We have seen that as well. So let's see the questions first. And we know this one was true. Sorry. And what we're going to do is we'll try to find the answer now. So Mary was able to attend the Sorbonne because of her sister's financial contribution. I suggest you get all the information in the question by remembering it. Someone was able to attend somewhere because of someone. Again, same thing. Mary was able to attend the Sorbonne because of her sister's financial contribution. Please try to match the information exactly it is provided. But expect paraphrasing. Right. Able to is equal to can. I mean could here. Was able to. That's why could. Past of can. Somewhere they mentioned. And the reason for was her sister's financial contribution. Now if you read the last paragraph, I think it's apparently clear. In 1981, this promise was fulfilled and Mary went to Paris and began to study at Sorbonne. Sorbonne is here. You should get, you know, ding, ding, ding. Okay, found it. She often worked far into the night and lived on little more than bread and butter and tea. And, and tea. She came first in the examination in physical science in 90, 1893 and in 1894 was placed second in the examination. Now, look. You see serb on there, right? But still, you didn't find the information about her sister's financial information thing, right? What to do now? In the first sentence itself, what did we see? In 1981, this promise. You see that what's happening here. This, that, and all these words are referring somewhere something earlier that means answer is connected to something else that is previous one you understanding my point sometimes you don't find answer in the single sentence or two sentences you have to understand logically that oh we have this and that and which that means answer might be a little bit previous in our previous paragraph now we're going to read the previous paragraph from childhood mary was remarkable for her prodigies memory and at the age of 16, won a gold medal on, com on completion of a secondary education because her father lost his savings. Hmm. Savings, we get a connection with financial contribution. Keep going. Through bad investment, she then had to take work as a teacher. Not inf information for us because then we never have to talk about teacher. From her earnings, she was able to finance her sister's Bronia's medical science at studies in Paris on understanding that Bronia would in turn later help her to get an education. Right, you see that? She gonna later help her and this promise was fulfilled and Mary went to Paris. You see that? The connection between here and hence her contribution actually helped. Got it? So this is how you find true. It might not be present in a single sentence. One sentence might not have, well, not even two, but how these sentences are connected to the next one or the previous one is the hint. If you're getting hints about Mary, her attending somewhere or Sorbonne or, you know, sister's financial contribution, all these are hints or let's say uh, major information. These can help you to find the answer in the passage. But don't rely on single sentence or don't rely on single wordings because they are mentioned here. These things will definitely help you. Okay, good. Now, what can be changed? 
this is a good question because what we have is just change. We have a sentence here right from the passage which we found as information and we have a statement from the question. This is a question. This is a passage. Of course, I'm going to try to change the answer if I want to make it false or not given. So this change is important for us. So we have to think what can be changed. Now look here. Mary was able to attend the Sorbonne. Now till here we have one slot of information. One, you can call it one clause. Was not able to attend. Okay. Second, not Mary, somebody or a different was, you know, somebody else was able to attend. Or maybe in other university or other place. That means we can change these many things next because of someone else financial contribution we can say fathers we can say instead of financial contribution emotional support so see how many things can change plenty you have to pay attention on what can change in order to do that you understand what is there first in the question yeah now let's see what can change in this itself Mary was able to attend the place itself some persons and what kind of contribution you see six things can change this thing why do we need to understand the change because we have to understand the next thing which is false and not given this no or false versus not given is a nightmare for students they come to me and say that I we tried as hard as we can and still we got incorrect answer in this type. The first thing you should understand is if information is changed, then it's definitely no or false. Now, what is this information? We'll see that. If subject is changed, then it is not given. Now, we have two things. Information, subject, we'll see that what these things are. But if it is taking long to find, also not given. So three things which can help you quickly to find the answer. First is information, subject, and here time taking long. Right. Let me explain what I mean by that. You see here, we have, I bet, we have Marie Curie's husband was joint winner of both Marie's Nobel Prize. Sub whose subject? Here, Marie Curie's husband. Instead of husband, if I provide someone else, most probably it's not given because I didn't talk about that person. Information is, was a joint winner of both of these things. Joint winner, joint winner of something. If I say it was single winner, then they are changing the information. Here it's the subject. You get my point clear? If I change the subject, it's not given. If I change the information, it's false. And if I can't even find that information or it is taking long, then it's definitely also not given. Remember these three things and try to solve them and see how the magic happens. Okay, I hope you understood these three things. I'm, I'm going to repeat again. Subject change, not given. Information change, false. If it's taking long or time is a trouble, then definitely not given. Or you can keep it as not given as a guess. Okay. Now. Please expect synonyms and paraphr paraphrasing a lot in this kind of question. All the things that they are doing is just changing the system, I mean the sentence, but they're keeping the meaning if it is true. If you look at this, right, we have here one sentence and in fact, we have solved this one, last one. How many things did it change there? They changed able to attend, they changed financial contribution, they change, um, you know, the, they, of course, they can't change the name, right? This is the way you find the information first, like we did. We tried to look for Sorbonne and we, we were in the last paragraph. But because of this, we could lead somewhere else. So the names or the things they can't change are helping you to find the information. But other things they're going to change, which will be definitely helpful if you think that there can be synonyms, there can be paraphrasing. Don't expect exactly same sentences or exact same words in the paragraph. You will be considered really, you know, a gullible person, right? If you think this way, IELTS cannot be this easy. In fact, any exam cannot be this easy if they provide you direct answers. Okay, so expect this so that you can work on that.
And that's the end of the chapter. Hi, I'm Satendra, your IELTS trainer. And today we're going to talk about matching features, which is very similar to matching headings. And it's a part of reading module. You are still in reading modules, but it has some differences than matching headings. I mean, the matching features question types. Now in matching features, instead of matching headings, we don't get headings to match. In fact, we get some part of the paragraph or the information being provided as options. I know very complex information which I have provided you right now. Example will help you to go through it. So what you do is you match set of statements to a list of options, right? There are plenty, state, plenty of statements like this and your options like A, B, C, and these statements you match with the information provided here. Whichever so matches is an answer. And the options are the features from the text. You got it. That's why it's called matching the feature itself. So the options are actually a group of features that you have to match with the set of statements. All right, now let me show you an example of it so that you get clear about it. So if you see here, we have a passage here on the left, right? This is a passage. Here we have instructions and here we have questions. Among these questions, we have something called statements. These are our options. The options are called features. If you might have noticed, we have used these words, features, questions, instructions, and passage. Clear about this, right? You have to search for where and who mentions, I mean, uses rockets as war weapons. Clear, right? Who uses weapons as war weapons. Now, let me make it one more thing clear. This is an example for you to understand or practice, but in exam, you will definitely not get two as questions, you might get seven, six or eight or this, these many numbers. Options will be same, seven, eight or nine. Mostly options are more, right? And they might repeat in the answers. They are mentioned here, you may use any letter more than once. If they don't want you to repeat, they won't mention this. If they, if there are chances, they will mention that. Okay, good. Now let's try to do, uh, solve this example which we have seen. Let's try to do it. This is the same example I've shown you. This is a short question type, right? I'm not going to give you more than two minutes uh, to solve this. So you have just two minutes. Try to find the answer and I wish you good luck.
All right, and we are back. Now, the point is you have to check if these answers are matching what you have provided, you know, in your book. Let's see that answers in the form of solution. The first one is A, second one, which is number eight, is D. So this is A and this is D. Now, how did you get this answer? We'll discuss that later. For now, if you have written correct answers, wonderful. If not, no worries. We're going to see how we're going to solve the answer, these kind of questions. Yeah. Okay. So the pointers, as I said, are the hints. We'll start with hint number one. Number one, always understand that we have to do the question first. We have to notice the question first. You cannot go to the passage and read it and waste a lot of time. See, we have 40 questions in listening, I mean in reading, and we have 60 minutes. If you are wasting a lot of time, you might not get enough time to do the last section or any number of questions. Like at least seven to eight you'll miss if you keep reading the passages or more. It's important here. Next thing is always, as I said, read the question first and then comes the passage. After you read the question first, move on to the passage. Of course, that's the most important thing after that, right? After understanding the question, don't just wither around and read all the questions first. One question, go to the passage, find the answer. Next question, go to the passage and then find the answer. It's possible you might find one, one answer as A and next time you see that, oh, probably that's not the correct answer. Maybe because you found the next one. So if you look at it, if in case there's a tiny mistake you make, you can understand from the second one, but you can't just read two of questions at the same time and then find two. That's not how it works. Always read the question first. That is the first question or any number you are at and then move to the passage. Okay. Now, if you look at this, where are the questions? You can recognize question by this numbering. It is never numbered as Roman numbers or as ABC or as you know, the capital ones is always is like in this form, normal numbers, right? If you look at this, you always go for this one first after reading the instructions, of course, if they have allowed, if you allow it to, you know, use more than once, then proceed to the whole, you know, the, the passage, then you can't just jumble in the question itself because there are two, you can see them. Otherwise you can't. Yeah. Cool. The next one is keyword. What is this keyword? See, after the question comes the passage and after the passage, you look for keywords. What are these keywords? Let me show you. Rockets as war weapons. Rockets and war weapons should be used or synonym of war weapon might be used. I'm not saying exactly they'll be used as war weapons. But rockets and war weapons, whenever you see them together, you should get a signal. Hmm, my answer probably is here. Now, if you look here, the incentive for the more aggressive use of rockets, I'm reading from here, came not with, from within the European continent, but from far away India, whose leaders had built up a corps of rocketeers and used rockets successfully against the British in the last 18th century. If you see that, they have mentioned aggressive use of rockets. So this word, more aggressive use of, use of rockets, is giving you hint as war weapons. Right. Second thing, within the European continent, but from far away India. See, they already mentioned the answers, answer here. Rockets use a war weapon mentioned here in the first part. Second part provides you answer. That's by A. Cool. Second one. I'm not going to provide you the answer second way found it. We'll see later. But rocket launcher. See, using a rocket launcher for the first time. Now this word rocket launcher uh, is a part of two words. It's like a phrase. What I want you to do is expect that they might be using in separate places. They might be providing you this information in various places. They might provide rocket first and then launcher again in different place. Don't just look for rocket launcher. Don't just get stuck to that. Expect synonyms, expect different usage or expect, you know, those words separately but in a same tandem, in a, in, a, in a equal tandem, okay? 
Cool. Now, you might find the answer in not just one single sentence, but maybe more than one sentence. What it means by, your answer might not be a single sentence. You have to read for relation from the first sentence to the next sentence. That will be the way it is in every sentence, you know, I mean, in every question type in reading. You cannot probably find answer by reading one single sentence where you found the keyword. Generally, what people do is they follow half of the instructions. They say, okay, I was given instruction questions first. I did it. Then I searched the keyword. I did it. Now, when I go to the passage, I try to find answer from a sentence. I can't find it. Maybe I am, you know, lost. No, you're not lost. You're just looking for exact keywords or you're looking in a single sentence. Please don't do that. Keep searching, right? So you might, um, singles, more than one sentence might be needed, as I said. Now, if you look here, you were lucky about the first part, right? Next part, you might, I mean, what I mean to say is, see, this is a phrase, Americans developed a rocket, completed with its own launcher, right? Because in this part, we are lucky. We are getting rocket and launcher and the and Americans in a single part, but in different phrases. Otherwise, they can talk about America a lot. And then next sentence, they could say, and they were the first one to use it as launches for those things, you know, for the rockets they were using. So they can do such things. And you will be like, oh, they have not mentioned anything about people or any country. That's not how it's supposed to be. Okay, good. The last one is important that you eliminate the useless options. The obvious options, what I mean by that is the obvious options should be eliminated because it's going to help you to reduce the options and hence find the answers easily. Now, if you look here in the whole passage, you can definitely find Indians, the word British, Arabs. Hmm. I don't see anything as Arab. So maybe eliminate Americans. Yes. So the answer is probably Indian, British or uh, Americans. This reduces, I mean, this reduces the hard work. Now you don't have to worry about C. You have to worry about A, B or D. Right. And even British is over in the first part. So you, if you found India as answer, you might not even search for British after that. So you're left with initially with Indian and British. And when that is over, Arab is not possible. Hence, America is the answer, obvious answer for the last one. Got my point what's happening here. We are using a little bit of brain plus a little bit of uh, a logic and a trick to find the answers easily. Good. Right. So this, this was the question type which we studied today that is matching the feature. It's not matching the heading. Remember that it sounds similar, but it's not. And um, you have many things like, you know, you have to read the question first, then go for the keyword, expect the answer in various places, you know, distributed, and please eliminate the option uh, if you can. And that's how you're going to find answer for this. I hope you uh, practice well uh, after this session. And I wish you good luck. See you later. Bye bye. Table completion. Table completion was also there in listening module, if you remember. But today we are looking at reading module. Okay, this is a little bit different than listening. Of course, you have to listen for information there. Here you have to read information, but the structure stays the same. That you have a table like, you know, and you have to fill the blanks in the table. So we have this table and we are given some information as the heading of the column and as the heading of the row and information is blank probably or provided. So something like this will be there in exam and you have to find answer for these blanks. See that this is the structure of the table and this was similar. This is similar to the listening one and same goes with reading. Yes. Good. Now an example will help you to, you know, understand it even better. Let me show, well, let me open the example and show you here. We have question here, which is in the form of table. And then we have passage in the left. Okay, your task is to find the answer for number 10, 11 and 12, which I've marked red for your conveniency. And uh, 
remember you have to read also the instructions we'll discuss that later just for like, like a hint right read for information from the uh, article mentioned on the left dung beetles and try to find the answer on the right okay good you will not get more than three minutes because this is a blank and for blank generally we don't get much time so let's begin All right, we are back then. Let's try to find answer for number 10, 11, and 12, right? You must have written some words and I'll, I'm gonna provide you the answer. The answer is early spring, two to five, you can write in words as well, and subtropical. Okay, how did we get the answer? Wait, I mean, when I'm explaining the pointers, it will be clear. But for now, if your answers are correct, wonderful. If not, no worries, we're gonna look into pointers as well. Now pointers are the hints and the first one is word count. Now what is this word count? See we have read we have read this or we have understood it. It's important when it is blank type question where we have a blank you have to know how many words you have to provide as answer. So to know the word count well read the instructions they are all connected every time the same thing. Now look here they have mentioned choose no more than three words. What does it mean if I choose one word as answer it will go uh, zero word is not given right so I won't choose it as answer uh, two words as answer it's correct three words still correct but four no not allowed no more than three clear hence it's important because let's say the answer shows as four and you can have to eliminate the obvious part of the answer and keep it as three or two okay 
Good. Second one is understand the table. What is the meaning of understand the table? You have to understand using titles and headings. Now, if you look here, we have a heading of the passage. Every time we will have some heading, which is dung beetle. Dung beetle is type of a beetle. So they're going to talk all about beetle. If I was not giving you title here, you'll be confused. What am I talking about? Right. What are these pieces I'm talking about? Without the title, it's difficult for you to understand what it is about. And understanding is the key. When you're trying to find any answer, understanding the passage is the key. And you have to start understanding using the heading. It takes like two seconds to read the heading and it provides a lot of information. Cool? Good. Second information or third, uh, as far as let's say our pointer is rows and columns provide you a lot more information than you think. It's a plenty of information. Now, when we have here, we have these words or phrases as columns. I think you know what columns are the vertical ones always and the rows are the horizontal one. So here we have Spanish and South American ba uh, ball roller as your rows and your species are preferred climate, start of active period and number of generations per year are your columns. This will give you information about the cell. So when I intersect preferred climate and Spanish, my answer is provided here. And same goes for the number 10, start of active period and Spanish. So when do this, uh, these Spanish pieces start their active period? It will be here. When do they start in the case of South American baller? Here. So columns provide you information about what the answer is towards. Okay, read the uh, columns and rows very carefully. Without columns and rows, this is not even table. Okay, so let me just zoom in a little bit and uh, help you with that, what I mean by that. So look here, preferred climate, what is it? Temperate. Now this is an example which can be, uh, which can help you, which can be a hint for you for the next answer. Right. Same way, if they have mentioned for Spanish, I can find for South Af African ball roller as well. There must be, this must be a temperature or I mean, this must be a weather. Isn't it? Same goes for the next one. Now, in exam, you will get at least six to six or seven uh, questions. I've reduced this because I wanted you to do in the screen itself so that no material is required. Okay. Uh, you understand my point about rows and columns, right? With this example. Well, if it's, if you understand good, otherwise you can write a mail or you can write in comments. Okay. Now we have to predict. Now we have seen this earlier as well in rows and columns. We get information from uh, rows and column. What could be an answer? Right. And also other cells help like other cells. What they do is they try to help you by giving a hint towards the answer. In this case, we have temperate. Temperate is providing you a hint that, hmm, 12th one must be a weather or a climate. Right. What kind of climate is required for South African ball roller? Like we have preferred climate for Spanish, the species, right? Plus it must be a climate. Going for second one, that is second column, start of active period. Now when I say active period, not just the way it provide information in temperate in previous case, here it must be some kind of time. Number of generation per year, that means it must be a number here. You're getting my time here, right? I mean, what, my, what I'm trying to say here. Here it must be time, here it must be a number. So this is called predicting an answer and looking for that particular answer. Now you won't be focusing on every word. You'll be focusing on climate, time and number, nothing else. It becomes so easy, trust me, when you just try to predict an answer, search for it. Yeah, okay. Sequence is always maintained. What is the meaning of that? The answers appear in the same sequence as the question. Okay, let me show you when I'm, what I mean by that. 
So we have here early spring. And let me explain where did we find the answer. It was a little bit tricky one. Species Spanish was being there mentioned with French. In the cooler environments of the state of Virginia, I'm reading from here, by the way, the large French species, which is mentioned, is matched with smaller temperate climate Spanish species. So this word comes in picture and they have mentioned temperate. That means we are on the right track. The former, former means that this is a way of writing former and latter. In the earlier sentence, we have information former equal to first and latter equal to second one. So this is our former and this is our latter. That means first one and second one. So the former means French species are slow to recover from the winter cold and produce only one or two generations of offspring from late spring until autumn. They mention the time. That means we have to look for this information for larder, which because we have been asked start of active period for Spanish. The larder, which multiply rapidly in early spring, produces uh, produce two to five generations annually. Now, if you look here, there are two answers given so quickly you can miss them. The larder, which is Spanish, which multiply rapidly in early spring active period multiply rapidly clear the synonym they, the, they have changed i mean they have changed some words to distract you when do they multiply when do when do they have active period early spring and there we have answer second one produce two to five generations now you can write like this you can write like two two five answer is still correct because we have three words, no more than three words. That means three words are allowed. Right. And if we continue, we can also find an answer for the next one. You got my point, what I mean by that. So first answer came here, early spring. Second one here. And if you keep looking, the next one here. See, sequence is maintained. If you find first information, Spanish, Temperate preferred climate is here. That means we have found the beginning. We found the beginning. It's easy to continue. Now we don't have to look anywhere back from here to here. This is useless information for us because we have no answer over there. Right. We are going to save a lot of time by understanding where the answer starts from and where it ends. Okay. And time is money in reading. Trust me. If you have time left, so think of an example. I give you 120 minutes instead of 60 minutes to find 60, 40 answers in reading. You All of you will get 40 or 39 at least, right? So time is money. What if your 60 minutes, can we convert it to 120 minutes because we finish our question paper or the whole thing in 35 minutes? So a similar technique, right? You have plenty of time to recheck to solve the answer which you have dialed on. So it gets easier for you to score well. Last but not the least is the grammar and spelling. Now in our case, in our example, grammar is not that a big deal because we have just one word answer. But in case of a little bit longer blanks, grammar will be taken care. But if, if, see, answers are incorrect according to the spelling, you won't get score or you won't get marked for that. If instead of early, you write spelling like this, early this is incorrect you have to write the correct spelling okay incorrect spelling is considered incorrect answer though they understand you found the right answer but with incorrect spelling now -uh. grammar will help you to find if this is the right answer if you place it in the blank and see if it is making sense good okay you understand that part i think we have discussed it plenty of the time in all the question types so it's easy to understand and that's the end of your chapter. This is kind of a question where it looks like an image actually, but it's not. And by the way, we are still in reading module and uh, let's see what happens, right? What is this flowchart? Flowchart actually is a series of boxes or steps linked by arrows. Now, how does it look? When you draw it or you visualize it, so these are the boxes, right? These are linked by arrows. 
this is how flowchart looks like, like you know, steps, but in the form of graphics. But why do we do that? The reason for us to do it is to show a sequence of events. So let's say there's an event that happened number one, number two, and number three. In order to signify this event, we'll try to form one box and write about it. Next event in next box. Or if you have two events concurrently happening, you can draw two boxes by drawing two separate arrows or forking them. This is also possible. So all these kinds are called flowcharts. All right. Now let me show you an example so that everything gets clear to you and there are no more doubts. And if they are, you can ask them. So this is kind of a question that you get in exam. Here we have only taken three questions and we have um, a tiny passage here on the left. In fact, the passages are huge in exam as well as the flowcharts. At least there are six questions. But for our practice or to understand the question type, we have taken only three. Don't worry about that. Okay. Now, I want you to finish this uh, type because it is only three questions. It contains only three questions. You have just like two minutes or three minutes maximum. Let's call it two minutes. Okay. Try to find answers as possible, as quick as possible. All right. Uh, good luck. Let the time start now. Great, and we are back. I hope you find all the answers correctly. Let's see the solution. Solution will be here itself. For the first one, it's glucose, second one, free radicals, and third one, preservative. preservation, not preservatives. Now you're thinking, how did we get those answers? We'll discuss them, don't worry. If you got all correct, great, wonderful. You understand this question type. If you didn't, no problem, we'll solve it. Now, before we even proceed to next part, which is pointers, let me show you how we discuss flowcharts should be and how they are. Now, you see, this is a step where we have mentioned. Here we have first question, step two. Here we have no questions though, but this is step three. These are two different steps or let's say information, set of information, but they are concurrent. There's, there are no steps involved. So that's why they ask together. But you see, information is provided in form of image or graphics that's what flowchart is actually it's nothing more than a blank but in a form of graphic you know you got the point right this is what flowchart is now let's start with the point of number one word count yeah what happens in word count is same as blanks as i said previously this kind of question is blank kind of question and hence you have to understand in the instructions how many words are required 
in each blank. See, if you look at here in this question type, let me just show you the answer here. Okay, this is exactly what we needed. So no more than two words. If uh, in case I find an answer, like these are the answers, right? We have two words, no more than two words means you cannot go beyond two. It could be one or two words. All of our answers are correct because of this reason as well, because we have two words, one word, one word. Another reason to be correct, right? Now, what if I, instead of write free radicals, I write the free radicals, incorrect. I know your answer, it is correct, logically speaking, the free radicals, but according to the rules, it's incorrect. You got my point? I suggest you read the instructions which we have seen previously in the slide. You see that they have mentioned here every flowchart starts with instructions. In there, they'll mention how many words are required in the answer. And then they will mention which are the question numbers. And then they'll show you the real question or real flowchart with the blanks. Okay, cool. Let's move ahead. So the next one is headings. What is the meaning of headings and why do we need to understand what headings are? Actually, headings can also be called titles, right? They are required to provide information or they do provide information about the flowchart. So the heading or the title of the flowchart gives information about the flowchart. And with information comes answer. Let me show you here. What do I mean by headings? You see here how a caloric restriction mimetic works. What do you think this is? If you look at it, first comes instructions, then comes num question numbers, and then comes the whole flowchart along with the heading or the title. This is the heading or the title. Using this title, you can guess where the answer lies or at least where the answer starts from. Yes? Okay, good. Now, if you look here, how a caloric restriction mimetic works. You see here, they have mentioned caloric restriction mimetics. That means our answer starts from here itself. I mean, the whole um, flow chart starts from there itself, the, the first sentence itself. You cannot risk it that you don't read from here. Then you go to the next one here, which is the first box of the flow chart. You got my point. And how itself is providing information that they have discussing a process. Yes, cool. The next one is prediction. All the predictions that you have to provide to guess the answer. See how predictions can be amazing. If you look at this part, let me get rid of the passage first and the instructions and we zoom in here so that you can see clearly, okay? This is the heading or title we discussed just now. This is a flowchart or a box in a flowchart or a step. Now the second one is where we need to find an answer. Here it says less blank is produced, right? What less is produced? So produce itself and something less are the words that are helping you to predict here. Something is produced, but less in quantity. That means it must be a thing that is produced or an enzyme or something like that, right? It cannot be a verb that is less, it cannot be a verb for sure, it has to be a noun. So this is called prediction. Same goes here. Cell less damaged by disease, disease because fewer blank are emitted. Again, a noun, but something which is less emitted. That means there's emission of something less. Right, same way you have to guess the answers or at least predict the answers when you're reading the sentence and going to the passage, okay? Good, now look here. For the first answer, we have glucose. As I told you, first one is a noun. Second one, also we discussed noun. We didn't discuss the third one. Look here. Cell focus on blank because food is in short supply. Also a noun. I mean, see, you might be thinking, what is this word? Actually, it is a noun. Or it could be a form of a noun. I mean, type of a noun, but it is a noun. That is preservation. Now look. If you could have guessed it without even, you know, going to the passage, you could have guessed something less is produced, right? That's how you go to the passage and it gets easier for you to, you know, whatever word fits in there, you can put it there. Okay, nice. 
Now next comes sequence, very important and helps you a lot again, like same as prediction. Now what is the sequence? Sequence, when you look at the question and look at the passage, the sequence of the question always matches or is always maintained as compared to the passage. What I mean by maintained is, so they have mentioned about CR mimetic here, if you look carefully here. Less is produced, something which is produced less in quantity. Definitely my answer won't be before this, it has to be after that. So the answer is here, glucose, limiting food intake, calorie restriction minimizes, see, reduces, that means less is produced. You see that where answer is glucose, we found the answer over here. Now, even though there are no blanks here, you see that still this will be definitely provided in the passage after the first one. You can see the proof here and decreases the ATP generation. You see that I, we saw first here glucose the answer. Second is over here in the second bracket or the second item. Then eventually number second, because we have to follow the question number, not the sequence itself here. We have first here, second here, second one going to come here and then third here. So second one must be provided after that. That's my point. Right, second one must be definitely after this. It cannot go before that or in any random order. That's called sequence is being maintained. Right, so answer was free radical, which is provided over here. One possible relate, uh, one possibility is, as I said here, theory one, relates to the ATP making machineries, machineries emission of free radicals, which are thought to contribute to aging and to such age related disease as cancer by damaging cells. See, exactly what they have mentioned here. Cells less damaged by disease because fewer blank are emitted. Now, the last answer must be here as well, below that. See, how did we understand where we can find the answer? We found the first one over here. Definitely our answer is below this. So we found answer here. That means after four to five sentences. When we found the first answer, our next block of information must be after the glucose which is here that is after certain words we look at the next one definitely below this so you got all the answers in the sequence and it is always maintained in this kind of question please remember that so once you find one answer let's say for an example why am i saying this is important let's say i found the i couldn't find the first answer but i found the second answer i found the second answer over here like this area. Should I look for the third answer here on the above, above it, this information? Of course not. I'll go for below this information, not above this. It is logical that if we know the sequence is maintained, we won't be going before the information or above the information, we'll be going next to the information to look for the answer. That's how sequence is helpful. All right, good. Now the next one is called short phrases. Now, this is not a tip actually, this is something that you should be cautious about. If you look at the sentences, actually these are not even sentences completely, these are phrases. This is not a full sentence, less is produced, something less is produced. So it's a very short phrase. You cannot expect a full answer, a full sentence in flowchart. Hence, your idea should be in order to create a um, sequence by yourself or create a story by yourself. CRM mimetic in which something less is produced, where production of something is decreased, that is ATP. Now, this is the reason for ATP to be decreased has two, two theories, theory one and theory two. This is what we understood from the flow jar. See, finding the answer could be easy if we understand. So I think we have discussed earlier in the same video that headings or titles will help you to understand. Same way that you have to create a story using short phrases will also increase the understanding of the, uh, the flowchart. Once you understand the flowchart, it's tremendously easy because you know where the first answer is by predicting and also guessing the next answer will be definitely in the sequence. Now you see how these pointers are helping you. First, you understand the passage using the title. 
plus or you have to understand the answer all in sequence so i have to find this one first you look in the passage you found it you look for this one you found it and you match it according to your prediction it works wonderful keep on going next and that's how you find answer for all flowcharts it's relatively easy kind of question in reading in my opinion compared to many others but still that can happen you know you might get stuck later that can happen don't worry about that okay the last one but very important the reason is people don't pay attention to this spellings why it is important let me show you here they have to be correct that's the importance i know this is a very short uh, information about it but with an example it'll get, cl get clear if you look at this the first one the answer is glucose right instead of glucose if i write here the spelling of glucose as G L U C U S E, it's incorrect. We know that we you know the answer. I know that you know the answer, but examiner won't accept this answer as a correct answer because you have a spelling mistake. Instead of free radicals, if you make a mistake in spelling of radicals, incorrect. See, the good part is all the words mentioned in the passage are to be taken exactly. That means if in passage you find free radicals, you don't need to create synonym of free or radical to write the answer over here. All you have to do is put exactly where you found the answer. You don't have to change the words. So spelling mistakes are rare, but because you might think, oh, it's okay, I found the answer, I can quickly write. No, take care of the spellings as well. I don't want you to work hard in your reading. You worked hard for the whole one month and you go for the exam and you don't, didn't take care of the spellings because of that you got less score. You might not even know what was the reason, right? So at least eliminate the obvious ones, then we can proceed with the next one. This kind of question do come up in reading as well as listening. But today it's a reading module that we are discussing and hence multiple choice question in reading module what is this multiple choice and how different they are or how uh, what kind of structure do they follow in reading is what we're going to see here multiple choice question has one question or let's say statement with some options by some i mean we don't have a set number here we can't say okay these many options might come up you might have more than four or let's say five or seven, and also the answers might increase. Let's see the types first to understand this question type, right? So there are two types, okay? But before these two types, let me show you what happens. So this is the question, and there's an option here. Let's say four options here. So this could be a question or could be a statement. So for example, um, what was the main reason for them to go to the house? That is a question. But if I want to write a statement, I, won't, I will eliminate the question and I'll say the boy wanted to go there as, now this as means I am not finishing the sentence. So please finish the sentence using any of these options. Got it? So sometimes it might be a question or it might be a statement. You have to read it and you have to understand it. Anyway, we'll see examples. So type one is when we have four options and one answer. This is the first type. This is how it looks. This is the first question or statement. In this case, we have a statement. In paragraph one, the writer suggests that companies could consider this thing. Now here we have four options. As I said, one statement. This is type one. Okay. Next one is when we have four plus options and one plus answer. That means at least two answers or more, at least five answer, five options or more. So it could be seven options as we can see in this example and we need two answers. Right, here for this example we have a question. Which two advantages are maintained by the writer of the text? Now you have to look for the two advantages. Okay, I hope I'm clear about this. What are the, these options? What are these types? And the tips or the pointers for these kind of questions are similar. There's no much difference. 
it says we have more answers to provide and yes because you are answering two uh, questions at the same time you'll get two points if you get both of them correct now what if i get one correct in this case then yes you get one point right what if the sequence i write is different still it is correct so for an example answer is c and e and i write an exam e and c then it is still fine so let's say 21st question is and 22nd question is also this one then i can write as c e or c or c or e depending on what you find first so no need to worry about the sequence of the answer if they're asking for two or three options and yes if you mess up with the first answer let's say instead of e you write b and next answer you write correctly you get the score you get the mark for that one particular answer correctly there's no negative marking in this kind of question i hope you understand the scoring in mcqs that is multiple choice questions or multiple choice statements where we have more than two answers and many options of course like five seven in this case we have seven now let's see some true examples along with passage right the first type we'll see the first example this is the first type which we said question or statement and four options and on the left we have passage right i'll give you not more than one and a half minute or maximum two minutes to solve this kind of question and your time starts now All right, we are back and let's see the solution for this. The solution is the first one that is A. Now, how did we find this answer? We'll see in later part, but this was the type one. Now for the type two, I've also set a question, which, are, which do you remember the type two now? Type two is we have to find more than two, more than one answer, that is one plus answer. And we have four plus options could be five options seven options any number okay in this case we have taken the same question which we have taken earlier we have a question here and we have to find two advantages right and we have to find answer for this question by finding two of these seven options we have seven right a b c d e f g so your time starts again and this time you'll also get two minutes. All right. Good luck.
Great, you are back. Let's see the answers themselves. Solution for this one is B, they can predict areas that may cause trouble in future. And G, they are more skilled in personal relationship relationships. Um, we can discuss the answers later. If you have any doubt and if you didn't answer, th didn't find these questions and these options, let's say as answers, don't worry. We are gonna discuss pointers or tips. And after listening to the tips, these will be easy to find. These options will be easy to find and this will be a piece of cake for you. Okay, don't worry about that. If you found, wonderful, that's great already. Now, pointers, as you already discussed, these are the tips. The first one is, sounds very clear. Question first, always read the question first. Then move to the passage. Your task is to read the question first. I have seen plenty of people going for the passage first. When you read the passage, it's huge. It takes almost like one to one and a half minute. And one to one and a half minute is like time wasted actually. And then you move to the question and then you say, oh, I needed this much information, that's it. I read the whole passage, which is huge of I am 200 words maybe. I needed to just read like 50 words based on the question. So please read the question first and then move to the passage. Okay, now if you look here, we shouldn't go here first. We should go here first. That is a question one. In paragraph one, the writer suggests that the company could con uh, consider these. Right. Now your question, once you read this, then move to the passage. Because the question says clearly, all you have to do is suggest what the companies could consider based on the writer in paragraph one. That means we don't have to read this much. It's gone, right? This is not required in this question. You have to read the first one. So let's try to find the answer here. The general, general assumption is that older workers are paid more in spite of rather than because of their productivity. That means older people are paid less, right? Uh, are paid more, I mean, right? That might partly explain why when employers are under pressure to cut costs, they persuade a 55 year old to take early retirement. What did you understand from this? That old people, though they are not that productive, they are costing much to the company. And when it comes to the employer, they try to uh, kick the old people out, honestly, even before their retirement time. Take away seniority, seniority um, based pay skills and older workers may become a much more attractive employment proposition. That means if you take out the seniority, that means that is their senior, that, that's why we have to do something for them as, a ethical, as an ethical issue. Otherwise, kicking them out of the company is a good option, right? But most employers and many workers are uncomfortable with the idea of reducing someone's pay in later life. Although manual workers on peace rates often earn less as they get older. Right, that means manual workers are earning less when they get older, older, right? So retaining the service of older workers may mean employing them in different ways. Now look here, they're trying to say that here earlier, that if we look at the old people, they are not that productive and uh, employers could consider that if they remove the seniority, that is their seniors, we can't do anything. You know, removing them could be a good option or removing the system of paying according to the old age could be a good option. But most employ employers are not comfor uh, comfortable about that idea of reducing someone's pay. Right. So they have to find some other way. But you look at this whole passage. What is it talking about? They're talking about if they can remove the system of people being paid according to the age. And hence the answer A is correct. Abolishing pay schemes that are based on age. Others can be eliminated. We'll see later when we're eliminating. Yeah. So you understand, read the question. Automatically this we don't have to read because we understood only paragraph one is required. Okay. Next one is options. So first we already saw questions. 
then we move to the passage what about the options we didn't look anything about options options please never read them first never read the options first look here let me just eliminate i mean remove other things and look at the question very carefully we have a question here right and we have options here you see which one looks lengthy the question or the options of course the options question is tiny or the statement is tiny options are four if you attach all of them one after another this is like almost two to three sentences so why to anyway you're not going to remember this right anyway you're not going to remember all the options so why to read them first in fact read the question based on the question go to the passage when you come back to the question to answer the question you can look into the passage now i mean the options now it's easy in this time to understand what they mean by this rather than you go to the question read the options this is like wasting another 30 to 40 seconds which we don't have in reading you remember we have 40 questions in reading and we have 60 minutes in reading in this time we have to also transfer the answers to the answer sheet now if we take let's say five minutes to transfer to the answer sheet we are left with 55 minutes let's eliminate two minutes of somewhere resting in between because you're concentrating a lot 53 minutes 53 minutes and 40 questions it's not more than one and a half minute or let's say one minute per question and if you're wasting in reading options 30 seconds or 20 seconds it's scary now to find the answer you don't have much time that's why some people who are not taking precautions like this they are ending up having seven questions left in the end so i suggest never read the options first okay i told you the reason i told you i showed you the consequences good next one as i said first we understood the options now we can eliminate when we come back the obvious options can be eliminated eliminated means removed from our answer obvious answers or the possible answers look here we have a question here and we have options here avoiding we have we already know a is the answer but look how others options can be removed we already discussed what is the passage about avoiding pay that is based on peace rates we are not talking about avoiding pay based on peace rates peace rates came the word peace rate came just here to talk about something else we are not here working on avo avoiding that one eliminated increasing pay for older workers no we never worked on increasing pay in fact it was decreasing right sometime equipping older workers with new skills we are not equipping them we are not providing them new skills we are looking at them in a different way that means we are employing them we are looking at them in a different way because we don't want the seniority to work we just want performance based work we are trying to remove that part of pay based on age you see how elimination can help you find the real answer yes good now last one is paraphrasing see you should expect a lot of paraphrasing in options what is the meaning of paraphrasing you won't find exactly the same words in your passage so once you read the whole passage and you connect with the options chances are you might not find the exact wordings of course you have to understand that what are they talking about and that's where your information concising power comes in same goes for question of course they're not going to provide you exact words of the question in the passage you have to paraphrase it or understand it the concise way you got my problem i think i mean you get what i mean by concising or paraphrasing is that don't expect them to provide exact information in the passage okay good and i think that's the end of the chapter summary completion type of a completion like we have table completion flowchart completion this time we have summary and it is still reading module yeah now what is the summary completion actually summary completion is nothing but that summary of a selection a section of a passage so we have a huge passage passage and paragraphs are two different things so passage equal to many paragraphs combined now one section could be one paragraph or two paragraphs right so that's here we call it one paragraph and summary of this is provided in the form of blanks so let's say i provide here blanks and keep on going have one blank here and then 
So this is summary, hence it will be shorter than the whole paragraph, let's say three sentences. A paragraph of 10 sentences is described. Okay, so this is called summary of a section of the paragraph. Now, in this one thing should be clear. Single paragraph of the passage is taken care in the case of summary. You know, when we have, a, as I said, passage is many paragraphs. In this kind of question, only one paragraph is taken. Actually, this information is important because it's going to help you not to read many paragraphs. You just have to find which one they're talking about. Eventually, you will find the information or you will not go beyond that. Okay, this is actually easy kind of question once you find which paragraph you have to read. But without knowing if it is just single paragraph, you will not be doing this. So remember, summary completion equal to one single or just a single paragraph has to be taken care. Right. Now look, we have a list of paragraphs, paragraph one, paragraph two. This is one, this is two here. And this whole is called passage. Now we have a summary which says the importance of language. What, where do you think you'll find the answers? Well, we're going to see later, but this is how the question looks like in summary completion. There will be here instruction. We'll see them later as well. Now here, this part from this part will either respond to the part one or part two of the passage could be paragraph one or paragraph two. Your task is to first figure out which paragraph and then find answer for these blanks. You see here, one, two, three, and four when the question is here. This is your task, not all the complete task you have to do in passage or passage completion. I mean to say uh, summary completion. Where you have to look into the passage, find the paragraph, look back and find the answers. How we'll see later before that comes types. There are two types here. Okay. And the two types are when we have summary completion without a list of words and summary completion with list of words or phrases. Now, what is this without list with list? I know this is getting confusing. Showing an example will get it clear. Let's look at the first one. Summary completion without list of words or phrases. You see here, we don't have any box which is providing us as options, option A, B, C, or D. You know, you have to choose among of out of these options and provide answers here. Of course, you have to read here the passage. There is no such box with words or passages. Hence, this is called question type summary completion without a passage. I mean, without a, a box which has phrases or words. No such thing. This type, I mean, the second type with list of words or phrases will look like this. We have questions one, two, three, four, and you have to fill the answers as options. We have options here, isn't it? Out of these options, after you read the passage, understand the question, you write out of these options. Actually, this is helpful, right? So this is what happens sometime in the uh, summary completion. Previous one was without any boxes. It is possible. Now let's see an example of just one type with boxes. I think it's the same thing. Now the first thing you have to notice here is, see we have mentioned here on the top question one to four you have to finish and there's the heading of the summary and you have to find answer out of these options. Paragraph or passage is here. Choose any of these paragraph where they're talking about it. We're going to see the answers later. You shouldn't take more than three minutes because this is easy kind of question and your time starts now.
We are back. Let's see what are the answers for these questions. The first one is E. You can verify in your notebook. That is material. Second one is G, which is fundamental. Third one is B, which is complex. And fourth one is F, which is easy. So if you got these answers, wonderful, great. If not, no worries. We'll see how to solve this kind of question. Maybe that will help you to find the answers easily. So let me just show you the answers in a bigger way view so that you know you are not missing the answers. First again, first one is E, second one is G, third one is B, and fourth one is S. Clear about this? I hope. Good. Now look, let's look at the pointers. I mean the tips or the tricks which will help you to find the answers easily. Okay. The first one is instructions are important. In our case, we have options. Hence, you might see what kind of answers you should provide. Should it be option A, B, C, or should it be word count? Now, see, look here. We have mentioned complete the summary using the list of words A to G. Now, let's say this is the first question, second one, third one, and fourth one. If I provide answer, answer let call, let's call is material. Material is the first answer. I cannot provide this as answer. I have to be, I have to read the instruction to see are they asking for options or are they asking as words? They are asking for options. So we should only write here E. You understand what I mean by instructions? You should know what is expected in the answer from the options or their words. Clear summary. I mean, the instructions which are mentioned here before the question starts here is important. These are called instructions and you should read them to know what to write. Okay, good. Second one is single paragraph is important, not two or three. Right now, look, they will contain all the answers for sure. We will see how they contain all the answers. Look here, we have starting and ending here. If we connect the first sentence, the wheel is one invention that has had a major impact on something. Now, I'm not asking you to find the answer first. I'm asking you to find where the answer is taken from. Is it paragraph one or paragraph two? Now, if you look here, we have to look for word wheel, which is a kind of a keyword. The wheel may have transformed means may have major impact on our materialistic existence on some aspect of life, which is definitely material aspect. Got it. Now, based on this, you guessed it. Okay, this is the paragraph, which is, you know, is a limelight for us, which is important. Hence, we won't be going to any other paragraph. We will be fixing our eye on this paragraph only. That is paragraph one. You, you won't find the, even the last answer in the last paragraph, only paragraph one. Okay, good. So this is one thing you should always see that first read the first, uh, first sentence or first line of your question. Go back to the paragraphs or the passage, one the single passage and read which paragraph is, you know, mentioning or giving information about it and choose it as your core answer. Now you can match with the blanks and find the answer. Okay, good. Moreover, you should always predict the answers. Look here, we have expanded, we have removed the option. If you look here, the wheel is one invention that had has had a major impact on death aspect of life. Can it be admire aspect? I don't think so. Complex aspect? Maybe, but doesn't sound like that. An easy aspect? Not, there's not an aspect actually, right? It could be a difficult aspect or maybe not because not an aspect which we can expect here. We can expect an original aspect, material or fundamental kind of. So, see, predicting will help you to look for the answer, not just from options, something which is a major impact and an aspect of life. Right, so you, you will look for the answer which is about the major impact and the aspect of life connected to wheel. Second one, but no impact have, has been as blank as that of language. That means where when you see as blank as that of a language, that means there is a comparison being done. So something is being compared. See, for comparison, we have the words then 
as blank as something or more than that or equally you know here they are saying no impact ha has been done as that of language that means language has more so you look for more word hence understanding the sentence and expecting something could be the best way to find the answer in blank kind of options blank kind of question and this is actually a blank kind of question though the whole paragraph is explained in short in one uh, summary but still if you look carefully these are just blanks right sentence one blank one sentence two blank two got my point and here you should predict based on the blanks now paraphrasing is important it means you have to expect paraphrasing not just paraphrasing in fact next level of paraphrasing this whole paragraph is being shortened and provided in the form of blanks over here that means the quantity or the quality of being concising the information must be high i mean it's very difficult then to understand the whole passage but the meaning won't be changed they might change the words they might change this uh, i mean no, they might change the aspect in a way a little bit uh, of the you know collection of words but trust me they won't change the meaning so what won't change is meaning they won't change the sequence no chance no change in sequence the only thing they can change is you know words here and there but still first answer will appear first which we see here second answer will appear second which might be somewhere later it will come after that so paraphrasing will also help in that part okay if you are not a big book reader i mean anything you don't read books much this won't this will be a little bit difficult because understanding and paraphrasing or concising is a thing or is a skill that you have to develop to understand this kind of question and most of the questions in reading so please try to read as much as possible to concise or you paraphrase the thing that means you make it short or make it differently Okay, suggested is you read books. Sentence completion, which is the last question type that we have to understand in reading module. You must be saying, oh, that's a long journey, right? In reading module, I understand there are around eight to nine types of questions and we have to understand them all because we can't take a risk, you know, that what if this question types, uh, this question type comes up in exam, we have to understand all of them. Now in this question type, what you gonna what gonna happen? Which is sentence completion, by the way. You will be looking at a single sentence with a blank. Before this, we have seen table completion, form completion, that is a flowchart completion, or we have seen a summary completion. None of them had single sentence and non-related single sentences with a blank. See here, we have a question number thirty-nine and forty. The dance outside the hive points in the direction of the blank. So this is one question itself or one blank itself. It is not connected to the next blank. And as I said, single sentence, no connection is this type, sentence completion. The difference between this question type, that is sentence completion, and the summary completion is, in the summary completion, we have a whole summary where we have blanks in between you know like this however in this question type all we have is a blank in the middle or the end of the single sentence i hope you understand the difference good in fact an example will help to make things easier look at this passage on the left and the question on the right your task is to find the answer for question number 34 or 39 and 40 using the passage on the left in exam you might not just find two to three questions you'll be you'll be having at least five to seven questions or blanks in this question type this is just for us to know how they this question type works and secondly just for practice we only have two because we only have two blanks i'll not give you more than two minutes and your time starts now
Great. And we are back. Now let's see the answers as well, because you've done, you've written in your, uh, in your notebook or anywhere in your notepad. The first one is food source. Source is in bracket. That means if you mention food, it's fine as well. Or if you mention food source, it's fine. Okay. Number 40th is sun. These are the two answers, 39 and 40. Okay. We'll see how we found the solution, how we found the answer. But first, let's talk about the pointers or the tips and the tricks which can help you to find the answer easily. Eventually, we'll talk about the answers. The first one is definitely the instructions. We have been repeating it 10 times or maybe more than that. The reason is without these, the instructions, you might not understand that we have number of words which are required. If in case I found the answer and I wrote incorrect number of words, I'm totally incorrect in this part. I mean, in the answer, though I know where I found the answer, though I know it's correct, but examiner can't do anything in that case because you mentioned an incorrect answer. Now, if you look at this one, the dance outside the hive points in the direction of the answer is here, food source. The outside dance was fairly easy to decode. The straight position of the dance pointed directly to the food source. We have mentioned, or let's say the instruction are mentioned no more than two words. And here you mention, because they have mentioned the again, of the, again, the food source. See, this one is incorrect for a reason, because it's not three words anymore. It's I mean, it's not two words, it's three words. So totally incorrect. What if we just write food? It's correct because they have mentioned no more than two words. They have not mentioned exactly two words, right? If you write one word or two words, totally fine with it. Okay, good. The second one is the verb method. We have explained this. We need verb method to remember the blanks or to remember the statement which contains the blank. Why do we need this? I think we have explained earlier that when we have a reading question type or reading exam, the biggest time waster actually is moving from one page to another page. So this is one page to another page. What we generally do is we have a question on another page and the passage on another page. Like we see here, this, these are the questions right below 30, 39 and 40. And here we have passage. Now we have provided this information or you have taken this information on a screen. There's a split in the screen. Hence you can look at it directly. But in exam, what's going to happen is the questions will be on page, let's say three and the passage is on page two. What can you do in this case? You're going to read the question and jump to the passage immediately and try to find the answer. You might remember some part of the blank and try to connect with the answer, but you're not sure yet because you don't remember the statement. You go back to the question and try to find the, find the blank again or try to understand the blank and again go back to the passage. Again, read that part. You read things twice or thrice uselessly. What if you could remember the blank and just understand it clearly by the method called verb method and go once in the passage and find the answer and come back. Sounds fun, right? You save 30 to 40 seconds per question. If 30 to 40 seconds are saved, you can imagine what's going to happen in the case of almost 40 questions. How much time will you save? A lot. And that's why I've seen people following this method have finished their exam in 35 minutes, even 40 minutes rather than 60 minutes. Okay, so let's see what this method does and how do we solve it. So eliminating the things which are not required here and even the instructions, let's zoom in here. The dance outside the hive points in the direction of the blank. Verb method says that you have to figure out in the sentence what is the verb. For our sentence, that is 39th points is the verb. True. You have to create a sentence by yourself 
what points towards what right by understanding or creating these questions you will be able to remember by answering these questions to yourself you have to just remember the word points so the dance outside the hive points in the direction of something what points towards what you have to remember just this much you go back to the passage you look for something points towards something that means the dance outside the hive points towards the direction of something looking at the next one the angle of the dance from the vertical shows the angle of the floor of the foot from the blank you see shows is the verb here which we have to take care what shows what or in what angle so the angle of the dance from the vertical is one subject in a kind of structure you know this is a whole subject and we have the verb and then we have the object subject shows the object the angle of the dance from the vertical shows the angle of the foot from the blank see how easy it gets i know there's so much to read from this part but if you understand that we are creating groups now one group is the subject that is before the verb second group is the object that is after the verb and you just create question what shows what done and you remember the whole sentence or the statement you don't have to come back to the blank and compare with the passage hectic process time wasting in fact remember the blank using verb method go back to the passage just once find the answer mention it here done so easy right and you save a lot of time cool now another one which is important is predict not just making it short or making remembering the sentence but prediction is also required what is the meaning of prediction i'll show you let's look at the example 39 the dance outside the hive in the direction of the blank now this is a direction of something that means it has to be a noun it has to be a, a thing that you are pointing in the direction of that means that the dance outside the hive that means something is going on outside the hive of the bees is pointing in the direction of the something not somewhere but something that means you get the answer you, now you predicted the answer it has to be something again second second one the angle of the dance from the vertical shows the angle of the foot from the blank so you have to search for the angle of the foot from something again it is a noun sometime answer is definitely a verb sometime answer is definitely an adjective by the way if you are not familiar of these these are called parts of speech then you should go and watch the first video of the series of grammar which is grammar for ielts you will get to understand what are these things i'm talking about very important stuff and things will get easier for you not just in ielts but in english as well for ielts for sure they are created keeping ielts in mind but even if you don't know or learn english good point to start by using the parts of speech okay good now the first and last what is the meaning of this first and last first blank and the last blank are important in this case in the case when we have provided example we don't have more than two but what if we had 25 to 30 now we have six 25 26 27 28 29 and 30 what if we found the first answer and the last answer why do we need to do that if you find the first answer over here let's say i'm just guessing okay i'm just creating a situation this is where you found the 25th answer and this is where you found the 20 or 30th answer that means all of your answers lie between this that is 25 and 30 sequence is always maintained so if you found the 30th answer here the 29th cannot be beyond it it's not possible if you found the 25th answer here in this area your 26th answer cannot be here above it it must be below it so if there are many blanks find the first and the last one that means you know which area to follow 
clear because sequence is maintained. So this method could help you save time. All right, good. Last one, but not the least, because this is a tiny mistake people make that is grammar and spelling. Grammar, because you can see grammatically it has to be correct. Let me give you a guess or let's, let me give you another point. The dance outside the hive points in the direction of the easy. If I provide the word easy here, I thought easy is the correct answer, then it doesn't make any sense grammatically. It's incorrect. What direction of easy, what? Easy something. So easy is incorrect. And because of this, I could guess that, hmm, I don't, I think I have to search again. So your answer should be grammatically correct. Second, even if I find the answer as food source, and instead of food source, though food is only correct answer, you can also add source. If I write source spelling as this, just this, no E, incorrect. Spelling mistake is also an, a, concern, is a concern for us. It will be considered zero point. So in this case, answer is sun, S-U-N, and you write S-O-N. They know, the examiner who's checking your paper, they know that, you know, you're right. You know answer is sun, but you made a mistake in the spelling. Sorry, we cannot provide you the answer. So you lose one mark. That is for one question. That is, this is gone then. Please verify your spellings and grammar helps us. That is the grammatically, if the sentence is correct, it's good. If not, it helps us that this cannot be the answer. We have to go back and look for the answer in the passage again. Clear? I hope so. And with that, we end the chapter. We can understand the structure and criteria for writing module. Watch out, this video is really important if you're understanding or if you are trying to understand writing module for the first time. This will provide you kind of an introduction plus criteria which most people miss to understand or try not to even understand or they don't even know if they exist. All right, so this video is gonna provide you everything you need. The first thing is the structure. By structure, I mean what kind of question will be asked, how many questions will be there, and many other things, you know, that are important structure-wise, right? Let's get into it. So, it will be third in the module. Now, third in the modules means we have listening, reading, writing, and speaking. It will always be third, right? but it will be last on the same day. Again, we have listening, reading, writing, and speaking. So these exams are taken on a single day, and this will be taken on another day. My point of being third means on the same day, but it will be, in the la it will be last on the same day. Now, why is this information important? Because Listening test takes around 30 to 40 minutes. Reading test takes around 60 minutes, not around exactly. And if you take the break, like five more minutes, 65 minutes. Already you have passed around 100 minutes. That's around one and a half hour or more. And then comes writing. By this time, your energy is already over or you're exhausted, let's say. Your concentration is down. You are feeling uncomfortable kind you know or maybe you're feeling like you can't think so that's what i mean writing in here at this moment gonna be a little bit difficult so watch out try to understand that you have to create stamina of concentrating for a longer time this can be done before exam by practicing what i mean by practicing is not just practicing kind of questions but doing three of the modules in one go and sitting at one place for more than one, two and a half hours. So that will be two hours and 45 minutes test, you know, right? The last hour will be writing. And the worst part is, it's the most difficult part. Most people can't score well in this part. The average score in writing, people who are getting seven bands, is 6.5 in writing. If you don't understand what I mean by band here, please watch the introductory video of IELTS. 6.5 bands a band is not a good score if you're planning to get 8 or 7.5 this can hinder you know your target of that band the reason it is difficult uh, i mean the reasons are plenty i would say the first one is 
let's say our schooling the school actually can is considered the reason for your bad writing skills you know we are told that all right when you start writing paragraphs write according to the size so we write okay this is way too long half page is gone we should stop it and again half page paragraphs you know we don't understand the meaning of paragraphs secondly we don't get marks for the structure or the beauty of writing we just get marks because we wrote correct english that's it moreover some people just you know memorize essays even and they write in school that is the problem second thing is we are not writing every day we are just speaking english so that is also one problem and the last for the people who even know both of these again practice is not there because we tend not to understand that this will be useful right okay so you understand why it is most difficult three reasons and you have to you can't just if i mean you can't change anything in your schooling or writing you can change something in your practice we'll see how we're going to do that okay now next one is number of tasks there are two different tasks which will be provided in exam and these are report if you're writing for academic and re report will be based on a graphic i mean you will be provided some gra one graphic or two graphics and you have to write a report what kind of report how much you have to write don't worry about that it is coming soon if you are writing for general training that means if you are planning to work somewhere or go for immigration you have to write a letter so this is for people who are planning to study you don't understand what is the meaning of academic or general training again please watch the introductory video on our files in the same um, course you will get the information right so in this you have to write a report and here we have to write a letter for general training for task 2 there's no difference it will be essay for both single essay for academic and general training question will be same so these are the tasks you have to understand in writing moreover let's see the differences and see i know why am i providing differences i'm not providing direct information i remember when we were in school we used to understand things better when we used to have this table difference between x y z and a b c some kind of phenomena it was easier for us to remember and understand oh these are the two different things that we have to, you know two things for which we have to understand the difference so here as well i try to form use that technique and try to help you by un for understanding the task by showing the differences yeah so here we have task 1 and task 2 so the first thing is time we'll be getting 20 minutes for task 1 and 40 minutes for task 2 let me make it clear there's nothing like you have to follow this rule exactly that what they have told this is recommended time because you will be given a question paper and answer sheets and you have 60 minutes you have as much as time you require for any task that means it's up to you which task you want to go for first how much time you want to take this is recommended time you got it you'll be getting a question paper in which you will be having task 1 and task 2 you'll be getting two answer sheets answer sheet for task 1 and task 2 but they never say that okay start with task 1 or task 2 it's up to you this is just recommended time remember total is 60 minutes for sure second is number of words number of words are very strict actually in ielts you cannot go below 150 in task 1 and cannot go below 250 in task 2 that is number of words okay if you write 149 words even incorrect you will get a penalty for that if you write 249 even incorrect i suggest you write more than 150 i mean at least 151 to any number higher now see there is no set upper limit no one says you cannot write 200 words in task 1 what i mean is but if you write 200 words here i don't think you'll get time to write properly in task 2 so the recommended number is 170 175 maximum if somebody says that there's a limit for you know there's upper limit for writing number of words then they are incorrect they don't know this part definitely there is no upper limit but it is recommended to write 170 to 175 same goes for task 2 270 to 275 will definitely do the task 
you don't need to write 300 to 400 words. If you have time, there's nothing wrong in that, okay? It's fine. But you cannot go below 250. All right? These are the criteria or the things that you have to take care in number of words in task one as well as task two. Now, types, I think we have seen this already that you have to write a report and letter. Now, let's see if you can recognize what was report for? General training. No, reports were for academic. Letters were for general training. So people who are planning to go abroad for work, they will be writing letter and people who are planning to go for education or any kind of study, they have to write a report. So this is related to study. Okay, remember this part. And essay will be same for both of them. Last but not the least is scoring. Okay, this is like the weightage out of the 100%, 40% will be um, accounted for in task one in the whole writing test and 60% will be for task two. So in case if you couldn't write task one at all and you wrote task two completely, you'll get score out of 60%. That means nine out of nine bands, you will be given 60% of nine band and based on that, how you write, you'll get a score. You got my point. So let's say you wrote task two, that means nine bands, 60% of nine bands. If you wrote correctly, you'll get the full 60% of nine bands. If you wrote task one correctly, you'll get 40% of nine bands. You got my point, what I mean. And if you wrote both correctly, you'll get full bands. That's very rare though. Getting nine in writing is really difficult, okay? All right, moving ahead, we have some of the no-nos or you can't do these things. These are the cautions, you know, troubles in writing. Watch out for these things, important, because if you know what not to do, what is left is what to do, okay? So the first thing is you cannot go off topic. Your response cannot be off topic. So what I mean by is you have a question, right? Question asks about global warming and you talk about earth preservation, not a good idea because they ask about global warming, not preservation. That's called going off topic. You cannot do that, you'll get deduction for that. I know this is an English test, but they have asked you a question. And if you write off topic, that means you don't know what the question means. That means you don't know English indirectly, right? You got the point. Next one is under length. We have discussed this in detail when we were discussing the task. So if you remember for task one, how many words are there? 150 minimum for task two. 250 minimum that means we have to write more than 150 here more than 250 if you write below that you'll be considered as under length you cannot do that at least these are the technical mistakes you can ignore right then we have bullet points um, you must some of you must be asking can I write essays like this or the letters you know in points my first sentence my second sentence my third sentence and fourth no, this was working in your school, not in essays or letters and not in IELTS at all. If you write this way, you'll definitely not get the score that you wanted. All right, so don't write any bullet points or numbering, you know, for one, two, like you do in Microsoft Word. You cannot. You have to write in form of paragraphs. Okay, good. The last one is you cannot have a memorized answer or you cannot copy from anywhere from you in the question paper or anywhere you cannot have any of these they are checked for plagiarism that is checking if you have copied from somewhere and if you try to memorize online and you just you know copy paste it somewhere in the answer that will be considered incorrect or you will get penalty for that all right so these are the no no things that you have to take care you shouldn't ever do these things. I know other things are also there like criteria, but these things at least you can, you know, just by knowing you will take care of them. So I had to mention these things. Now comes the answer sheet. You should know what kind of answer sheet you'll be given. Is it blank? Has it lines? Or is it, you know, just the boxes or whatever it is? You should know how it looks like. And this is how it looks like. For task one, this is the page one. So on the top, it'll be mentioned task one and you'll be given a little bit less space in this page and something to write for the examiner, not by you. 
okay um, i mean not for you the pe person who is checking your test cool so you have to write only this part in exam you won't get this sample because i've got it from website official website you will not get the sample only i got the sample second one is the second page here also you won't get the sample and also you cannot write below this page but you get extra space on the top now these things here are for official use only like T A C C L R G R A off topic memorize which we have already discussed you don't have to worry about this now but this information is important in the coming slides we're going to see what these things are some of you are thinking are they enough for us to write 250 pages or i mean 150 words or 250 words no they're not enough you can ask for extra pages in that you might not get this thing you know ex exactly mentioned task on task two you get blank pages i mean with lines of course not with not with this thing so that is also that one thing you don't need to worry about that you can ask for extra sheets okay now let's check for task two in task two you will get similar sheet don't worry about the color it's just you know website provided same color sheet you will get white earlier was also white you'll be meant it will be mentioned here task two no sample written and this will always be there same goes for tip page two no sample written and here it will be tr cc lr and gra if you notice there's not much difference from previous one now what i mean by not much difference is this one will be different that's it that is the first one earlier it was ta you see that ta so earlier first thing is ta now this thing has become tr that's it now what is this ta and what is this tr we're gonna see soon and this is what most people try generally ignore or don't take care they say oh this is office use only why do we care you should because this is how they test your paper so let's say you play a game right and you don't know how to win the game we don't know the rules if you don't know really the rules there's no way you can win okay so let's see that first criteria is a thing that helps you to understand how they check your paper by the way, the singular of criteria is criterion. So this is already a plural. We don't need to say criterias. Okay, remember that. Therefore, first one is task achievement or task response. Now you see what I mean by this TA and TR. There's something you saw below the answer sheet. These are the things TA and TR. Why do we have two? Why not one? You know this is the first criteria criterion so in that case i'll explain in task one you're asked to do based on the question that means you don't you can't go beyond that you cannot think of your own things however in task two you're asked to give your pure rep response that means everyone's response will be different with an example it will get clear let's say i asked you um can you go down the same building and get me this book, particular book? So I'll ask you for book X, Y, Z. And if I ask 10 people, you know, in a group, they will get me book X, Y, Z. But if I ask in the same group, can you please surprise me with your favorite book? Do you think they're going to provide me with the same book X, Y, Z? Chances are rare. Same goes here. They'll bring something different and you know, according to their choice. In task two, you are asked question for which you have to answer based on your response. What do you think about this kind of question? In task one, you'll be asked to write something which is already mentioned. You just have to elaborate. That's why it's called task achievement. And here it's called task response. Now, what is covered in this task achievement and response? First thing, the technical part, 150 words in task one and 250 words in task two. That is for sure you have to take care counts in task achievement and response second thing based on the question if your points are really making sense you know for the question like i said if it is about global warming and you're writing points about global warming plus how good these points are so not just the points 
uh, or arguments but the effectiveness you know how good these points are matters a lot so got my point you understand the question right according to the question plus your response is good or what they ask for that is achievement is good that's it second thing number of words these two things are tested in task achievement or task response cool if you didn't understand you can watch it again probably you'll understand i tried my best to make it as simple as possible now second one lexical resource now we call it a different way we call it vocabulary this is called a lexical resource i'll tell you why they have not chosen vocabulary itself because there are three different things that you have to take care in lexical resource number one is the quality of the words you might not have heard what is the quality of a word in ielts we have bands right that means your score comes in between one band to nine bands highest is nine and you are targeting for seven to eight anything between that or 8.5 right but in english it is created based on cefr c-e-f-r which means common european framework as a reference for languages so all european languages have this a1 a2 b1 b2 and c1 and c2 i mean these are the last total six structure or let's say levels they have in any language which is created in europe all the words in english are categorized between a1 a2 b1 b2 and c1 c2 that means here is basic intermediate and advanced so if you use most of the words which are c1 c2 definitely you will get higher bands because they respond to some kind of band so if this is 8.5 to 9 or 8 8.59 this talk c1 c2 is for this purpose how we how do we know this you know word is c1 c2 well for that there are two options either you go for the vocabulary course and understand it you know which we have provided or you can go to a website called cambridge dictionary okay in this dictionary what you will get is if you search a word okay on the top there will be a search bar click on the search bar and you will get something like a box empty box and in here you can type the word itself right and when you see in the search result near the meaning on the left you will get either a1 a2 b1 whatever it is i mean out of, out of the six levels you will get the word meaning or the word quality there you can get the word quality now for you i have done a research and i've got 1200 words which are most important and they are b2 c1 and c2 so 400 each and we are done that means we will be, it'll be enough for us to understand these many words and i'm going to link um the word list below so that you can see and you can understand some of the words and uh, these are the most important words most commonly used words in IELTS essays and how did i find it because i read many essays from cambridge or oxford or you know all these uh, official websites okay 1200 words would be more than enough for you good second thing apart from quality we have is appropriateness what i mean by appropriateness is let me just clear this up so that we can write stuff here the first one so first one was quality second one is appropriateness what is this appropriateness being appropriate means using the correct word at correct location or correct situation let's say for an example you are about to have an accident but you are saved what word would you use when you come out of that incident you will say i feel good right i'm fine now instead of this word what if you use the word i'm relieved i'm feeling relieved or i'm feeling blessed you see when you use the exact word you feel like oh this is much better than good that's what i mean using appropriate words and the last one is synonyms 
What happens in synonyms is you cannot use a word and keep repeating it. Let's say in an essay you have to use a word good or let's say positive word happy. We have used good enough word already. Happy has many meanings. Pleasant, delightful, you know, and um, satisfied or many words you have for happy. So instead of using just one happy as a word, you can use the synonyms. That will show that you do know many words. So there are three things in lexical resource, quality, appropriateness, and synonyms. And I told you how you can find the list of quality words below. That might help you. Okay. All right. Now comes grammatical range and accuracy. That is GRA. Let me explain first the accuracy part, the, back, the last part. When I write my name R X Y Z and suddenly in your brain you know things start going wrong like mm, there's something wrong with the sentence we know it cannot be is I mean it cannot be R it must be is so that's called accuracy accuracy means your sentence should be correct grammatically that's what we call accuracy now when the first condition is being fulfilled when the sentence is correct grammatically or accurate grammatically they go to the range range means what kind of level you're using in grammar are you using just simple sentences like earlier one is simple sentence or you're using complex sentences compound sentences active passive direct indirect using all the tenses plenty of the things are going through you know and if you are confused about this don't worry we have a whole series on grammar that will cover everything but for now please understand you have to have a range in your gram grammar that means if you use just simple sentences not many connectors not many conjunctions you're gonna have trouble they will consider your grammar as low okay and accuracy is must because it has to be correct first then you go to the range you got my point and the last but not the least this is really very important which most of us either don't know even if we do know then we try to ignore it that is coherence and cohesion now what happens in coherence is we tend to write sentences like you know these are the sentences when we write we never think of the connection between sentences we think of i have to provide information we always think of information we never think how this information can be connected properly right that is what i mean by co coherence when your sentences are connected let me make it clear with an example of course so when i say this is the most dangerous desert of all and the most poisonous snakes are also found in this desert apart from snakes we can also find spiders which could kill a person in a single bite now you see what have i done in this thing you you can notice that i talked about desert first as the theme then i talk take the word desert in this desert you can find snakes and in later sentence i use the word snake not just snakes but you can find spiders you see that how connectivity is flowing how you know theme is flowing we have seen a desert in the desert you can find snakes not just snakes you can find spiders what if i just talk randomly about deserts and snakes and spiders won't make any sense so my logic says or my simple template says that we have subject verb and object okay next sentence in next sentence your object should become the new subject so this is our o1 which is our s1 now then we have a verb and we have object 2 this object 2 can become our subject 2 which is our object 2 from previously then we have verb then we have object 3 what i mean by this you don't have to change your sentence instantly but let's say you write two sentences about sentences about this object and then you change it to a new subject i mean the from the object itself you got my point it has to be like this you got what coherence is here good 
Cohesion actually is connecting sentences or paragraphs using various other words, other words, not the words from the sentence. For an example, there's a restaurant open close to my house. They are new in the town and they want to make it famous. They're throwing a party. This is again information after information. What I need or anyone needs is connectivity. So I can rewrite it using cohesion. There's a restaurant open close to my house recently. And the, as they want to be famous, they're throwing a party. See that as and these words are connecting one idea with another idea. This is called cohesion. And using these words, you can also connect paragraphs. But well, how are you going to connect paragraphs? We're going to see in the video of paragraphs. Don't worry about that. For now, understand what is the difference between co cohesion and coherence. If you did, good. If not, you can write in the comments or you can write a mail to me about this. I'm going to explain in detail. Okay. And that will be the end of the chapter. I know there were not many slides, but still there was so much to understand, ranging from four different criteria here and too many no-nos, what not to do. We have task, we have structure of writing. So if you didn't understand, I suggest you this time you take notes and you start from the beginning of the video. And if still you didn't understand, I would suggest you write in the comments as well as write a mail to me so that I can reply on that and I can help you. Okay. I hope you understood something and I wish you a great time. Bye-bye. A method to plan your writing. By writing, I mean both task one and task two. Remember, this planning method is for only writing module. Okay, let's begin then. Why planning? Let me make one thing clear. You cannot afford to miss planning. You're thinking, well, maybe planning will take longer time. I might, you know, waste time in like five to seven seconds, a minutes in this. Why am I doing it? I have already 60 minutes to write both tasks. That's very true. But if you don't plan properly, this time is definitely not enough to write both the essays properly. That means what you can do, you won't be able to do properly. Now, secondly, the reason why you should plan is our thinking first of all do you believe in multitasking i know some of you might be thinking yeah i do you know i multitask every day and you might be saying you know i do but please don't now the reason you are thinking um, i do multitasking is i can eat and watch movie together right you can say that or watch tv together at the same time think about it is it really multitasking? I'm going to ask you to just watch TV or watch a movie without looking down ever in your food plate. Can you do that? Well, it's very difficult, right? You have to practice a lot. Secondly, you just eat. Don't look up and watch a TV. Not possible. The thing is, we have senses. That is to listen, to watch. That means to see. All these senses are working together. You're enjoying all of them together. Hence, you feel as if you're doing things together. All you're doing is quick switching. What is the meaning of quick switching? You are watching a TV or a TV series or a movie and instantly you look down, have your bite and look up. You are doing quick switching in everything. You cannot do multitasking. There's no way you can have your brain at one thing and then instant, at the same time other thing. Instantly you can change it. So don't believe in multitasking and that's what is the base of planning. See, when you're writing your letter or your essay, which we have discussed in earlier part that in task two, you get an essay. Let's take an example of an essay. And you start writing, you saw the question and you started writing the answer. What's gonna happen? You start writing and suddenly in the middle you realize, oh, I forgot to mention that point or this point. This is when you do without planning. That means you are you doing multitasking now. According to you, you are thinking as well as writing at the same time. 
No, you're not doing at the same time. What you're doing right now is writing and suddenly you stop. So you stop your writing part and then you move on to thinking. This is going to create trouble for you. And you see why multitasking is not possible and why we need a planning method in which you plan everything in prior and then write. So please never just start writing instantly. You got to understand that. Good. Now let's see what happens in writing. In writing, you have task one. Just a short revision for that. Quick revision. And task two. In task one, it depends on general training and academic. And for task two, it's the same thing. In here, you get a letter. And here you get a report. For both, it's 150 words minimum that means you have to write more than 150 words here you have to write 250 words and here you have to write an essay you see writing these many words is not that easy without any planning you cannot just start scribbling and it's definitely not on a complex idea even on a simple idea if you start writing you might miss some kind of point let's say these are the major points you have to include and you missed one of them definitely not a good idea so remember that there's a method for that and that method is called power. I'm not talking about, you know, energy or power. This is this created method called power. And here P stands for planning. You're going to see all of them five in detail. What happens in planning is what you do is you look at a question first. So this is a question here, right? Actually, this is a statement question is here. Your task in planning is to read the question, understand the question type from here and choose a side or choose whatever you need to choose according to the question, side or advantage or disadvantage, whatever it is. In this example, let's see how we do the planning phase. The first one out of the whole method. A person's worth nowadays seem to be, seems to be judged according to the social status and material possessions. Old-fashioned values such as honor, kindness, and trust no longer seem important. To what extent do you agree or disagree with this opinion? I say I disagree. Okay. In planning, you choose your side. And I suggest you not choose emotionally. What I mean by emotionally? See, as soon as we hear a question about emotions or kids or, you know, um, obesity, we become emotional. And we choose side accordingly. I suggest you not do that. You choose your side rationally. Then are not checking your ethics. What they're checking is how good you can write in English. If you have more points towards agreement, let's say towards agreement, choose that side. Or if you have more points on disagreement, please choose that side. Don't become ethical or emotional. Be rational. You have to look your points into regard you know your bands into regard rather than your ethics or your emotions that's what we do in planning secondly we underline the important words so we are judged social status material possessions and it's not other days it's nowadays that means this is present tense that means we are as it will be in present tense only or maybe in past because we have old-fashioned old fashioned values, which is honor, kindness, trust, and they're not important. These are the things we have to take care. We have to think of vocabulary on these. We have to think of sentences on these. What do we know of these words? That's it. That's what happens in planning. I hope you understood this part. Second phase would be organizing. What happens in organizing? Well, let's take the same question. Earlier, we understood what part we are taking. Let's say in my case, I'm taking disagree. Now, in organizing, you're supposed to create boxes. These boxes are going to be like first is introduction, then we have conclusion. These boxes are like paragraphs. And one paragraph equal to one particular idea. So I'm going to provide here the reason to disagree. So my reason one, my reason two, or let's say a counter reason as well. So reason three but encounter that is for agreement this is the way of we write agreement or disagreement don't worry we're going to see how to write this kind of question later but for now i'm going to write in two to three words what is reason one what is reason two you know you see what is happening here in exam we can do this before writing 
so that we in exam directly we can start writing we don't have to sit in the middle of the paper and suddenly stop and think of reason one what was the reason one because we wrote it in the rough that is in the question paper oh this is the reason one this is the reason two we don't have to mess up the sequence either now we know the sequence good this is what we do in organizing see organizing phase won't work until you understand planning in our planning we understood that we have to disagree using a rational method not emotional or anything ethical but a rational method based on the disagreement we have points now right i'm not saying you always disagree it's up to you well you can agree but based on planning you do you do organizing and based on this organization you start writing the writing phase is something which has nothing to explain you just start writing but take care of few things if you're writing pen and paper which i highly recommend take care of your handwriting okay mine is hor horrible i hope you get it better it doesn't have to be calligraphy it doesn't have to be fancy it has to be just legible legible i mean is you can read it okay it doesn't have to be great it has to be readable or legible clear good once you finish your writing you go into evaluating phase evaluating is let's say i have written paragraph 1 paragraph 2 here and my paragraph 3 so we have three different paragraphs in these we have one concrete idea and i've discussed this idea and idea one is this and then we have idea two have i missed anything in description should i have added more to make it better you know you always write with a pencil you know that you can erase and write more later so we have idea three as well here let's say have i missed anything else apart from this the logical part if you have missed anything you add here that's just evaluating you understand that all major ideas are being discussed that's the reason we have evaluating as the phase by the way we have here s here we can have z z is for american and s is for uk there's no difference apart from that it's not incorrect okay and the last one is revising same goes here we can have s or z depending on uk us revising is nothing but checking your spellings and your grammar trust me you will get at least five to ten mistakes in your spellings and five to ten mistakes in your grammar it doesn't matter how good you are or how bad you are in your english when we are writing we are into writing we just start we never stop never stop we never even worry if we are making spelling mistakes and we do i have seen i myself writing instead of this i write this sometime in a hurry so that can happen that doesn't mean that you don't know how to spell one but in exam this will be considered a mistake why don't you solve it why don't you rectify your own mistake and in revising it is not like evaluating you just have to read words quickly you don't have to you know understand the whole passage or whole paragraph you just keep reading words and you try to understand that oh there's a mistake let me erase it and write the correct spelling if it is grammatically incorrect you quickly make few corrections and it's done this will not take overall i mean whole method will not take more than six minutes if you practice properly before that initially it will take definitely 10 to 11 minutes then later it will be six minutes that is i think fine out of 60 minutes if you spend six minutes that will be 54 minutes if you have planned properly if you organize properly it takes not more than 25 minutes to write the answer that is your writing part two i'm talking about and part one well you have plenty of time then clear so this method has to be followed in order to understand the question as well as plan an answer and write and then recheck so that's like a foolproof method where you can get as much as you can you know out of the one which you've written in writing it's applicable for both task one and task two okay so let's just see in a, in a quick succession we have planning organizing writing evaluating and revising i am pretty sure you will remember this easily using the word power and once you do please use it in exam and you can write in question paper anything you want 
So in question paper, you just get a question on the top and below it's all empty. So you have enough space to write this. They don't mind what you write in question paper. In answer sheet, you have to write directly the answer. You cannot write planning in your answer sheet. Remember that. Please write it in question paper. Good. And that's the end of our chapter. Introduction paragraph in writing module. Now, what is this introduction paragraph? I'm not introducing the writing module itself. In fact, I'm going to show you how to introduce your paragraph. Right. So basically speaking, there are three different parts in an essay. Most of your essays, and let's say all of your essays, which are asked in IELTS, which is a part of second task, is written in paragraphs. If you have not watched the previous video about essays, please watch it. It talks about the structure of essays or what essays, kind of essays you might be asked for. But in this video, we're going to talk about the first paragraph, that is the introduction. It doesn't matter, matter where you write essay for IELTS or any other exam, you have to write an introduction for it. Even when you write scientific paper, you have to provide an introduction. So in an essay, there are three parts for sure. This, this video can be helpful for IELTS and other exam as well. Yeah. The first one is introduction. Second one, body paragraph. And third one, conclusion. These are the three types of paragraphs that you have to write. Have to means must write. Now, the number of paragraphs in introduction is just one. The number of paragraphs in body you know, could be many, right? So it could be two, three, four, any number, or even one if you want. And the last one is conclusion. That is also just one single paragraph. This could be one, two, as many you want, the body paragraph part. And today our task is to talk about introduction paragraph. Now you understand what we are talking about. When we write an essay, the structure goes like this. We have an essay which consists of paragraph. The essay always consists of paragraph. The first paragraph is called introduction. The remaining paragraphs just before the last paragraph are called body paragraphs. So this is body paragraph. And the last one is definitely conclusion. Today's task is this one. With every video, we will be talking about next theme. Like for example, next video will be about body paragraph and the last video in the series of uh, structure of essays will be conclusion. Let's begin then. What is the importance of this in introduction actually is uh, very important, I would say, <laughs> because it provides the first impression. Now I'll explain with an example or analogy. So when you write a paper or even write an essay, a person looks at your introduction as an entry point, as a, f as an f as a first impression, right? So I look at an introduction, I say, hmm, that person got good skills, right? Including your language skills, your analytical skills, your thinking skills. So I judge everything within an introduction that if I want to provide this person in the category of nine band, eight band, seven band or six band or any number below, right? So the impression actually is big rather than the paragraph itself. If your introduction is amazing, that means you are kept here, you know, nine bands kind of like, oh, this essay is going to be amazing because the introduction is pretty good. So if your body paragraph is okay, they might put you here or here maximum. But if your introduction itself is six, of course, they're not going to expect much. They're going to go back to here down like five bands, 5.5 bands probably. And this is one of the reasons most people don't get good score in writing. They don't focus much on introduction itself. Introduction of an essay is really important because of its first impression. Okay. And I suggest you start with after you understand the impression with the question. I don't think you have, if you have seen the question um, yet in the series, what question looks like in writing part of IELTS, but we're going to see now. But one thing before that, please understand the question before you start writing. Yes, it should always be understood first, always without question, writing an answer is just useless. 
what, on what basis would you create an answer? If you understood even incorrectly, wrong thing. So you have to understand the question correctly before you proceed with your answer. Most people love to be aggressive and you know, oh, answer is important. That will be providing me bands. Yes, it will provide you bands, but not the incorrect answer or not the answer of you know, another question that you are answering here, which is not applicable. They might call it out of topic and you will lose a lot of marks. So please understand the question first, then proceed with the structure or creating points that we will see later or we have seen already in the power method. Right? Good. Now, this is kind of a typical question which you might get in exam. That is um, a question here. First of all, there will be statements or a single statement. Question type here. So this will be, first one will be a statement. Based on this, this will be a type of question. And finally, some general instructions. The last one are always general instructions. Like write at least 250 words, give reason for your answer, and include any relevant examples from your own knowledge or experience. So this information is repeated in every question. By the way, this is taken from IELTS.org USA website. So this is an example to show you what a question looks like. Now, based on this, it is clear that this is agree or disagree kind of an essay. Don't worry about the technical wordings I'm using, what is agree and disagree. In the coming videos of when we are watching or the coming lessons when we are watching question types, you will understand this part in detail. But for now, our main focus is this part, which is the question part. If you look at this, we have two statement question. It could be single statement as well. My point was that you have, you have to see first in a question, there's a part where we have statements or a single statement. Then we have a type, question type, and finally general information. Of course, everything is important, but if you have practiced enough, general information never changes. You know, it will always stay same. It will always going to stay same, so no need to worry about that. Just worry about the statement and the type. Cool? Nice. Now see, this information, as I said, will be repeated. So we can just, I think, eliminate it for now. We'll keep this as the main question. And let's keep it in center to understand here. What do you understand from the question itself? Right, before you, before you even proceed, let me just read it for you. A person's worth nowadays seems to be judged according to the social status and material positions. Old fashioned values such as honor, kindness and trust no longer seem important. This is the question statement. And the question itself is, to what extent do you agree or disagree with this opinion? So this is the question that you have to understand. Based on the question of understanding, use the power method in which you divide the major ideas and minor ideas and important words that without them, it doesn't make any sense. For example, um, that person is judged according to the social status um, and material positions, which are there's examples such as this and honor, kindness and trust are no longer important. So these are the, some important words that for which you have to look for vocabulary. This is how you understand the question and proceed using power method, which was described in previous video. Okay, good. Now this part is, as I explained earlier, going to talk about the type of question. Here we have agree or disagree. Now how to proceed with agree or disagree type is a different issue. But for now, we can ignore this part in our introduction. Or let's say the first statement of introduction. This will be important only when we are writing body paragraph. In introduction, we will be using it very little. Okay, good. Now, any statement which you have in your essay would be a fact or opinion or combination of both. Generally, it is either only fact or mixer of both. So you might have just fact or fact plus opinion. Now you're just thinking, what am I talking about? Let me show you what I mean by that. This was the question which we have seen earlier, right? Now in this, this part is a fact. A person's worth nowadays seems to be judged according to social status and material position. This is the truth. 
There's no denying this point. But if you look at the next one, this one is an opinion of some people. This is not the fact. Old fashioned values such as honor, kindness and trust no longer seem important. This is their opinion, right? Not our opinion. It's someone's opinion. So our point is to figure out what is a fact and what is an opinion in a question. Chances are there that you might get a single statement and it might be a fact only. Look at this one. Lack of fresh water is becoming a global issue of increasing importance. This is a question, you know, as a question, there will be more, you know, you must have seen general introduction below, um, I mean, general information below in previous question. But we, we are not including that here. We are only including the statement. Statement would be like this, lack of fresh water is becoming a global issue of increasing importance. What problems does this sort shortage cause? What measures could be taken to overcome these problems? Here, there's nothing like an opinion. We have a fact and they're asking you to solve this fact or let's say solve this problem by using these questions. Clear. So could be there will be only fact or opinion. Understand this part that in a question, there could be fact plus opinion or just fact. Okay, good. Now this part being a fact, other parts were just also fact. So it, it takes us to the structure. Now what is this structure? I'll tell you what structure is. So when we form a box kind of diagram in which we can put three different parts or let's call it four different parts for an introduction. In this introduction, we have three, four different parts. We should always write these four important points while writing introduction. And I call this a structure. This is more like a template. If you understand this, you're just gonna change some words and include any similar information in each part. Now what happens in each part will be shown later, but I hope you understand what I mean by structure. This is the template of your introduction paragraph. Okay, so when you write an essay, so you have introduction, body paragraph, conclusion. I'm talking about the inside structure of the introduction paragraph. Right. The first thing is that this first sentence of the structure of the body paragraph is a fact-based statement. What is a fact-based statement? I think we have seen what is a fact in a question. Based on that fact, we create a statement, a general statement, right? Remember, this was a question earlier. A person's worth nowadays seem to be judged according to social status and material possessions and all this question about if uh, these things are important or not. Our fact in this question was this one, isn't it? So you would be requested or this would be recommended that your first sentence is a sentence connected to this part, only the fact based statement. Now look, this is a fact based. I'm going to get rid of rest of it and I'm going to provide you an example statement or example fact based sentence, which could be a first part. So we have four parts in an introduction. This would be the first sentence in the introduction. Recently, people are being accounted for their social status and the things they own. What did I do here? I just paraphrase the same thing, but in my, you know, just try to make it look like as if I'm introducing the fact, not the whole essay, right? Or the social status of a person and the things they possess are considered the way to judge a person in recent times. I'm trying to write this part, which is the fact in a different way. That's it. This is also called paraphrase. I hope you understand, right? Next one we have is that is sentence two. Remember there are four, so we have sentence two. Others opinion or view on the statements. This is sentence two. In our question, if you look at it, this was an opinion. So you have to understand this part. We're gonna talk only about this, that some people believe that characteristics such as honor, benevolence, and trust aren't considered decisive categorizing uh, um, a person. These are not considered anywhere in the decide. These are not deciding factors of categorizing a person. This is called second sentence or 
a fact opinion based statement right some people believe this and based on this what you're going to do is you're going to provide the sentence three that is your opinion or view on this topic so i'll just revise in a way short so that you understand what we are going through sentence one was a fact-based statement how did we find the fact by understanding the question there might be fact or opinion sentence two we talked about others opinion on this fact all right sentence three was your opinion or view on the topic got it so which we are here right now let me show what it means by this the same question now what is your view on this do you think it's true do you agree with this i would say yeah i believe in this so these are the positive parts so however i believe otherwise i mean this is the negative part so somebody said this that old-fashioned values such as honor kindness and trust are no longer seem important these are not important so my point is however i believe otherwise i feel some people say this I believe otherwise however i don't think this is true i go opposite again another possibility however i totally disagree with the statement so i'm showing my opinion on the topic it's very important that you clearly mention here i because this is your opinion you cannot say in indirect tone you have to be i'm sorry in a passive or you have to be active your voice should be active here that you as a subject what do you think okay good the last, I mean, the second part would be if you have a positive tone, that means you're going with the flow or with the opinion. I believe the same or and I totally, totally agree with the statement. If you don't mention any of these, let's say these are two options you can write in an essay. You cannot write both. In that case, it will be a clear paragraph. What if you don't mention these? Then you're gone. A person who is reading your essay gonna be confused to hell because they won't know what the essay topic or le let's say the whole body paragraphs and the conclusion will be about for an example you're asking do you like dogs or cats if i talk suddenly about elephants would you be able to judge what, what i really like of course not you have to talk about either dogs or cats you got my point what i'm trying to say here so please understand are they asking about dogs and cats or something else talk about these if they're asking about them don't talk about something new and you clearly mention i am gonna go for this so if they have a question called dogs versus cats i have to choose one let's say i choose cats then i talk about cats but you have to mention when you're choosing i prefer cats or dogs same thing i totally agree with the statement or i totally disagree with the statement it's important that you mention your opinion. Next one is the structure for the remaining essay. Remaining, I mean the body paragraphs and the conclusion. What is the meaning of structure? This is like glue to the body paragraph. Okay. Look, this was a question. We already have finished our introduction, uh, the three sentences of our introduction. The first one is the fact based statement. Second one is others opinion. Third one is uh, your opinion. And finally, we have the structure of the essay. Let's see an example. Three arguments for the agreement or the disagreement, whichever you choose. This is an option, of course. And a counter argument are explained in detail below along with the conclusion. So these things are explained in detail below with conclusion means now they know that this is ending of your introduction after this is going to come three different arguments which are for your agreement or disagreement and a counter argument is important we'll see why it is important when we are understanding the question type itself and they are explained with example probably you can add also that along with the conclusion this statement should always be very similar you can write in different words but it should know you should know that you should provide number here a number shows that this is a um, planned essay you know uh, i mean uh, and so do you see that what i mean a planned essay if you don't provide a number you say few arguments who knows what is few here a number is a better op is, is a better option right now let's see the full introduction what we have done so far so that um, we get the point clear. 
this was the question and this is the answer recently people are uh, are being accounted for their social status and the things they own some people believe that the characteristics such as honor benevolence and trust aren't considered decisive categorizing a person however i totally disagree with the statement three arguments for the disagreement and a counter argument are explained in detail along with the conclusion so this is the whole introduction in which we talked about everything we need to and it's short don't try to increase it more than four sentences because we have a limit of 250 sentence i mean it's not a limit but try to make it to 270 you can write as many but minimum is 250 i generally prefer 270 or something like that so if your introduction is huge your body paragraphs has to be short if they are short you can't explain properly i prefer and i suggest 3 to 4 sentences in your introduction maximum what is body paragraph or what are body paragraphs and these are the part of writing module earlier we have discussed introduction which is the first part of your three part essay you know the essay has three parts number 1 introduction then we have body paragraph and finally conclusion today we're going to go through the body paragraph now what is the meaning of body paragraphs and what happens in that let me just describe here in your body paragraph you're going to provide the reasons for your agreement or disagreement or you're going to expand your topic provide your concepts remember one thing never write more than one concept in one paragraph this is the biggest mistake people make no i have shown you this in earlier videos as well when i'm talking about essays and paragraphs i'm repeating this because it is really important so one concept one paragraph equal to the perfect mixture for an example i'm writing an essay about this room let's say this is a classroom and i want to write an essay on the classroom so i shouldn't start talking about its characteristics what i should start with in fact is i should group the classroom into various categories so first one would be the electronic in the room second one would be the furniture in the room third one would be let's say the human element the students and the teachers whatever it is and the fourth one could be anything but in what i mean is here in electronic i could talk about the board i mean uh, the electric board or i could talk about the fan or the ac or the computer itself in the furniture part i could talk about the chairs the table um the bulletin board itself and the fa- last human element i can talk about the teacher and the students you see how grouping has created a common topic so you get my point i cannot mix up the furniture part in electronics or human part in electronic or vice versa hence one concept per paragraph is must if you're writing i essay for ielts or anything i mean literally any exam toefl pte gre or any exam or without even exam if you have a competition for essays this concept works all the time if you have a good magazine reputed magazine if you read it you will find there is single concept in a single paragraph they don't exceed they explain that properly in single paragraph this is important all right keep it in mind now i think you have understood power method earlier if you haven't please go back to the video of the structure of writing and the power method video in which we discuss what is power that is planning organizing writing evaluating and revising these are the rules which will help you to create the structure of your essay you will get the points what to write in the body paragraphs plus the rule of paragraphs remember the rule one single concept in one paragraph right so the two things the power method plus one single concept in one paragraph these together combine and form a properly structured in body paragraph which we should write in ielts okay now let's talk about the structure itself what is the meaning of structure in body paragraph there are 
And first of all, before we even proceed with structure, why do we need structure? See, if you are an avid writer, that means a person who writes blog and you know, who writes book, they won't have trouble with that. But the person who has not written for years, what happens is they don't know what the structure is. Or they can start with something interesting, but could end the body paragraph with something horrible, or let's say something not desirable. Hence, there should be a template that should always be there in their mind, which could behave as a structure. Where we describe what would be the first sentence of your um, body paragraph, what could be the second sentence. Same goes for third and finally fourth. There are four different sentences. You got my point. What is the structure and what is the importance? This will keep you binded that we have to write this part in first sentence, this part in the second sentence. Clear? Let me show you how it looks. So we have part one, part two, part three, and part four. But these parts are sentences. Right. And overall, this will look like a paragraph. This could be called a body paragraph. So don't consider this as separate sentences. These are the sentences of your paragraph. But I have created a template, hence I'm forming boxes for your own benefit. Sentence one, sentence two, three, four are the parts of paragraphs, remember. Okay, let's get to the topic sentence itself. You know, what happens in the topic sentence, which is the first part of your structure. I mean to say the whole template. This is your first sentence always of your body paragraph. We are discussing body paragraph, remember that. And the first statement or first sentence in your body paragraph is the topic sentence. But what is the meaning of this topic sentence? What comprises in this topic sentence? Let's see an example. This we have seen in introduction as well, the same question, and I'm gonna continue with it so that you have a connecting chain. A person's worth nowadays seem to be, seems to be judged according to the social status and material positions. Old fashioned values such as honor, kindness, and trust no longer seem important. To what extent do you agree or disagree with, the opi with this opinion is a question. This is, I think you know from the previous video, it's general information. No need to worry for that now. We have to write at least 250 words. This is general. Our introduction is already finished. We have already done the power method. Let's say what, what points you will provide. Let's start with, with the point that we do agree to this statement, right? That means we know this question and I mean, we know the point and we say, I agree with the statement. Nowadays, people are not focusing on values such as this. But what are my agreements? Why do I agree? I mean, what are my points for agreement? This is the reason which I have to explain in my body paragraphs. So paragraph one could be one explanation, one reason for my agreement. Paragraph two could be one reason. But today we're gonna see each sentence of these body paragraphs. So I'm talking about the first sentence of this single reason. Got it? Again, the question, you can read it again if you wish. We already did read it. So let's see the first sentence of this body paragraph. Let me eliminate the useless information and talk about other side. I disagree. Okay. Media makes it look like what everyone wants is materials and online profiles. But the truth is totally opposite. You see, this is called the topic sentence or the body, the para heading. You can call it para heading or the topic statement. What is the meaning of this topic statement? I'll tell you. What happens is if you read the first sentence of your body paragraph, you should be able to guess what I mean by the whole paragraph. My main point or what, my, what I mean by this whole paragraph is the media is the culprit of making it look bad. That make it look like everyone just want material, everyone is materialistic, everyone just want online profiles. Clear. First statement of your body paragraph should indicate what will be there in your body itself. I hope I'm clear about that. That's why I said this is the first statement 
of your body better enough. That media makes it look like what everyone wants is materials and online profiles, but truth is totally opposite. Right. Second part is explanation. So this was the first one which we have seen earlier. Second is explanation, which we have to understand now. What are we explaining, by the way? Do you remember what we wrote in the topic sentence? Why? What are the reasons for us to disagree? First reason is mentioned as topic statement. Now we're going to explain the same thing in our uh, sentence, right? The same point which we have mentioned earlier. So same question we have mentioned. And this is our first statement. For your reference, this is our first statement, which is our topic statement. Now, if you want to expand it, the next statement, which is explanation, which we are explaining here, most people see what the media shows them. As a consequence, people feel qualities such as honor, being humble, etc. aren't as important as they used to be. Hence, you understand what I'm trying to say here, that my statement is I disagree for sure. I disagree with this uh, point. My first point for disagreeing is this. This is the first part of first sentence of my body paragraph one. This is my body paragraph one. First sentence is this one here. Second sentence would be after this. That is most people see that the media shows them. It's the explanation of basically the topic sentence. You don't have to create something new. You just have to explain why do you think this is the reason your first reason to disagree got it clear good now this third one is example see we have seen two first sentence second sentence of your body paragraph and the last one which i mean third one which is example remember examples are the pillar of the concept if i have mentioned a concept and i couldn't explain the concept that's just horrible because i took it because I knew it, right? With example, it will be concrete that, oh, I can explain now better. You can relate to the thing that happened. Examples are easier. So far, I've been teaching with examples if possible. It would be easier for you to understand with examples. Like for an, for an example here itself. So we're gonna see example of example. Um, going to a lake, at late night is not safe. Now you'd say, oh really, tell me about it. And I'm gonna tell you about more and then I'll give examples. See, this is what happened to my friend. He lost something and whatever. So example made it concrete, right? Same here with the same question. We have the first statement that is topic statement. Then we explain the topic statement, which we have seen in first and second part of a body paragraph. The third sentence is this one, which is an example. My friend thinks if he has more friends on his social media profile, he will be considered social. Sad part is he thinks because of an article he reads online. So that means he found this online and he thinks that he will be really a social person because he has more friends online. You got it. An example that is shown according to the situation will make the point more desirable and concrete okay now there are three types of examples possible number one your experience what i mean by your experience is what happened in your life something that uh, clicked you like for example oh that happened to me that i went to some media and i understood it that you know understood that uh, most important part is our social media profile but eventually i understood that they were all lies later i come to know the truth your ex your experience is the first type of example which is i think common because you can lie about it right second one is known experience the kind of example i gave earlier is known experience right you talk about a friend a family member or your partner or anyone you can create a virtual friend as well and talk about their experience that they found this and this is what happened if you don't want any of this, if you know some kind of general knowledge or general information, you can use that as well. See, this is much better, but the problem with general knowledge is you have to be correct. You cannot create statistic out of uh, the sky and out of the blue, you cannot create it. You have to know the statistic and then provide it. 
So three kinds of examples that you can provide, that is the third sentence of your body paragraph, could be your experience, your known experience that from your family or friend, and finally general knowledge which has to be correct. Other two don't doesn't need to be other two don't need to be correct. You know, it could be a virtual. It could be created. Okay, good. Now the last part of a body paragraph is conclusion. Remember, I'm not concluding the whole essay. I'm concluding only the paragraph. That means the reason, what why I think about the agreement or disagreement or whatever it is. So this is the last part. The conclusion only of the paragraph, not the whole essay. So we have seen the first one here, topic sentence. I think by repeating this many times, you must and you must be remembering this, right? And the last part, the second last part was the example. And finally, we have conclusion, which is the fourth part. All right. What happens in conclusion is we have seen all this, the first part, second part, third part as an example. Now, there's not much space. Let me just get rid of this and make some space here. And now we have the last part written in a way to show whatever I've shown you here, it can be concluded in a single sentence for you to revise. So last sentence could be, in a nutshell, it's not an individual's perspective on values, but the media's force and faulty influence. Okay, this is conclusion that you can add in the end and it will become a whole body paragraph. Four different sentences or five because in explanation you can add more like we did here. First sentence and second sentence, these two sentences are part of your explanation. This is an example, the one which I'm marking here. This is an example. And finally, we have conclusion. So together they form a perfect body paragraph. Yeah. Now this is the whole, how it looks like the whole body paragraph, starting with media's fault on this. Then we talk about how it is media's fault, what people think. An example about my friend, Right, and finally a conclusion about what we think about this whole point, what really happens. So four of the things, without them, there's no uh, possible way that you can have an amazing body paragraph. In fact, it's easier, you know, if you remember a template, all you have to do is that you can add your words based on the topic. Remember the structure, add your own words based on the topic. It's just replacement, nothing creating new. So it could get easier for you. You don't have to think in the middle, what should I write here? What should I write there? Okay, good. Now there's one more thing that you should also know. See, when we are writing body paragraphs, this earlier we have discussed a single body paragraph. All the body paragraphs will be written in the same way or the same structure. But these body paragraphs have to have a connectivity, which is called cohesion. We described cohesion when we were describing what are um, your what are your um, criteria of writing. So this is how your whole essay structure looks like. Introduction, then we have body paragraph one, two, three, as many you want, and finally conclusion. Right, but for now we are discussing only body paragraph. Hence we keep them here. Remove introduction, conclusion. Now see this structure we are talking about. How are you gonna connect them? That is cohesion, we said this earlier. For that, we have three different kinds of connectors, right? We have types of connectors as well. I think you understand what is the meaning of connector. We have body paragraph one, two, three. If I read suddenly the body paragraph, the middle one, I should be knowing what could be in the previous one. Or if I'm reading the first one, I should be knowing what is in the next one. Clear? Now look at the, the, the type three types. The first type is list of two ideas. What is the meaning of this type? What, what is the meaning of this list of two ideas? Let's say I have a body paragraph one and body paragraph two. That means I have explained two different points. The same question which we have that people don't believe in honor and stuff. So I have first reason as it's the reason because of media and we have because of friends influence. Okay, not just media, friends also influence this. Otherwise, it's not true. It is not true. I disagree. Hence, 
these two ideas are connected to each other using a list of two ideas which are similar. When we have two ideas which are on the same point, right, they are they come in this category. In this case, what we generally do is we have to understand one thing. Then we have to connect them using the word moreover. That means we are extending our idea. Clear what I mean by that? Let me explain again. So I'll start my first paragraph, whatever the way it is, normal structure, everything, the four sentences. When I start my next paragraph in this kind of point when we have two ideas only, I'll start the next paragraph, first sentence with moreover. What is this moreover? Moreover says that, oh, we have discussed something earlier. So now we are adding to it. Instead of moreover, if you want, you can add in addition to, that means what we've discussed earlier, in addition to that, I'm saying something more. You got my point. When we have two ideas, we can connect the ideas using this. Now see, if a person suddenly reads the second body paragraph, they would say, Oh, I see in addition to that means there must be something else above very similar to this. This is how we connect body paragraphs when we have two ideas of same type. Clear? Good. Second one is when we have a list of more than two ideas. All right. In that case, what we're going to do is we're going to start our first body paragraph with firstly. Because it's a list, right, of more than two items. And then we're going to start our next body paragraph with secondly. I mean, the first word would be secondly and then our topic statement. Same way here, first paragraph firstly and then our topic statement. If we have more than this paragraph, like let's say we have four paragraphs, we will say thirdly and always the last paragraph in the list would be considered finally. <coughs> Or you could say, I'm an example, lastly. Right. So the first body paragraph would start with firstly, second would start with secondly, and the last one will start with finally or lastly. I'm not saying here that you'll always have three body paragraphs. You can have four, but in that case, you will start with firstly, secondly, thirdly, and finally. Okay. Why can't we use this method in case when we have just two ideas? Look, we can never say firstly and lastly. Can we? No, it looks absurd. Right, isn't it? So we cannot do that. And always remember, when you're writing firstly, always put a comma. Secondly, always put a comma and then start your statement. Same goes with your moreover, moreover however, all of them, you should have a comma. So these are the way, this is the way it is. If you don't understand the punctuations, please go through the grammar series which we have created. You'll understand it. Okay? Good. Now the third one is, like we said, we have three different ideas. Contradicting ideas. What is the meaning of contradicting ideas? So earlier we said there are similar ideas in a list. It could be two or two, more than two, two ideas. But what if we have contradicting ideas? So this one, First one contradicts with this one. So I say this paragraph talks about the advantages of something. However, this one talks about the disadvantages of this. You understand what I mean by that? In this case, you are supposed to use something else rather than moreover and all those stuff. You should use words like however, or you should something like apart from that, no, apart from that is used for something else. Um, on the other side. Right, so this is like showing your perspective on the other side. That means you have one side and you have the other side. Hence, your first paragraph, that is body one paragraph, in the case when two paragraphs are contradicting to each other, first one will start without any opening, without any first word and a comma. It will start with your topic sentence. Second body paragraph will start with any of these, either however, or on the other side, or in contrast, you know, it could be one example, in contrast. 
That means we have said something earlier. Now we are contrasting a point. Clear? This could be a possibility. Now, let me just give you a complex idea. What if these two ideas are together? However, this one is opposite. It's simple. We start the first paragraph without any beginning. We start the second one with moreover because we are adding to the previous one. And finally, this is contradicting both. So we can start with however here or on the other side. I hope I'm clear about this. Then we have this complex structure where the first one and second one are similar ideas. However, the third one is contradicting idea. In that case, it's fine to add these things. I hope I'm clear about this and what I mean by contradicting ideas and similar ideas and stuff. Okay, and this is how we end the body paragraph part of an essay. We're gonna see the conclusion part of your essays. That is part two, right? That is essay in both types academic or general training and still we are at writing module all right what is this conclusion about conclusion always comes in the end of the three introduction body paragraphs you can have one body paragraph or two or as many you want so let's call it for now bn and the last one always conclusion it's last not the least important all right remember that it has at most important because a person who starts with an, a great introduction should also end with a great conclusion. It's a thing that like consistency is shown over there and your whole essay is concluded or the gist of the essay is being shown here. Remember, last doesn't mean it's least important. Now, what is the structure? I think we have discussed what happens in the structure. We have to have a template for our every part that is introduction, body paragraph and conclusion in here as well. See, there's one difference between introduction, body paragraph and conclusion that in both parts, the initial ones, we have four sentences of four points. However, in the case of conclusion, you have just three. That means three sentences must be there in the case of conclusion three parts are there right what are these parts let's talk about the first one which is called opinion this is called opinion of, of you and this should be considered the first sentence in your conclusion and before we try to proceed with the itself what it means i should be telling you always start your first sentence in your conclusion that is your view with a concluding word or phrase. Now, what is this concluding word or phrase? It's nothing just to show your conclusion has started. Okay, this is a way to indicate that it's not a body paragraph or an introduction. In fact, it is a conclusion. All right. Now, look, it can be used like it can be concluded that or we have another option for that. All in all, it can be said that maybe another one at the end of the picture. See, after this comes the whole sentence, same way here. After this comes the whole sentence, we have to finish. But before we start with whole sentence or the opinion, we should start with this particular phrase. OK, good. Now let's start with the question which we started earlier in the body paragraph itself or in the introduction. We always use this question or this example that a pers person's worth nowadays seems to be judged with social status and material and all beliefs are not important. I think we have discussed this plenty of times. So we're not going to discuss the question itself. Remember, when we started with it, we said we do agree or disagree in one part. Let's say we disagree with the point that this is the truth. We said it's not the truth due to certain reasons. Those reasons were our body paragraphs. In conclusion, we are going to pick up our first or let's say third sentence of our introduction. Remember, we said we disagree with it. So let's see an example of what I mean by that. It can be concluded that values such as honor, humbleness and trust, which are old fashioned, are important rather than things uh, rather than things an individual possesses. So let's try to understand what I mean by this. 
in our introduction we agreed to something that means this one we agreed with right so we mentioned that in the introduction i agree with the statement or in this case we said i disagree with the statement that old-fashioned values are not important okay that means i disagreed when we were discuss discussing the case of introduction if you have not seen the video please go back and watch it in our body paragraphs we have described why do we disagree our point reason one reason two so particular reason individual reason equal to one body paragraph in the case of conclusion our first sentence would be the same which we used in introduction to disagree so i said i don't agree with the statement i disagree hence our conclusion should be the same because we proved it right this is the conclusion yeah we proved it using the body paragraphs it can be concluded that values such as all this this means that i am restating my agreement or disagreement okay that's why i call it opinion your opinion is mentioned again it doesn't matter what question type it is if it is advantage or disadvantage what side do you agree if it is any of the five question type which you see later you have to mention it again which you mentioned in the introduction okay good second one is reason or details so reasons and details do come in the second one so we have discussed the opinions here and then we discuss why do we agree in now look these are the paragraphs in short the body paragraphs which we have written in length you know explaining this part that why do we agree with the statement or why do we disagree there's reason one whole body paragraph reason two with the example of course whole body, body paragraph in the case of second sentence of your conclusion you concise it in the form of a single word for an example here we call it because of media we believe in that social media is important however that's not true tv or movies try to show us that social media is important but it is not true same way we another reason so we'll try to find out one word or two words to explain the body paragraphs so your statement which we have already started with the first sentence is this one now second sentence is here let's just take some space and here is the second statement the reasons for the same are the influence from the media people's misunderstanding of the concept and assumptions made by individuals see these paragraph i mean these points influence from the media or the media people's and misunderstanding of the concept that is the second reason hence we must have a body paragraph one for this body paragraph two for this and body paragraph three for this i know you must be thinking we never thought of essays or even the conclusions like this in detail when everything is connected to the next thing which we are writing remember this is called cohesion and we have to have that to get good score most people don't get good score in writing for this reason they have good english but they don't know how to connect ideas they don't know how to connect the introduction part with the conclusion part we have to otherwise we won't get good score and anyway it the reading part is fun when everything is connected and you're enjoying uh, the concurrency you know the the continuity which, which you have so the second sentence is mentioned here the reasons for this agreement or disagreement which we have mentioned in the first sentence of a conclusion now the last part is called closing it is kind of a nice statement which we are providing to put an end to the uh, to the essay it must be something in my opinion it must be something nice because we have to be you know nice and being uh, what you call this um, you know towards the environment or towards the world so let me show you understand this is the first sentence which is in yellow color second sentence blue and the last one we see again yellow I have put to show you emphasize uh, to show you the emphasis a world full of people believing in values and ethics will make this a better place to live so this is the end see we talked about values and ethics because it was part of our question without this the essay looks like you know heartless now we put an uh, put a heart to the end of the essay it's going to be much better so let me show you the whole introduction if you wish to see from beginning till end this is the conclusion part of your essay
It shouldn't be more than three to four sentences maximum, but it should have three parts always. First part, if you remember, is the same thing you wrote in the introduction, the opinion. Second part is always the reasons for these opinions. Why did you choose this opinion? Or why did you choose the advantage or disadvantage? And the third one is a nice, a beautiful closing towards the positivity. Got it. And this is how you write a conclusion. In short and in a template kind of structure. Part two of your writing and question types in it. So that means your part two is always an essay and we, what kind of questions you get in that essay. We are still in the writing module. Earlier we have discussed the structure and how to write writing. I mean the essays and stuff, but today we're gonna see the question types, okay? There are five different question types which I mentioned here as number one, number two, number three, number four, and number five. You can keep looking up for the question types themselves and when you have given some explanation, it will be mentioned here below. So the first is called agree or disagree. The one which we have described in detail in your introduction, your body paragraph and conclusion. All right, what happens in this question type, we have two more types, subtypes in question. Okay, the first one is when we have an extent. What is this extent? This actually depends on the question, the way of the style of questioning. The first one is government should governments should spend money on railways rather than roads. To what extent do you agree or disagree? You see, to what extent? It doesn't mean that you have to write the extent you are disagreeing or agreeing. You just say agree or disagree. But it's a type or it's a style to say what extent do you agree or disagree. Okay, this is the first style. The second one is directly agree or disagree. You say, some people feel that entertainers, example, film stars, pop uh, musicians, or super sports stars are paid too much money. Do you agree or disagree with the above statement? You got my point. So overall, what you get is here to disagree or disagree. Earlier, we got extent or uh, extent of the agreement. Remember, there's no different answer for both of the questions. There's single answer. So what the structure would be for this question type? Introduction, that means in the introduction you mentioned if you agree or disagree, which we have discussed earlier. Then we have body paragraphs, body paragraph one, body paragraph two, as many reasons you have for the agreement or disagreement. And finally, a conclusion. One thing you should always remember when you're writing agree and disagree question type, if you choose to write agree, write 80% about agreement but you should go towards disagreement and write 20 percent about disagreement as well so for an example if we look at the previous question which is some people believe some people feel that the entertainers are paid too much do you agree i'll say i agree when i say i agree in the introduction i'll mention two body paragraphs in agreement and i'll mention a third body paragraph in disagreement that see in some cases it's true, they're working hard, they should be paid more, right? So if I choose disagree, I would say two body paragraphs for disagreement and write a short one for agreement. Why are we doing this? This is like we are the lawyers and the conclusion is the judge. So lawyers should be showing both sides. So that is the disagreement or the agreement side, but the one which you wanna make win or make clear should be more. So for example, I want to show my agreement part more. Hence, I'll write 80% agreement. What if I want to make the disagreement part more? I'll write 80% of disagreement. Hence, in the conclusion, we can judge that yes, the agreement is more and hence, it's true. You know, these people really are paid more for no reasons. Got my point? Always the other side should be described a little bit, at least 20% or 10%. Cool? Good. Second question type is advantages and disadvantages. In this question type, we have also two types again, I mean subtypes, right? The subtypes are, there's a direct or let's say negative development. You know, if we have direct or positive or negative development, let's look at it here. Countries are becoming more and more similar 
because people are able to buy same products anywhere in the world. Do you think this is positive or negative development? Or similarly, you can say, what are the advantages and disadvantages of this development? So they're asking you same thing. Please provide these two points. They are not comparing them. In fact, they're asking you to write these two points. Now, what, how to write in this kind of question when we have this subtype? Of course, introduction, we will provide how about this point about uh, how people can buy everything anywhere. Now in body one, you will mention advantages. In body two, you will mention disadvantages. And when we have a conclusion, if you have more disadvantages, you can mention in body three as well. Or if you have more advantages, you can mention here as well, extra. But what I mean is you don't have to create new paragraph for your own opinion. Got it. You have ad pro uh, paragraphs for advantages and disadvantages. Clear. But we have second subtype in advantages and dis disadvantages where they use the word outweigh. The meaning of outweigh is, do you think this is better than that? Okay, here. Many museums charge for admission while others are free. Do you think the advantages of charging people for admission to museums outweigh the disadvantages? Here, they have asked question clearly. Do you think the advantages of this are more than the disadvantages? Now, your answer should be very clear because they have asked you a question. Not to mention, they, have, they haven't told you, please talk about advantages and disadvantages or something. But they have asked you a question. Do you think this is better? If you say yes, the advantages outweigh the disadvantages, that means you have to write more on advantages. Hence, the structure would be an introduction about the topic itself. Then we have body paragraph one, where you are mentioning more towards its advantages. Body paragraph two, more again towards advantage, because see, we have agreed on that advantages are more. We are just giving an example. And body paragraph three, where we are mentioning just a little bit of disadvantages. Because see, outweighing means these are more, this is less. And in conclusion, you can conclude it, that you can see that many advantages, but just one disadvantage. Clear? So this is how you answer the question for um, outweigh question. But remember, read the question properly where the outweigh word has been used. In here, it is used between advantages and disadvantages. Hence, the question is about advantages, not disadvantages. What if I change the wordings? Do you think the disadvantages of charging people for admission to the museums outweigh the advantages? In that, case, in that case, if you want to say yes, advantages are great, then you have to say no. Disadvantages are less than the advantages or disadvantages don't outweigh the advantages. That means outweigh advantages are more. So read the question very carefully, understand the structure, see where the outweigh word is used. Based on that, create your answer or create a structure. All right. The next one is discuss type. In this, they're asking you with a statement in which we might have two views. For example, some people say that the only reason for learning a foreign language is in order to travel to or work in foreign country. Others say that these are not the only reason why someone should learn a foreign language. Discuss both views and give your opinion. Now, what is the meaning of both these views? First of all, we have two views here. The first one is here. Second one here. Second one is that these are not the only reasons that someone should learn a foreign language. That means we have other reasons to learn a foreign language. Clear? So you have to discuss both views and discuss them. I mean, and provide your opinion, not just discuss. So your structure would be introduction. Then you write one body paragraph, that is body paragraph one, discussing the first view, right? And then you mention the body paragraph two, discussing the second view. And then body paragraph three, sorry, body paragraph three with your opinion. And then finally, you are at a conclusion. It's simple. Introduction, you should mention about both a little bit of it. We have discussed how to write introduction and conclusion as well, but body paragraph will change here a little bit. That is first view, second view and opinion. And finally, you conclude based on your body paragraph and introduction. Clear, this is called discuss type. 
Now the fourth one is actually it's very easy it's called problem solution what happens in problem solution is again we have two subtypes what are these two subtypes number one when we ask for only solution they don't ask you for causes or the problems see here in many countries schools have severe problems with students behavior what solutions can you provide or suggest you see here there's nothing like what is the reason for this kind of problem or what are the other problems connected to it they just want you to write solutions in this case i suggest you write this way in the introduction itself please talk about the problems or the reasons or the causes of this problem that is in short in body paragraphs you write first solution second solution as many solutions you have let's say b to n and finally a conclusion that how we have a problem how can we solve it okay if you are struggling with introduction and conclusion remember we have a separate chapter or video on this please go through it we are just discussing the question type themselves so problem and solution are mentioned like this if we have the first type where only solution is required that we write first solution second solution as many solutions we have in a form of paragraphs in form of paragraphs right so second type is when we have to mention the problems or the causes of the problems and the solution as well so in this case let's look at an exam at an example in some countries the average weight of people is increasing and their levels of health and fitness are decreasing what do you think are the causes of these problems and what measures could be taken to solve them you see that what are the causes of these problems is the first thing that are you know the reasons and finally measures means solution that can be taken to solve them in this case your structure will change a bit you start with introduction then in the body paragraph 1 you mention the problems or the causes of the problems in body paragraph 2 you mention solutions for those problems let's say i have mentioned cause 1 the reason 1 for this problem reason 2 and hence i provide the solution for these causes so there is a solution 1 and solution 2 as many solution you want actually depending on the you know the problem you mentioned and finally a conclusion i'm not limiting you with three body paragraphs i am just telling you the one thing you mentioned in your body one how many causes you have solution should be based on that clear good and the last one but not the least is the direct questions very simple and hence the structure will be simple as well here you will be given a statement like this lack of fresh water is becoming a global issue of increasing importance what problems does this shortage cause and second what measures could be taken to overcome these problems now this looks like problem solution <clears throat> sorry but remember they can change this they could say something like how true is this statement and what can be the solution what i mean is they would be asking you direct two questions and you have to answer those questions they are sometime little bit away from that or a little bit more connected but they are not problem solution types of essay they are direct question yes so here we end this chapter because see in this in this case you have to just write the introduction and in the body one you mention the first question in body two you mention the second question and in conclusion you just write conclusion so it's a simple structure you can create one single body paragraph for one thing second body paragraph solving the other thing and conclusion so it's pretty simple the part one of writing but remember this is for academic only that means we have two academic and general training if you are from general training that means you're definitely going for work if you're an academic you're going abroad for study so if you're planning to study abroad watch this video as your writing one will be different than that is writing part one will be different than people who are going for work let's begin then first of all this will be part one that means it has nothing to do that you have to do it first there are two parts that is part one and part two 
and you can do any of them anytime. Remember, you'll be given total 60 minutes and they mentioned that, you know, an exam, 20 minutes are recommended for this. Recommended, not necessary. You know, you're not going to take your paper back because you finished 20 minutes and 40 minutes are recommended for this. You can take as much as time you want, but if you do in 20, it's much better because number of words in part one is just 150 words. This is just the basic information. What if, if you want the whole detail, please watch another video I have made on structure of part one. Now, in this section, you'll be writing report. That is for academic. Remember, if you're for general training, we have a separate video for that. Understanding what writing part one is for academic. I mean, for general training. This is only for academic. Because in general training, you are supposed to write a letter. In here, we're going to write a report. And that will be based on a graphic. So as I said, structure is already discussed in previous videos. You don't have to worry about that here. And you won't get anything much in deeper about the structure. What is informed and what is not informed. What is task one, what is task two. What are the criteria and all those things will be discussed. Already discussed in previous videos. Let's get deeper in the concrete stuff. Task one consists of any of the six types of the questions. Now, what I mean by any of the six types, you won't get more than two que one question. So you'll be getting one question only. And this one question will be out of these six types of questions. And they all will have graphics. So basically based on one graph or another kind of graph, you will be asked question. And there are six kinds of graphs possible or images possible in this task. That is task one. Out of this, you will get only one type, not all six, remember. So remember one more thing. You don't have to write introduction or conclusion like we discussed in part two or we're going to discuss in part two. In essays, what we have to do, start our essay with introduction. I think you know this from school. Then we write a body paragraph. Then we write another body paragraph if required. And then finally conclusion. There's no need to write introduction or conclusion in this question type. It is fine. So no need to write introduction separately for that. No need to write conclusion because we have discussed in videos what is introduction, what is conclusion separately. You don't have to worry about that. Now, no extra information or opinion apart from introduction or conclusion. You don't have to provide any extra information. In a question, you'll be asked to write something. You just have to follow the question. In task two, what you're supposed to do is there's a question. They ask for your response, your opinion on that. So based on your opinion, you will have different answer. But here, no opinion required. Okay, make it clear. Good. Here, all you have to do in task one is remember the words and the structure. That's it. I mean, remember the words means there are certain words that you do have to include in your writing part one. And if you know the structure, if you know the question type, you can score easily in part one because you don't have to think of your own ideas, own, you know, um, concepts or anything. Just remembered stuff or not remembered, let's say, understood stuff of all the question types, that is six. Let's begin with the paragraphs themselves. What I mean by paragraphs is there are three different paragraphs, type of paragraphs that you have to write in task one. All of them should be understood. In short, number one, paragraph one could be a single sentence. And that will be introduction of the graphic, right? What does it mean by introduction of the graphic? As I said, single sentence could be considered a paragraph. Paragraph two will be describe, compare and contrast the graphic. See, this is just the paragraph. When we are seeing an example, it'll get clear. Don't worry about it. It is coming soon. So we have to describe the graphic, compare the information it is. And if there's contrasting, also mention the contrast. That is paragraph two. And paragraph three would be you summarize. By the way, if you write Z here, it's US. And if you write S here, it's UK based. There's no difference. There's, there's nothing is incorrect, incorrect. Summarize means whatever information you got, you just mentioned something interesting in it. And then that is fine. You don't have to create a conclusion for that. Okay. Now let's see the types of reports. The one which you're waiting for, the concrete types. Okay. So these are the six types in which the first one is called a line graph or a graph itself. 
The second one is called a pie chart. This is called a bar chart. Don't call it bar graph, it's called bar chart. This one is the fourth one is called a image of process, describing a process. Here this one is called a map, show the difference in a map. You see there are two different maps. And the last one, tables. In exam, you might get lines here, you know, in the form of rows and columns, but I have formed two different tables. You have to describe the table. Six different question types. You might get any of this, like you might get line graph, you might get pie chart, you might get a map, any of this, okay? Now let's see line graph and bar chart together. Why together? Because they have most of the things similar, very few differences. Right, the first, let's see in detail what it looks like. And you know what is in there in line graph. In line graph, we have these kind of lines which are showing the trend. You know, some sales are increasing or carbon emission increasing or decreasing, whatever. But in bar chart, they have a number here which is mentioned using bars. These could be not just vertical, but horizontal as well. What I mean by that, the part-time voluntary work, further study and unemployment could be here, you know, in this form, like this. It could be vertical or horizontal. But when we have a bar, it is called bar chart. Good. This is an example of a bar chart. You might have two in there. You have to explain both or compare both. So question will be like this. The charts below show what UK graduate and graduate students, uh, postgraduate student who did not get into full-time work did after leaving college in 2008, right? So this example will show how it works. So here we have graduates, here we have postgraduates. You can compare both bar charts. We'll see how to compare. This will be always the same. This is called information. That will be common all the time. Question is here and your chart are here. It could be one or two depending on the question. Another example is line um, graph. The graph below shows average carbon dioxide emissions per person in United Kingdom, Sweden, Italy, and Portugal between 1967 and 2007. Clear? So this will be a line graph where they show the increase in, you know, the carbon dioxide or decrease. This, these are the, you know, mentioned details about the graph and you can we can understand later how it works this is a question that i'm explaining okay now remember in a line graph trend is important what i mean by trend is you see that trend increasing decreasing and going down and sudden increase sudden decrease these are called trends however in case of bar chart trend plus grouping is important what i mean by grouping is see earlier we have seen this image here we have part-time, voluntary work, further study and unemployment. We could create a group of these. Or we could create two groups. Group 1 is graduate, group 2 is postgraduate to form paragraphs. So in this case, grouping plus trend is important that what is changing, what is increasing, what is decreasing, that is also important. Last but not the least, title is always important in both. It gives the information about the graph. Now if you look here, this is the title of a graph. This is the title of a graph. This gives the information, most of it, through titles. Here, the x-axis and y-axis information gives us information as well. So you got my point. What is this title and how trends and grouping is different? Good. Let's see in both example what we discussed earlier. This is the title. I'm revising myself. And what other two things? Trend. Trend is important in line graph as well as bar graph, but grouping is important in bar, I mean, oh, sorry, not bar graph, bar chart. In bar chart, we have also important is this grouping. Can we group using these or can we group using postgraduate and graduates? Clear? Good. Now let's see what happens. What do we write in first sentence? Now we're going to go sentence wise what to write or paragraph wise what to write in our line, gra uh, line graph or bar chart. The first sentence could be called a first paragraph. That means a single sentence can form a full paragraph. Clear? You don't have to create anything new. One single sentence equal to one paragraph, possible. Now, that also gonna describe your graph in short. That means in a single sentence, you're gonna describe your 
the whole graph, right? What we mentioned to you. Let me give an example. This is the question we had. The graph shows average carbon dioxide emission. So we have this whole question and we have this image. Let me get rid of this image and show you how you can write the first sentence of your question. The graph illustrates the emission of carbon dioxide in four countries, namely United Kingdom, Sweden, Italy and Portugal for four decades between 1967 and 2007. What have I done in this case? Now look, I have included all the information required from the question and from the graph and I have written in a different words. You know what I mean by that? Paraphrased it. If I just directly copy paste here, not going to work. See, you can change few things here, which I have written my way. You can change from illustrates to shows, sheds light on, informs, or just anything. But it's important that you start with this. Okay, good. This is the first sentence as well as first paragraph. Then you have to change the paragraph of the graph. Paragraph 2 describes the detail, the trend, and the contrast which we have mentioned. Okay, now look here, what, what's going to happen? Isn't this increasing? And there's sudden decrease, but this is not a sudden decrease. This is a slow decrease. You see that all these things are important. We're going to see them in detail. So there are five possible trends. You know, all these trends, we have five possible trends, in, including line graph plus bar chart. Let's see all the trends one by one with examples and images. The first trend is slight increase. Where do we see slight, slight increase? We, you see here slight increase. You see that? So we're going to use the word expanded, grew, climbed, rose, stepped up, picked up, or any of these words you can use or something like the carbon dioxide increased or grew in this number from this to this year. You can mention these words. Now, in order to emphasize, you can say moderately or slightly. See, these are adverbs. So if you're using the verb words as, you know, to show increase as verbs, let's take an example. Moderately, um, moderate, moderately uh, rose. That means it increased moderately. So this is what we have as a verb and to enhance the verb, we have always adverbs. What if we use an adjective? Then we have to change the word to a noun. Adjectives always describe a noun. So adjective plus noun, verb, I mean adverbs plus verbs. In this case, if I want to use, let's say, um, gradual. So I'm going to say gradual increase or gradual rise. That means the rise overall, this is a rise as a noun. So the, there's a gradual rise rather than saying it rose gradually. That is adverb. Okay, so you get the difference. You can use any of these. If it's up to you. You can interchange sometime. But in order to show slight, you have to use these adverbs and adjective. Good. Second one is slight decrease. You see here, there's a slight decrease from compared to this one. And this is what we call slight decrease, not sudden, slight. So you can say reduced instead of decrease, went down, decreased, dropped, declined and fell. All of these are verbs. And if you remember, what do we use to describe verbs? Adverbs. Same adverbs you can use, same adjectives can use. So for example, slightly declined. So these are slightly declined um, carbon dioxide emissions. Got my point. And if you want to use adjective, then you have to use um, the word as noun. You have to complete. So the minimal reduction instead of reduce reduction. Gradual reduction can be seen from this to that. So that's what I mean by adverb plus verb. However, for adjective, it's always with a noun. But if you don't understand this, or if you need to know more and get more information about them, please watch the video about um, parts of speech, which we have posted in a verb section. I mean, sorry, uh, in a grammar section. Good. The third one is dramatic increase. 
if there's a dramatic in increase, there's sudden increase. You see that there's a dramatic increase here. And um, you could see a dramatic increase, almost dramatic, but it is big increase, right? There's a huge, um, you know, it grew um, exp exponentially. So in order to explain this, we can also have adverbs, but different ones. And the same goes for adjectives. Significantly, rapidly, steeply, substantially, considerably, all these words can be used in order to show the increase or dramatic increase, you know, a huge amount of increase. Now adjectives can be created from them. So significantly become significant. Rapidly can become rapid. Sometimes it's so easy just to remove ly and it makes sense but not always. And look at this word considerably. You cannot just remove li and it will work out. These are some exceptions. So you have to use considerable. So it was considerable increase or so con considerable rise. So this rise and increase are nouns. If you want to use grew or expanded, you have to use it grew significantly. Got it to show dramatic increase. And so, go, so goes for. Now in this case, See, earlier we have discussed you can use adverbs and adjectives to show dramatism, you know, like to show dramatic increase. What if I don't want to? Then I don't need to use any of these if I use such words. It soared, it escalated, it rocketed, it showed up or jumped. These words themselves are emphasized or they don't need adverbs and adjectives to be shown dramatism. Get my point? If you use the previous words, you use these adverbs and adjectives to show dramatic increase. However, if you don't want to use adverbs and adjectives, use these words. They are already showing dramatic increase. Clear? Good. And the next one is dramatic decrease. Decrease. You can see it here. There's a dramatic decrease in this, and you can use the word reduced, went down, decreased, dropped, or declined, or fell. Same one which we use you in a slight decrease as well. And same adverbs and adjective we can use. You can pause the video and you know just take notes from this so that you can remember. Finally, what if we don't want to use them? I mean the adverbs and adjective, we can ignore them here and we use this part directly. Collapsed, slumped, crashed, plunged, plummeted. What I mean by this is, you see, the plummeted word can be used directly. The carbon dioxide emission plummeted. That's it. You don't have to use the words like significantly plummeted. What does it even mean, right? You got my point. If you want to show dramatism, you use adverbs and adjective, but with different words. These words themselves can be understood without adverbs and adjectives. Good. And the final one, you don't need anything. There's just steady. For example, if you look here in this part, the emission remains steady. There's not much change. So you can say between year 1977 and 1987, the carbon dioxide emission, you know, stayed at a constant level or stabilized at this number or flattened out at this number or leveled off. You got my point. These words can show steadiness. That means it plateaued out and didn't increase or decrease. There was no change in that. And you don't need any adjectives or adverbs because those were to show a dramatism. Here we don't need on any of that. Cool? Good. I know this was a lot of information in bar line graph, uh, uh, line graph and bar chart. I suggest you watch it with notes. Okay. Now, next one that is third one is pie chart. Pie chart looks completely different. I think you have seen plenty of the time in your school and in PPTs. This is what a pie chart looks like, where we have a circle, which donates and denotes all the information we need about the you know the whatever it is like for example british students these are the hundred percent of them this always in percent and what percent is which thing for example in this here no other language they're learning or they speak is this one dark blue is another language so this information is provided using a graphical method called pie chart let's see how we solve them this is kind of question you get you might get two questions I mean, two pie charts in a single question, you might get single pie chart. Generally, you get two. The chart below shows the portion of British students at one university in England who were able to speak other languages in addition to English in 2000 as well as 2010. We have 2000 here. 
and 2010 here that means two pie charts are separate they have different information all you have to do is gain that information from the image plus the question question will give you information about what the pie chart is about and these pie chart themselves will give you what are we talking in the in the question like for example what are we talking in about the british students or who can speak other languages apart from english okay cool now in earlier thing you know we have seen this introduction the first sentence will stay the same no change so we're going to say something like um the pie chart describes or illustrates the you know the part of students british students in one you know at one university in england um who can speak other languages apart from english and those are shown in year 2000 as well as 2010 so different words basically the most important information in pie chart that has to be separated is these are these three things the first one is written form how it differs than the percentage and how it differs from the fraction by the way when we have a person sign in front of a number we cannot call it percentage so this cannot be said 50 percentage it's called 50 percent but if there's no number included we can call it percentage like a large percentage of people okay so a half is called 50 percent or one by two a, th one th a third is called 33 percent or one by three two third 66 percent two by three three quarters 75 percent three by four a quarter 25 percent one by four so these are in fractions these are in words first thing which we have seen and here we have seen in percent you can say 50 percent 25 percent to dinner why am i giving you this information so that you don't repeat yourself you see there's a lot of information here sometimes it's just almost 25 percent just even below that so what if you have to describe the same thing here for example this one is equal to the yellow one the green one here you don't have to use the word like you know it is almost 25 percent because you can use next time a quarter if you remember we have something called lexical resource where we have said you have to use synonyms and that's the reason i'm trying to provide you as many synonyms as possible let it be in written form or percentage form or fraction form okay all right next one is table and you know how a table looks like right table looks like with you have a row you know these are all rows and these are columns so these are all rows which are horizontal vertical one are column and your information mentioned here it could be a single table or it could be two tables so let's see a question based on a table the tables below give information about sales of fair trade labeled coffee and bananas in 1999 and 2004 in five european countries so five european countries i don't think they have mentioned that yes they did here so you have to watch out this information they have mentioned only five european countries here have they mentioned the name no you get the name from the table itself right it could be a single table it could be a, two different tables now they have separated table based on the commodities they have used coffee and banana clear so the question plus table will give you enough information to write the first sentence which we have discussed earlier good second one and and, and there's no difference between you know tables and other other pie, uh, graphs or you know pie chart everything stays the same that is first you write a uh, first paragraph or first sentence you write about the table and the question second you discuss the details plus contrast and compare what happened in 1999 however what changed what is the most interesting information and all those stuff and part three is just you summarize saying that all right so this was the biggest change and this was the least change thing like this always stayed the same there's no change in this part so you see that what i mean by that like for example in the in the conclusion or the the last part you can say it's not conclusion by the way ending you can say the biggest change was in banana that in 2004 it used to be 47 the sales however in 2004 i heard in the case of coffee it was 20 comparatively it was less than half right so this these are the you know you can have speculations on that now we have process diagram 
A process diagram is a diagram which shows a process, simply speaking. So this is a cement pro production as well as concrete production. And they're asking you to write two different images. That's fine. Sometimes you get a single image to show a single process. Sometimes you get two. Process diagrams are a little bit tricky. Let me show you what happens in there. What kind of question you get. So the diagrams below show the stages and equipment used in cement making pro process and how cement is used to produce concrete for building process, pro uh, purposes. You see that what is happening here. Cement production and then the cement is taken here and it is continued below. So how the cement is used in concrete production is also shown and hence you have to discuss process from here. Arrow goes like this and you go on the top of this pro process of production and you enter here. This is a process diagram. Let's remember one thing. Use the headings to understand the image. What are the headings? You can see here cement production, concrete production. You have gravel equal to small stones. That means we get the information, you know. Apart from that, we have also information about what is happening in the diagram. You know, this, these are called rotating heaters, this is called power, this is called a crusher. So headings do provide information about the image. Second thing, we have to understand the flow. Where does it start from? I think images are themselves very clear. They start from here, limestone and clay being added in a crusher, where they are formed in a powder shape. Go through a mixture and then go in the same diagram like this, which they have shown. Here cement is, and water is added, which go through, and later this also added, and finally here. So the flow has to be known to you. I mean, you understand the flow and write according to the flow. You cannot suddenly write about rotating heater or let's say gravel. You have to write in the flow. Clear? Moreover, use verbs. What I mean by use verbs is, you know, mix them. Mix them is a verb. The mixer uh, takes the powder in and it, what it takes out, it takes it to the rotating heater. What rotating heater does, you know, when the heat is provided, it rotates apart from that. And what does grinder do? Grinding. So all these processes, what are they doing? They are doing some action because this is all an action. Verbs are always important in case of action, right? Because what are verbs? Well, they are word of action, right? That's what I mean. Always use plenty of the verbs based on what is happening. Let's take an example. Limestone and clay are crushed in this machine called crusher and created in the form of powder. So this word crust is a verb. Same way for every equipment we must have a verb. Is it mixing? Is it grinding? Is it um, you know filtering? Is it heating? All these are verbs. Clear? Cool. Now, um, there are words to describe sequence. See, I told you it is a process. That means you have to understand the flow. That means sequence is the most important part. And what are the words? First, then, next. When it is ready, then, next, then, finally. You can use in any sequence. Of course, first should come first and finally should come in the end but you can do it according to the image. So you say first this and that, whatever the thing is mixed to create a powder. Then it is passed to the boiler. Next to that, this thing, when the powder is mixed and it is ready, you take it to the next level. Without these words, it is very difficult to create a progress of a process in a person's mind who's reading. This will create a sequence in the person's mind who's reading and eventually they can imagine that image. You know what I mean by that? So there's an image where we have processes, where we have process one, process two, process three, and it is going in this sequence. If you tell them, first, it is boiling. Second is this. Third is, let's say, filtering. If you use these words, first this happened, then this happened, and finally, the last process happens, it's so damn easy for others to understand. So please use the words of sequence, okay? Now, in order to describe a process, we use passive vo voice. What is passive voice? Let me explain. Passive voice is just a way of saying things where we put the object first, not the subject. 
For an example, an active voice, first clean the door of the chamber. Good. Now let's see in the passive voice. First, the door is cleaned. Yeah, I mean, door of the chamber, you can say that is cleaned. Here, cleaning is the important. That means your action is important. Here, the door is important. You can say door of the chamber, no problem. What I mean to show you here is your cleaning will go in the end. So passive voice means your object is important, not the action itself. Here, the action comes first. That is passive voice. If you want more detail or any detailed explanation of what passive voice is, what kind of passive voice we have, then please go through the grammar series and that you can get it. Good. Now the last one, but not the least, is map. What happens in map is you're given two different, in a single image, two different diagrams. That is, both of them are same thing, but some change. Like a school diagram, a beach diagram, or an island diagram, where you have to explain what changed in this map in one year or other year. So they might give you like 1910 and 2010. You have to show the difference what happened in this year and this year. That's your task to do. You see that here there were trees earlier, there were no houses or whatever the change is there. In order to show changes, we have to use change verbs. But before that, let's see how the question is being created. The two maps below show an island before and after the construction of some tourist facilities. Right. Here this is before the construction of facilities. This is after the construction of facilities. From the question you understand what is this? what are these maps about. Second thing, from the map itself you can see the change. Both of them will contribute to the answer. The most important part of maps are the possible words you can show change. Like reconstruct, expand, improve, modernize, extend, renovate, reduce, develop, add, remove, replace. If you look at it, all of them have the meaning. Reconstruct means something which is already there, but break it and create it again. Expand means, let's say I have a small house, but I in later years I make it bigger, that is expand. Improve means it's okay, but I make it better later. That is improvement. Same way, all the words, if you don't understand, please search about them. They are important, all of these words. They are like 11 words. If you can connect with the image here and see which word can be added. See, overall, it was what? It was modernized and developed both. What was reduced? Well, there must be something. Right, here, something called developed can be used here. However, we removed some of the plants and added this. What was added? A bridge was added. So that was also here. These words can be used to show the change in the map. And I guess you can see here, I kept it th this part for you to check <clears throat> which can be created, you know, which can be done. Here we don't need to use reconstructed because nothing was constructed earlier. So that can be gone. Second one is, is there anything expanded? Of course not. We didn't expand a, an island, right? That is done. Improve. Did we improve on anything? Nope. Yes, we did modernize. We create modern design in the island. Did we extend anything? No, we didn't extend except for this plier part, which was added, not expanded anyway. Did we renovate? No, renovation was not there. Anything reduced? If you look at the number of trees, no, they were not reduced, except for some parts, they were replaced, you know, few trees were replaced, that's it. Any development scene? Yes. Added? Yes, of course, we added the house. Did we remove anything? Yes, a few trees here and there, that's it. What did we replace with anything? No, we didn't replace, we just added a few things. You see, how these words, try to remember them all and use them in your map when you get in the exam. And with that, we end our chapter where we're going to see where we saw how, you know, writing task one is created with how paragraphs are written. And most importantly, each question type was discussed and what to write in each. All right. I hope you understood this video. And if any doubt, please ask question using uh, email ID as well as you can write in comments. We're going to see how to take care of task one. 
for writing module only for general training. If you thinking about academic, if you're writing for academic, that is for study purpose, please go to our previous video, which talks about task one itself for academic. That is a report. In general training, we're gonna see a letter. So let's begin. Writing task one for general training is always a letter and a single letter. There are plenty of the types of letters, but you'll only get one question. You'll be given 20 minutes to write, but these are recommended. You, don't, you can write a little bit longer or shorter. And you don't have to write this as first. You can write task two or task one, any of them first. You know, I mean, there's no set sequence up to you. What you feel, fine. I prefer task two because, you know, it's a little bit longer and carries more or a, a higher score. I always go for two first and then go for one. Anyway, let's begin. Now, as I said, it's always a letter. And secondly, let's see an example directly so that you understand what is gonna happen in an exam. You should spend about 20 minutes, should, not necessarily, it's up to you. Uh, you have seen an advertisement for a community college that needs teachers for night classes. Write a letter to the community college in your letter. Now see, till here you will get information. What is this letter about? After this, you will get what you should mention in the letter. Say which advertisement uh, you are answering, describe which courses you want to teach and what um, it or they would be about. Explain why you would be suitable a suitable teacher. These things you have to mention in your letter for sure. And as I said, minimum 150 words in the structure video. You don't need to write any address. They, know, they might or they might not mention this, but you don't have to write any uh, address or you know to or from nothing start with just dear sir or dear madam or dear name depending on the letter type we'll see that later but don't mention any address and this is the question what you see in exam okay let's proceed then letters are divided in based on two types that is their purpose as well as formality and there are three different letters based on formality the first one is called formal letter you know, if you're writing to someone who is higher authority or you're writing a letter to who you don't know even, then it's formal letter. Second one is called semi-formal. That means writing to someone you do know, but you're not that close. You, they are not your friends or family or relatives. Got it. So you're writing to them as semi-formal. And the last one is informal. That means the people who are your friends, very close, who are your family, neighbors, you know, anyone who is close to you, they know you personally, is called informal letter. Why do we have to understand these three? The reason is our letters and the structure will change based on the letter types, based on formality. Let's see what I mean by that. See, differences will help you to understand three of them in a single go. Because if I talk to them, talk about them separately, you'll get confused. So what I have done is I created a proper table so that you can compare and contrast and remember stuff. It doesn't matter. See, you won't be getting three of them. You will be getting any one of them. Now let's see, we're gonna talk about formal, semi-formal and informal. First thing is the salutation. In the formal letters, you can say dear sir or madam, and, or maybe you have to not can. In the second one that is semi-formal, you say dear first name or dear Mr. or Miss surname. We make this mistake very often that when we say Mr., let's say my name is James Bond, which is not by the way. So what I generally say is Mr. James, I mean as a student, which is incorrect. You should always say Mr. Bond. Secondly, you see here, here you cannot put a dot according to UK English. They try to ignore it. American English says that, yeah, Mr. and dot is fine. The reason for that is not having a dot here, or let's say full stop period here, is Mr. spells like this. And MR is created from the first word and the last word. Same goes for doctor. So when you write doctor, it spells like this. And when you create the short form, it is first word, first letter and last letter. Hence, you don't put doctor and a period or a full stop. You always just write dr and that's it in UK English. 
That's why you see I've not put a full stop here or after Mr. So you can write Mr. James or I mean you can write dear James or you can write dear Mr. Bond. Clear? And then in formal you can just directly mention the name like dear um, name of the person you're writing to if you use their name. If you use the relation for example dear brother, dear sister or dear father because you don't write your father's name right? Or your mother's name directly you call them mother father grandpa or whatever so relation will do or dear friend or dear name of the friend this is the first difference second is when you write the first paragraph second difference is in the first paragraph that you write you mention the in your introduction based on the situation and then you write the reason why you're writing the letter by mentioning introduction let's say you're writing a letter to municipality or government you'll mention where are you staying and then you of course you mention your name first and then you write the reason like for an example i'm writing this letter to uh, shed some light on this issue or to praise about something you did whatever the letter asks for but you have to mention your reason in the first paragraph these two things are enough that means you mention your name and tell them what your introduction in context that means i am a customer of this 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 that means in their context introduction and then give the reason why you're writing that same goes for semi-formal no change change will be in informal you don't need to write your introduction in informal isn't it so you're writing a letter to your friend would you say hi my name is this do you remember me of course not so you talk about a previous meeting this way you can connect with them what I mean by previous meeting is, you would say, um, remember last time we met in the cafe, how good time we had, or remember the coffee, or remember the party we had, it was fun. That was previous meeting you discussed. And of course, reason has to be there, because you're writing a letter. Based on the letter, you say, for example, I'm writing this letter in order to do this, this, and that. Clear? Good. Now after that, we have a tone. You know, we have a formal tone in formal letters. We have a formal tone in, in semi-formal letters as well. However, we have informal tone. By formal tone, I mean, you, be ha you have to be a little bit respectful. Secondly, you cannot force things. You cannot say stuff like, you know, funny tone or, you know, funny incident. You have to be very concrete in, in, uh, in your words. Here you can talk about previous incidents and stuff. And, you know, in the paragraphs I'm talking about. So informal tone will be fine in this case. Okay, next difference is you can't ask for exact time if required. Here you can ask for exact time. Here you can ask for any time. What I mean by this, let me give an example. In the case of formals, let's say you have some trouble near your house and you're writing to your uh, government or let's say municipality or anything. And you say, I need to get this solved. This is what happening in near the house. I hope to get it solved soon. In the end, you will write here you can here i mean informal you cannot say i want it done within three days you have to request right that i hope it is getting worked i hope it gets solved soon here in the case of semi-formal what do you do what do you write you write exact time i hope it is done or hope i get my wallet back within two days which i left in the office or left in your hotel or whatever it is so you can ask for exact time friends and family you can write anytime you want you know you're like please come early so that we can do this stuff or that stuff please come early so that we can prepare for the party try to reach at three o'clock you know so that's what i mean in formal letters you cannot ask for exact time in semi-formal and informal you can ask for exact time okay finally the closing where we have to mention you know the signature thing yours faithfully by the way it has to be plural i mean capital i forgot to mention that how do we remember this because here we have your sincerely and then your full name. See, formal starts with F and faithfully starts with F as well. Semi-formal starts with S and sincerely starts with S as well. Simple to remember, right? So formal, faithfully and semi-formal, sincerely. Please write your full name. Don't, don't, don't try to write just one, I mean, no short name, just first name or second name, one do, or surname, one do, write full name. And lastly, that is informal. You can write, you know, kind regards or best regards or, you know, I mean, of course, full name later, but it's up to you. That's it. Enough for you. I mean, regards is also fine. Here, there's no rule because this is informal letter. 
mostly you get formal or semi-formal in exam uh, and in there fa uh, faithfully and sincerely other words okay cool then we have a letter based on purpose what does it mean by purpose i mean purpose means why are you writing this letter what is the question about the purpose we have to define so we have many purposes like six to seven we'll go one by one when you request for information, when you ask for information from somewhere, this is one kind of letter. Let me show you an example. You should write a letter to bank to the bank manager requesting for information about the bank loan. And in your letter, you mention these information. You see, you're requesting for information about the bank loan. One kind of information, one kind of letter you write. All right. Then we have give personal or factual information second purpose you know where you provide personal or factual information about something you provide information your local travel agent recommended a place to visit and you are now having a good time there write a letter to your travel agent tell them the following what you've been doing what you like in this place so you provide information in this rather than asking for information you see the difference this is another kind of letter then we have explain a problem or situation. So let's say we have a problem here and we're going to ask for solving it. You have recently purchased an item from a retail store. Okay. When you return home, you found that you, it did not work. You can sell the customer. You call the customer care about this problem, but did not get any satisfactory response. Now you want, you will explain the situation. You want some action to be taken. So you create, you show the problem and ask for solution. Another kind of letter. Next one is explain wants or needs. You know what you want from this or make a request of something. Let's see an example. We just started a course in college which has no sports, no sports faculties of its own. Write a letter to the manager of the nearest private sports club. In your letter you mention why are you interested in a sport club? You're asking for something. That means for some facility you have, or you want to have. This is called a letter where you ask for something. Okay. Then we have complain about a service. Not the situation, but complain about a service itself. Write a letter to your college administration department complaining about the college facility. This is about complaining about a service. The facilities you're getting is a service, right? So you discuss, you know, what is it happening and what are the trouble you're having. You have to use a complaining tone. I can't believe this is what we received. Whatever it is, right? So you, you said, I don't believe what we have here and all those stuff. Next is making a suggestion or recommend something, right? So what kind of suggestion you can make? Not complaining, but suggestion. You eat at your favorite restaurant every day for lunch. You do not like the decor they have chosen. Write a manager telling them. Um, you see, complaining will be different letter, but you complain. Like, of course, you mention what is the problem, but then you give suggestions. What things you need to be changed and give suggestions. You have to mention mainly on suggestions. It's called, called suggestion letter. Okay. And uh, that was about how letters are based on purpose. Now we're going to see what you must have in a letter. You cannot ignore these things. Otherwise, your letter won't be complete. So let's begin. The first thing you must have is a greeting. Remember, we were discussing dear sir, dear madam and all those stuff. You must have that. Second thing, opening statements. That means your introduction and the reason for writing the letter must have. Explaining the situation based on the letter, which we have seen on purpose. You mentioned, your, you know, explain your situation in paragraph two, because paragraph one was only opening the statement, which was introduction plus problem, and then explaining the problem, explaining the solution, or explaining how you enjoyed something is you have to explain the situation in a different paragraph. Clear? Describe the problem. Like what is the, if there's a problem, describe the problem then as well. You can't just mention the problem. You have to describe it, how it is hindering you, how, what are the troubles you're having, okay? Say, what would you, what would like to happen? That means, let's say there's something happening or let's there's a trouble. What would you like to change, right? They, you also have to mention, you just can't create, you know, mention that there are some troubles or there, there's a situation. What would you like to change? What you would like to happen means, say what you would like to make a change over that place. Then we have a closing statement. Now, closing statements means 
I hope to get this thing done soon or I hope the problem will be solved soon. That is called closing statement. And finally, end of the letter. End of the letter is nothing, just the greeting part. I mean, in the signature part. Dear, uh, yours faithfully, your sincerely. I hope you get my point because I have explained that in the differences, the whole diff you know, the, all these things that you have to mention. But all these things are most important in a letter. Without these, it will be hard for any examiner to check and provide you good grades. So if any trouble, I understand, you can watch the video again or you can ask me in the mail. All right. And that's the end of the chapter. So this is trouble. We'll see how can we uh, lessen the trouble. And second thing, what are the parts that are required to be studied in IELTS speaking? We'll see some examples today as well. And also see some techniques which are not available anywhere online. You'll see by the end that you, yes, I told you the truth. Not anything lying or uh, any trick to keep you in the video. You will learn a lot from this. So see, let's start with the structure of IELTS speaking in short. If you have not seen the introductory video of IELTS, please go to the video. I'll put the link in the description. It'll give you about every module uh, which you need to understand in IELTS. Not just speaking, all of them and basic structure within like 30 to 40 minutes. That will help you to give an introduction of everything, right? Now let's begin with the structure only for speaking a little bit in detail rather than just introductory part, okay? Now IELTS speaking comes on a different day than uh, in all other exams. Let me just tell you what happens in IELTS. We have listening, reading, writing and speaking, all the four modules. These three are taken on a day, let's say 20th of some month. Then this will be taken either anything between 15th to 25th, anything between this, but not on the same day. It will be on, let's say 21 or 16 or anything between that. You, you get my point, right? And in order to make you sure that you know this, they'll write you a mail as well as a message on your phone, not on your WhatsApp, because WhatsApp can be related to internet. So they write you a mail and a message, give you the venue, that means the place that you're gonna write your exam, the time, as well as, time means, and the date itself. So time means at exact what uh, hour, what hour, day, a minute of the moment of the day, you have to be present in the place, right? Now, this is what how uh, I'll speaking has been organized in the module structure, right? Now let me tell you how long it takes for the exam to be over, literally how uh, the exam been taken. They say that it takes 11 to 14 minutes for the exam, overall speaking, but I would say it takes an hour, you know, why? <laughs> because there are 20 people waiting, 20 people waiting uh, in, the, in a queue uh, when you go to the IELTS exam. So you have to wait at least at least half an hour when your chance comes for speaking. You'll go into a room and this is a kind of a semi-formal interview kind of structure. A person will be sitting in a room and he or she will be asking you questions. Could be a person from a native, a native speaker, you know, English speaking country, eight English speaking countries, or could be a person from your same country you are writing IELTS. The person will uh, greet you and then they start with part one of the speaking. So yeah, it could take an hour, but uh, conceptually speaking, when the start, test starts, it'll take you 11 to 14 minutes total. Now, how is this time divided in parts? Let me just go through all of that. IELTS speaking is divided in three different parts. Each part has type of questions, types of question, and also time set in them. So let's start with part one. Part one consists of a question which are introductory. Remember, it's not intro, but introductory question. By introductory, I mean, they'll be all about you. For example, where do you, so remember this you or your is the key here. And uh, they generally last for uh, not more than four to five minutes is the time for this thing four to five minutes, and you're supposed to speak around three to four sentences, right? So somebody, if they ask you questions like, uh, what is your favorite fruit? So you would answer not like directly, my favorite fruit is apple. 
you'll say um, my favorite fruit is apple and the reason could be because I like the taste I like the texture as well and I tried it once when I was a kid and I couldn't get a hang of it so basically more longer answer right not a single word, uh, word answer or single sentence answer of course I'll tell you the tricks to how to get the answers long but for now let's try to understand the structure in here this will be a card task that means they will provide you a card and you're supposed to speak on that card. You will get one minute to prepare and two minutes to speak. So this will be your speaking time. And this won't be a conversation. Earlier was a conversation in part one. Somebody asking you a question and you're giving reply. So this was supposed to be a conversation. This is supposed to be a monologue. Now monologue, I mean that they say, oh, this is your card. You have one minute. Please prepare. We'll give you a paper and a pencil. Take notes as much as you want within one minute and you can speak. So that will be around two minutes of speaking continuously. Sometimes they extend it a little bit, five minutes, uh, five seconds, 10 seconds here and there. So the total time for this task is three, I mean, three to four minutes. Remember, this is four to five minutes. And the part three is again, a follow-up type. So basically they will ask question from this card Whatever the topic is, the topic could be something like um, describe a seminar you have attended recently. So you have to describe. Describe two people from the same family you know. Or describe a picnic you have been recently. Or could be describe an article which you find interesting uh, in a newspaper. So whatever question is, your follow-up question will be connected to that topic. For example, it could be um, how famous it is in your country to read newspapers. right? And this would last for four to five minutes. The number of questions will be similar, same here, like seven to eight questions will be asked and you're supposed to speak a little bit longer than the first part. Okay. It's not the same length. So instead of three to four sentences, you speak four to five sentences. Okay. A little bit in length. The only difference is here, you were the main topic here. General questions will be asked. Like, why is this famous in your country? Or, uh, what, what is the reason for this thing or whatever? So general question, don't worry, I'll, I'll show you the questions once. So this will also be a conversation, not a monologue. So this is how the whole IELTS speaking has been organized. Now I'll take you to uh, the types of question you might get in part one, part two, part three on the other screen that is on the, uh, on the PPT screen. Do you like studying? Well, I do like studying per se, but not the way I used to love it when I was in school. So at that time it was to, it used to be a compulsion that I have to study and eventually I liked it, but now I don't really, I like to work. I like to create new things. I like to teach right now instead of studying. Sometimes it involves studying. I mean, when you don't know the topic, you have to get into deeper and then you study, but not really the way I used to do that earlier. Wonderful. We are back now. You understood what kind of question you need to answer. And I also give some demo answers over there. So let's go through now. What are the criteria that are important? Remember, please, most of the people online or most books don't talk about criteria as they consider them not important in my eyes. And any teacher who understands IELTS, criteria are the most important thing to understand. Because it's like rules, okay? These are the rules the, with which they will be guiding you. They were testing your score. If you are the person who don't understand criteria, you'll be struggling where to work on. For example, if you play football and you know if you score more goals than the other person, you'll win. But I know the, sc I know the criteria <laughs> and criterion, and you don't know that, right? You have to know that. So I, I know how to win. You have no idea how to win at least. So that's why we need to know the criteria and there are four or total. So let's talk about these four criteria. By the way, criteria is plural, singular is criterion. Okay. Let's start with the number one. Number one is called uh, coherence. 
and fluency. Coherence and fluency is the first one. Let's discuss coherence first and then we'll discuss the fluency part. What happens in coherence is how structured your speech is. Does is it making sense to other person who is listening? Is it easy to understand? That is what we call a coherent speech. Let me give an example so that you understand from the context. So let's say there's a, there's a hotel being started recently close to my place and I'm writing, I'm giving a speech on the hotel. So what will I say? Um, there's a hotel that is just open recently. Uh, it is close to my place. Uh, they want to be famous. So they're throwing a party. Okay, simple. Now I just threw information after information. Remember, this was just information. This was not a proper speech with a lot of connection in there. So what I need to do is create a proper speech with structure. Now look at the difference. Okay. Uh, there's a new restaurant or a hotel new open close to my place. And as they want to be famous, they are throwing a party. They might become popular from that. Done. So you understand the whole speech, how different it was from the earlier one. I'm just giving a simple example to make you what coherence is. Okay. Now we understand what is the meaning of the next one that is fluency. Fluency is something that how, um, how, what is your pace of speaking? How easy it is for you to speak, not easy to understand how easy it is for you to speak in that language, right? Without any hums or, or any uh, stopping in the middle, right? Or hours, you're not think, thinking for a long, you're not taking long pauses to think. That's what important is. That is fluency. Are you having intonation in your speech and all those things count in fluency. So it's a big deal. And in my eye or in my opinion, fluency is the biggest factor in your IELTS speaking. It's fine if you have a little bit less of vocabulary, but if fluency is good, you will get better score for sure. Remember that. Work on this rather than other things. Okay. Wonderful. We look at the next one. <clears throat> the next one is lexical resource. Let's see the next one. Lexical resource. Now lexical resources means what kind of now lexical resource itself consists of three different things. I'll take care of them here just now. Wait a second. Lexical resource has three things in them. Number one is what is the quality of vocabulary you have? So vocabulary quality. I'll discuss what is the quality means. Second thing, are you using synonyms? And finally, are you using appropriately? Not anywhere, everywhere. Let's see all of the three things together and understand what is the meaning of this. Without this, you cannot score well in the part of lexical resource. Vocabulary quality, it comes from the level. So you have to understand what is A1, A2, B1, B2, C1 and C2. These are Sefer system. These are grades created by Sefer. Sefer is common European, uh, common European uh, framework for reference of languages. And the higher the level, the higher the fluent the language. So let's say a simple word like man or woman could lie between A1 and A2. But a higher fundamentally might be here anywhere. Basically might be B1 or B2 level. So the higher quality word you use, the better you get. Now how to recognize what level it is, first of all. Go to, your, go to Google and search Cambridge Dictionary. Okay, when you search Cambridge Dictionary, you search any word in the dictionary. For the first link, link will be Cambridge Dictionary. You search any word. When you search any word, below that you will find anything written out of these. And you can recognize what is the level of the words. Okay, that will help you to recognize what words you are using every day. Record yourself, find out how many words you're using, which words you're using. And if you want a list of words which are essential for your speaking, don't worry, I'm producing, I'm starting another video in which you will get all the essential words you require for IELTS. But not here, because if I try to do it here, it will take a long time for us to finish the video. And I don't want that. This is already going to be one hour video, maybe something like that. One hour class will be enough for sure. So the vocabulary will be covered in different video completely. And there are around 1200 words, which according to me are important. 
okay so remember that please follow that uh, this channel and you will get uh, to understand what videos we need for vocabulary right that was this quality let's talk uh, i think i shouldn't have erased it second comes synonym synonym means um you cannot use one word again and again you know for example i just give an example basically next time when you're using basically instead of use fundamentally instead of that you use normally or generally whatever but don't use same words again and again even for word like child you say a kid when using man and a woman again and again say the other gender please use synonyms that shows that you know words right that is synonym. that is synonym part and number three appropriate usage i'll explain you in the in the example see uh, if you think about it you have a lot of synonyms for example the meaning of good could be um pleasant could be um blessed all are the meaning of good but when we when do we use good when do we use pleasant when do we use blessed is completely different right so for an example you are about to have an accident and you were saved you won't use good you would use blessed you would say oh i feel blessed because i was saved not i feel good right you wake up in the early morning you feel good probably right and after a long journey and you come home you feel pleasant or somebody helps you with something you feel pleasant so using appropriately all the vocabulary is another part that is third one for lexical resource you cannot think that i know vocabulary that means i have good chances of getting good score in this criterion okay remember that please now comes number 3 number 3 is grammar or grammatical range and accuracy what is the meaning of this grammatical range and accuracy both first of all your grammar is supposed to be as correct as possible you cannot have incorrect grammar what do i mean by that let me just give an example okay these two words are important for us range and accuracy think about it when i say my name r x y z it's incorrect because we know it's here so this is accuracy you used incorrect grammar right now thinking about it think about the the range we have have you ever thought about that you use only simple sentences you don't use complex and compound sentences you don't use all the tenses properly you you don't even combine tenses like future present and all those stuff what then what going to happen you going to have trouble with your own uh, speech i mean with your own grammatical range here so both things are important accuracy and range okay wonderful we'll see there will be a different video for grammar these two, two things will have a different video for them uh, you'll have a lot of the vocabulary and whatever grammar uh, grammar rules we need to discuss we'll be discussing that video okay reaching there number 4 number 4 is your pronunciation pronunciation is important because it shows how good you understand the native english and how you say it out loud right because some people might not be able to understand if your pronunciation is incorrect don't please mess it up with accents accents are different thing it's not accent here we are discussing here is the pronunciation pronunciation is how do you pronounce each word for sorry let's say for example um word like this most of you might be saying photography it's incorrect you have to say photography right because t o is emphasized right recognize which part is of the whole word or the whole sentence has been stressed you cannot understand this thing without understanding english as a language english is a stress time language remember that stress time language means each syllable has no set time it can be stress it can be less so it's not time set here only thing is stress set so you might think what does it mean uh, go through it search what is english as stress timed language okay and each word has a word stress middle or somewhere else 
So that you have to understand to understand the pronunciation. And these four are your uh, criteria for understanding how speaking has been organized or how speaking takes place in your part. Okay. Remember that without these, you cannot score well, right? So understanding these was the first thing that you should do while going through speaking. And I think we did. If any doubt, please write in the comments. Don't worry, there's a lot coming still. Now comes a um, thing which most of you might have, and it is fear of speaking. Now, what is this fear? It could be anything. See, all of us has different experience. You could have stayed in a school where not many activities have been organized or could be a family of very calm people. Don't they don't talk much? I'm not saying they're wrong, but yeah, that's fine. And or you could be have friends who are also very calm. They don't talk much or you could you were not encouraged to speak more. Right. So it could be a reason that you don't speak much and you don't practice that skill. So these could all reach to fear and none of was none was your mistake. But how to recognize this? First of all, see, I using a lot of uh, uh, um. Second thing, whenever someone uh, better than you, like higher in uh, studies or qualification or age comes in front of you and you stumble or somebody testing you, then you stumble, you have fear. How to get it out? In order to understand, Now, in order to get out of this simple, first of all, let's do an exercise or oh, let's understand how IELTS speaking uh, has been organized when you go in the room. When you go in the room, the first thing IELTS examiner will do is ask your name. Then they will ask for your passport and they will ask you to sit them. It takes almost around five and um, five to 15 seconds. And then they ask you, can we start recording? the whole test, the whole three parts, that that is the starting of the exam. Before that, these things are not graded. Remember that. And this is the perfect time you to get out of your fear. This is what I ask students and they do it well and they understand it. What I mean by that, when they ask your name, it's fine to fumble some things. It's fine. You say, uh, um, my name is this or my name is that and you fumble a bit. Okay. But once you come up after that, you start getting a little bit less stress on passport. They ask you, what is your passport? Instead of speaking, let's say, oh, I have it here. There you go. Now keep saying to yourself, I'm fine. I'm fine. It's like five to 10 second rule. You don't worry much then. Okay. Then comes sitting part. Once you sit there, start feeling when you're sitting, nothing can be done. Now I will be all fine. By this point, you will have no worries at all. Okay, and you will be clear what you need to do. So these three steps will help you to get out of all the fear you have. You say to yourself, I cannot do anything now. Whatever question come to me, I'll answer. This is the only thing I have. Uh, it has worked for me. Otherwise, changing your fear has to change everything or get into new things in practice. That will take a lot of time. If you have that, wonderful. If don't, try this technique. It might work for you. Okay. Now let's understand each part and try to get some techniques to get uh, clear about one part and another. So first I'll go through part one. In part one of speaking, you are asked introductory questions. That means you will be, uh, they will be asking about you and you're supposed to speak around three to two to three or three to four sentences, not much. How would you answer such question where you know the answer could be given in one sentence or one word even? For example, what is your favorite fruit? You're going to be like, what, what should I speak now? I cannot speak more than that. In that case, or sometimes we are stuck with one kind of rhythm. Somebody asks you, what's your favorite fruit? And you say, my favorite fruit is this because of this reason. Somebody asks you, um, what is your favorite vehicle? And you say, my favorite vehicle is this. And we keep giving reasons remember that keeping giving reasons will be like you don't know anything apart from giving reasons to your answer if they ask you why in the end it's understandable but keeping uh, reasons all the time with you 
is not the right thing. It will be like a monotone uh, speaking, you know, conversation. If I ask you, how are you doing? I'm doing great because of this, right? So what we have to do is figure out a method. Okay, the method says that we need to have more than three, two things. The second thing is you add detail to your answer. Or you connect time, that is past or future to your answer. I'll explain everything. I'll, I'll go through one of them. I mean, e each of them with answering. So for example, let's say this one. What is your favorite fruit? I'll say my favorite fruit is pineapple and the reason is I love the taste, especially the bitter and sour taste in it. I've tried it once and I loved it. I cannot go away from it. Details. Instead of this, I could give answer for detail. For example, uh, my favorite fruit is pineapple and I cannot stay away from it at least twice a week I need it. Sometimes I drink juice or sometimes just slice it off and eat it. I know it's very hard to peel it, but who cares? I love it. I do it. There you go. I didn't give it any reason why I love it, right? I just love it. Past or future, I used to like it earlier. I mean, the fruit, whatever I say. I like used to like pineapple earlier, but because of too much, you know, every week, I get bored of it. So now I like apples and they have health reason as well. So why not? There you go. Sometimes we combine things. For example, we add reasons and past and future. I used to like it for this reason, but I stopped it for other reason and I'm starting to like other things for this reason. Sometimes we combine this. We talk about past with details. So these three things should be incorporated. I'm not saying you use all of them at a time, but use different things at different moment, right? If you keep giving reasons, you will be in trouble later. It'll sound really boring, okay? So keep changing that for all the answers you have. Wonderful. So you understand how part one is being organized how you can answer such things. Now comes weird questions in part one that you might find a little bit difficult to answer. What I mean by difficult to answer is, what is your, who is your favorite writer? In that case, you are stuck. You feel that, what will I answer in such questions when I have no idea who, I don't even read books, right? What will you do in this situation? Give a false name? Yeah, you're 50% right, but instead of false name, why don't you give a real name but false identity? For example, use your family in that case. Like, my favorite, uh, my favorite writer is my mom. And because she is not famous worldwide, but in my city, she's pretty famous. Last time she sold around 1000 books a week. And uh, our favorite, my favorite book from mom is this. And you describe your mom. I know pretty sure about how to describe your mom. And you can make it up like how she writes book at night or day, anything. So use your family when you're stuck with questions. Or any question comes up with what is your favorite book or a novel. What was the last novel you read? Make it up that my mom write a book. It's not famous, but I read it like this. And it is about this. Done. Simply understand that you can make it up story. But remember, don't make fake stories based on real people. Only family can be considered in this because they don't know, they cannot search it. You have to make it clear. It's not famous online, only in my city or only in my area. Right? Wonderful. That is one thing you have to understand. Great. So this kind of questions can be tackled by this way. One more thing, you can ask for extra time when you are stuck or you don't understand the question, but remember, you cannot pass. How to do that? You say, hmm, interesting question. Remember with that tone, okay? Hmm, interesting question. I never thought about it. Can I get a few seconds? That is fine, of course, because you show that you can ask for time in English with proper sentences. That is also a skill of speaking. And they'll give you, yes, fine, take three to five seconds and then speak, right? So what if uh, you're out of sentence, you can say, hmm, I, I think I need to think about it. Let me just give me a few seconds and done. Or another way or when you're stuck or uh, apart from that, you can do one more thing. You can think while you're speaking simple sentences. For example, you say, my favorite fruit is apple that takes five seconds to speak this sentence itself. In that meanwhile, you can think of the next sentence. So when you're speaking simple sentences, Think of the next sentence. For example, my favorite fruit is apple. And I was thinking the reasons. 
or the details or when did I start eating and when was the last time I ate the apple. So this is how you think when you are stuck. I told you how to get content. I told you what kind of question you, uh, what kind of question you might be imposed with and how to answer such questions. Okay, I'll display the questions again on the screen, which we saw earlier for part one. Fine, so that you understand what how part one questions can be. Wonderful, we are back. Now comes part two. Part two. It's a little bit different than part one. I think you remember that earlier. We saw that part two is all about longer speeches rather than short. So this will be around one minute of preparation time and two minutes of speaking. So it will be a speech kind of structure, right? You cannot uh, stop in the middle. They'll give you a paper and a topic. What kind of topic I'll show you in the initial part and think about it and most important is this one minute okay remember that the only thing that happens is most people get out of content for speaking for two minutes they cannot speak for a long time because they don't know what to speak or even if they do what happens is they start speaking in a random order so i might might start speaking about one thing let's say the first point in my speech and jump to any other point, let's say fifth point, which is supposed to be making good speech, but fifth point here. And then I jump to the second point, which is supposed to be like this, and then this, and then this, and then here. So my speech should be one, two, three, four, five. In for instance, my speech should be one, will be one, five, and then somewhere else. The, there, are two uh, there are two problems with this kind of speech. First of all, you will not be structured. Second of all, you might miss some of the parts in the middle. Let's say, for example, describe a seminar you attended recently. What are you going to do in that case? You're going to get stuck because you started with directly the name of the seminar. How to get a lot of content and how to create a flow. These are the two problems for part two kinds of questions, right? The first one is how to get a lot of content. And second thing, how to create a flow. That is the fluidity in your speech, like a story, right? Two methods, actually three methods that are important here. We'll see three of them and try to understand these are very important. They will help you to speak clearly and with a lot of grace. The first one is called brainstorming. Brainstorming is very simple but very powerful. Brainstorming is when you ask yourself question. What? Why? Where? When? How? All these questions, even more, with who, right? When you ask these questions, you get some answers from it, right? For example, what was the seminar about? You write the seminar's name or the seminar's, whatever it was about. Why was the seminar being organized? Or why did you go there in the first place? Is why. Where was the seminar organized? When was it organized? How was the seminar overall? And with whom did you go? These kind of question might be in your brain, but they might not come until you don't write them. So please go into a question that is given a preparation sheet for one minute time. Write these questions quickly and get the answers. Once you get the answers here, what comes next is called noun and adjective method. Now, what does it mean by that? Noun and adjective method says that once we have done this all this why and when, We'll get some nouns, for example, the person name you with whom did you go, the place, the place which had this seminar organized and um, the name of the seminar itself, the technology or whatever the topic was in seminar, the vehicle with which you go for the seminar, every noun. And now in the case of adjective, you keep drawing arrows and think of all the adjectives connected uh, to the noun. For example, what was, what was the person like? What was the place like? Topic was good or bad or long or whatever short. Seminar, where was it conducted or place? So stuff like that. So you keep adding adjective to the noun. Once you have that and earlier part, I know it's a lot of stuff. It will take a lot of practice to finish this within one minute. Now you have one more thing remaining. This was all getting content. 
Now remaining was a method to create a flow. This method was created by me after a long research and this is called a timeline method to create a flow. Timeline method says like this, if you have a timeline where you can set your content in order to speak in a flow where first one comes is called concept. Second one, don't worry, I'll, I'll explain everything. It's called planning. Third one is called the thing. And the fourth one is called feelings or your feedback. Right. The first one, concept. Why did you go there in the first place? You have to give reasons. For example, describe a picnic you have been. And instead of giving the name of the picnic, which should be coming here, you start from here. Oh, it has been like two months I didn't go out and because of my work I was getting bored to hell and I needed that change. So I decided to go on picnic on with my family. Done. Planning is how did you do that? That means um, we started early in the morning, it was far away and hence we have to get a lot of packaging done one night before that. Uh, it took us around three hours and on the way we did this and that. Not yet the thing. You're not describing the picnic yet, but you're connecting all the stuff with the main thing. Here you describe what you did in the picnic. So what did you do in that picnic? How was the picnic like? And everything you describe in here. And finally comes, how do you feel? Right? How do you feel about the picnic? Would you recommend others to go to that place? I'm not saying always positive. You can say negative like, mm, I didn't like that place. That was a wastage of money. Or it was amazing. I would recommend anyone to go there. Okay? So this is how we make our speech in a concept. Now, how all these whys and hows and whats and how you feel come from both of these. Whatever words you got earlier, you use them. And remember, everything is recorded, but not video recorded, audio recorded, and hence you can look into your paper and speak. Nobody can stop you in that case. Remember that, okay? I would suggest you keep the paper always, but not look at it because you want to have a conversation kind of speech. See, right now I'm speaking uh, in front of the board, but I'm speaking as if I'm talking to you because I have a lot of practice. I've been doing this a lot. So it same thing you have to do. You have to practice a lot as if you're talking to one person. Right? And there you will be talking to the person, the earlier person, but still some of us, when we look at the paper, we try to emit, we just try to read it out. We don't do that, okay? Just create this draw, draw this line and you make these points. And you know what to speak in which flow. If you talk directly about the things, think about it, the content will be over like this. If we start from concept to plan to the thing and then feeling, it'll take a long time to get it over. One more thing that can help you to understand is your pace. Please speak a little bit slower. If you speak too fast, you need a lot of content to finish within two minutes, right? If you speak a little bit slow, that means you need half of the content. If your pace is half, of course. So that saves a lot of time and a lot of content. You can have the best content and speak about it. Remember, your pace is important for another reason. Your fluency. Pace can influence fluency as well. How? When I speak too fast, what happens is I my brain forgets what I was talking about. And then suddenly mm, things come into picture because brain has to process what did you speak about. And that creates a trouble for my speech. There is fluency, lack of fluency. And nobody likes to speak with lack of fluency, right? They want a fluent speech. Wonderful. Now you understand why pace is important for two reasons. First of all, your content will be less required if you speak slowly or normally. Second thing, your fluency won't be uh, in trouble because you're speaking slow, you can think at that time. If you're speaking too fast, please lower the speed. And how do you know this is going bad? Please record your voice. This will help you a lot. Trust me, I have seen many people doing that and I have done myself and it did help me. Like, mm, I, th I thought I was speaking pretty well, but no, I was pretty bad. And some people who feel they're pretty bad, but when they record, they say, this is good. I thought I'm really bad in speaking. I know we all hate our voices, but come on, give it a try. You will understand a lot of stuff about yourself. So using techniques and practicing a lot will be also things. So I might give you 10% of support, but 90% of things has to be done by you. Okay, 90% will be done by you. 10% I'm giving you just a push 
and techniques that are required in speaking and, the, and all the structure that is required in IELTS. Without your 90% support, you cannot score well, period. No other reason for people to get less score is this. They might get good teacher, the 10% 10, 10 support, but then sometimes teachers are pushing, so they reach you, make you reach here. Sometimes people are not even reaching here, so how can they reach here? Please start working now. Set at least one hour in a day to start working on your speech, on your English, on the structure of IELTS. Without that, you cannot score. I hope you are taking notes while watching these videos. If not, watch these videos within five slots. Watch it again and again or watch it slowly like 15 minutes, 20 minutes a day and then take notes and stop from there and come next day and start from there. Get, set a schedule that I'll be watching this from here to here this tomorrow. I'll be putting um, timestamps below in the description so that I can tell you which part is starting of which part. For example, if you click on the timestamp, you'll be starting with part one, timestamp part two. So that was the end of part two. Okay, we'll start with part three. Part three is in my opinion, it's very easy actually. Part three is very similar to part one. The only thing is, it's not about you. It's about general public. Second thing is um, it's, it should be a little bit longer, a little bit more descriptive rather than um, normal stuff about you, okay? Because the question is something like this. Uh, in part one could be, what is weather like in your country, your, and here, uh, how do people feel about the weather? Right, how people in, are influenced their, their behavior by weather. So it's about people, it's general. So that is why part three is different. And second thing, it's about the card or the task you've been receiving, received in part two. That's the major difference in part one and part three. But of course, it's a conversation again. Similarly, what we see in, um, in part one. So you have to converse with the person who is uh, going through it. Remember this thing, okay? This is the only difference uh, we have. Now I'm gonna uh, show you the examples which I've shown you earlier in part three because there's not much to speak. You can also have this details, reasons, and um, past or future connected in your answer again, but past or future of everyone, not just you, uh, so that you can understand how it is being organized. But I'll show you some examples on the screen so that you, and an answer as well, answer them as well for you so that you understand how they are being answered, right? Let me just show you now. Wonderful, and we are back. Now we wanna understand a few things here and there that you have to work on. The first thing that you have to work on is your vocabulary. Why vocabulary? Because remember the three things that you have to understand. The quality of the vocabulary, the synonyms, and the appropriate uses. All of the things we'll see in the video separately. You have to work on your grammar because I know most of us are weak in grammar. So various things, you know, the range, the accuracy, and apart from that, what part is required? So we don't have to study a whole grammar for that. There are some certain parts which are important for us. Without that, we cannot score well. So that also we will see. And finally, most importantly, the structure of IELTS. Without understanding the criteria, we cannot score well in IELTS. These two things, structure, IELTS, structure, criteria, vocabulary, and grammar, these four things will help you to score pretty well. And if you have a fear, it is in the middle because nobody can change that. The only person who can change your fear is you. Okay, and this by a simple thing called practice. Go out, talk to people, meet new people, or you know, ask your family to help you. Open up, I know there's something called sh being shy, or something there's a, there's a fear of uh, um, complex, you know, superiority or um, inferiority complex. Could be anything. So what I want you to do is get over it because your target is the bands that you need and connect everything with your motive or your feelings for certain. I know you're not working hard for money or bands. You're working hard for one thing. And one thing are emotions. 
your emotions are important these these things are very powerful for example you want to go abroad so that you can have a better life with your partner or you want to go abroad because you um, are a person who is not liking here so keep that powerful keep that in your mind when you're practicing you will practice even harder okay what i want you to do is keep that in mind while studying that will help you a lot getting out of the fear but of course some technicality has to be first of all vocabulary grammar structure and the criteria four of the things will help you understand the uh, structure or let's say the the mechanical part that is we cannot ignore them this thing has to be emotional connected but these things are you know target based we have to finish this much and that much two things i'll cover in the videos two things i already covered in this video these two will be separate videos in this video you will understand everything you need to understand ielts grammar that means the grammar that you need to understand and get clear for ielts now there's nothing like ielts for grammar and there are no books specific books for that apart from a cambridge book but there are certain rules that you need to understand because grammar is huge and i have learned grammar myself in school and it's boring to hell that reason could be your teacher is has been teaching the subject and you have been studying it as subject as well for score second reason could be uh, you are studying from a single book right and finally it could be that you started studying language as grammar you know instead of understanding the language first and seeing why we do that and why we speak that way so don't worry about that i will be covering everything you need for um, the grammar part as well as the ielts part and the best uh, i mean the good news here is you don't have to study the whole grammar because it's really huge i mean the amount of grammar it is in english we have to read some part of it so what part of grammar we need to study we'll see soon don't worry about that there are certain concepts like eight to nine concepts that we have to clear once we are done with that you're done by the way i'm satendra and you're watching ielts academy let's start with the first concept it's called parts of speech everywhere they start with this concept in a book in a video and i think it's they are right in their sense because this is like how you categorize each word in a sentence for example if you write a sentence here let me just write the one sentence i am coming home each word is a category like for example i is a personal pronoun this is a verb coming again a verb and home is a noun so in here everything can be categorized every word can be categorized based on this part of speech there are eight of them and we'll try to understand all of them like eight of uh, the part of speech let's start the most basic one and the most common one and that is number one called noun noun i think you're pretty clear with noun is a name of a place or a person or a thing for example it could be car boy girl there are plenty kinds of noun but for now understand that and i think you must be clear about that as well that noun is the name of a person place or thing okay so let's say the name of a thing or a feeling even is a noun second thing is a pronoun a word which i can use instead of a noun is called a pronoun for example he she it sometime you might not have noticed but that as well is a pronoun for example um i'm using table i mean i mean which could be a pronoun as well like that which is dirty right same thing for that when you use it instead of some phrase or word it can be said as pronoun okay number 3 is adjective the reason i use these three first because they are connected to each other like a noun can be enhanced or being given information or can be qualified with an adjective for example if i say a car is a noun and in that case i would say a small car is an adjective because it qualifies the car it says what is what about the car it's huge or small whatever it is so adjective qualifies a noun remember that part okay wonderful now i'm going to clear this all we'll go to the fourth but they are a little bit connected so we go with connected ones all right next we have number 4 and it's called adverb i mean i mean verb sorry not adverb first verb is anything that you do action for example to sit to lie to sleep to talk to study what you're doing right now is to listen now this two is infinite form if i want to say listening that is progressive form but 
these actions are the verbs okay <clears throat> now comes how can we qualify these verbs like for noun we had adjectives right now for verbs we have adverbs these adverbs qualify the verb for example how am i riding i'm riding slowly how is the person dancing he or she is dancing beautifully so all these words which ending e gen le generally le for your knowledge le is enough to understand what adverbs are they qualify the verb there's one more thing that is remaining sometimes they also qualify adjectives are uh, you know in our primary school or in our school we never studied that but they do for example um utterly wrong in that utterly correct or completely correct in that case completely or completely wrong as well completely is an adverb and adjective is wrong so adverb also qualifies not just the verb but also the adjectives remember that part for now don't worry we will describe later what these adverb adjectives are together for but for now remember what adverbs are they qualify the verb and also sometimes adjectives okay moving ahead i'll just clear it out and we go to the fifth sixth one sixth one is called preposition preposition are to show position or location for example you might have heard on in under above below all these things are prepositions other things are not connected so i'm teaching you one by one all you might have also used across or um under all right anything of these which is giving you position or location of anything is preposition now the seventh one the seventh one is called conjunction well the word itself helps us to make it clear the meaning so conjunctions are the words which are junctioning something that is combining something together so anything that combines two phrases or two sentences or two um clauses or two words even are conjunction for example and but though right or anything of these words are called conjunctions right now finally comes which we generally don't use in writing the eighth one and hence you might not remember that one and number eighth is interjection interjections are the words which are used to express your feeling this is by the way are my handwriting is hor horrible honestly sometimes i don't even understand it interjection are the words that you use to show your feelings all right using some words for example uh, you say oh no and then you put explanation and you write a whole sentence sometimes you say oh gosh or sometimes you say when you look at something ugly in the food say yuck i don't want to eat that food so these words are called interjection and generally explanation mark is always placed over there so i hope you get an idea what interjections are great these words the parts parts of speech and they help you to figure out the category in a sentence right but what is coming next that is number 2 is the sentence type and the sentence structure so we understood the parts of some sentences but when we look at a sentence a sentence has three things and after two out of out of the three things two are mandatory so when we form a sentence the number one thing that is essential is the subject number two that is essential is the verb these two are mandatory in any sentence and number three is the object even the shortest sentence in the world in english is i am now if you look at that it has a subject and a verb am is a verb okay so any subject will have these two and sometimes also object okay now there are three kinds of or uh, four kinds of sentences these are the parts of sentences but kinds are different these kinds if i tell you one of them you will figure out what are the other kind possible the types of sentences are number 1 simple sentence you must have heard of it right simple sentences are the sentences which has a single clause in them now what are you thinking what is the meaning of clause a clause is a collection of a single uh, a single clause has a single subject and a verb now that now then what is the difference between sentence and a clause so when we write a sentence it makes full sense but clause generally doesn't make full sense it does sometime okay so when i say if i am not 
feeling well see this is not a full sentence but it is a clause because it is subject and it is verb done so this is a clause but not a sentence any simple sentence is a sentence which has a single clause and it makes full sense as well any sentence which you speak generally like hi how are you is a simple sentence I mean, hi, or is a question. I'm doing fine is a simple sentence. Okay. Second kind is, you might have heard of it. Compound sentence. Now, what are compound sentence? The third kind could be, I think you remember that complex sentence, right? From the compound word itself, it comes in clear. It's compound, uh, complex sentence. Now, what are these things? If I ask you the difference, you might say, oh, this is more complex and this is not. These are the difference we have been making from our childhood because in our school, we were being asked like write the types of sentences and we say, okay, these are the types. Well, the fourth one we'll discuss later, but we don't know the real the meaning between these. If you don't know the real meaning, how can we use them? So today I'm going to make it clear what is the meaning between, I mean, the difference between these. Okay, let's start with compound sentence. But in order to understand compound sentence, what we have to understand is the dependency. So, dependent and independent sentence. Right. <clears throat> so, any sentence which is dependent on other sentence or the clause is called dependent sentence. Doesn't make any sense. Let me write you a sentence so that you make it clear. When I say though, I am weak i will win and here you see that this one this sentence if i if i completely hide it okay if i completely hide it this one will make sense this is a full sentence by itself i will win is a full sentence but if i if i hide i will win though i am weak is not complete is not making full sense this sentence is depending on the other one that is called dependency. It is dependent on another part. Now, in the case of independent one, I can write instead of though, I say, I am going now and I will be back soon. So if I say this way, both of the sentences, I'm going now, I will be back soon, even with and I will be back soon, making full sense. I mean, without, even if you remove one part, next one is making full sense. And even we are not changing the meaning of it, right? That is called independent sentence. And when a sentence consists of two parts, which are independent of each other, it is called compound. So remember the word, if we have a sentence with two parts in it or two clauses in it, and one of the clauses is independent, on another I mean, it's not dependent on anything that is compound how do i remember that because complex is a short spelling then compound hence it is independent this one and dependent this one because independent spelling is longer than dependent one that's how i remember it now in the case of complex sentence if one of them has to be uh, a dependent on another word so how again we, we never think about are we using dependency or not dependency so there must be something that helps us and that something is called coordinating conjunctions in a, instead of using the word coordinating conjunctions i'm gonna say just conjunctions which are used for compound sentences and these conjunctions can be remembered using a short form which is called fan boys you're thinking what what is this funny thing it's really very uh, helpful because if you're using any of these, you're making compound sentences. So let me just help you here. It's called for and nor but or yet and so. I'm repeating again. Take notes please right now. It is required for and nor but or yet so if you're using any of these which are called coordinating conjunctions you're forming compound sentences okay now moving ahead we have complex sentences complex sentences as i said earlier are formed when we have one dependent clause and another one is independent so if i write i wrote the sentence earlier as well if i write um 
though it is raining or although it is raining i will be going home if i am doing this i won't be doing that so if i'm doing this is dependent on another part if i don't tell you the another part it will be incomplete so that is complex sentence and the words which are used in complex sentence are called subordinating conjunctions earlier we have coordinating conjunctions these are called subordinating conjunctions that means the words they are combining together and we have plenty of them i'm going to write a, a link in the description which will be a pdf of these okay examples could be although which i just used earlier although or though as because hence right these are some of the kinds that we can use we have until when whenever for complex sentences now come the fourth part fourth one is actually um funny because they combine both of them so they say complex compound or or compound complex that means i have to have a single dependence phrase clause and three independent are fine that will become complex compound and whatever i put first based on that there's a name see trust me you never use this and we don't have to because the sentence in speaking becomes too lengthy and in writing we if we write very long sentences we make mistakes so these two are full fully fine enough trust me they will be fine with this part okay now when we are studying grammar there's another thing that comes to uh, into the light why are we also studying though it is see there are two other reasons why are we studying grammar okay the first one is ielts stands for international english language testing system after after all it is english language testing system right so there is a language in there and we in a language without rules doesn't work without grammar it doesn't work so we have to understand for that reason second in writing and speaking they have clearly said for the criteria so one of the criteria is gra and gra stands for grammatical range and accuracy so how accurate your grammar is that means it's correct and what kind of range you are using okay so for example are you using compound sentences are you using complex sentences do you know what collocations are do you know how tenses work this is being explained in grammar i mean this is being expected in your writing and speaking so this is grammatical range and accuracy they have told you clearly this is a criteria so please remember it's important for us to study we cannot ignore it i so far in my career i have seen most people try to ignore it even in classes big coachings they say ah oh, grammar is not important important other tips grammar is it, it holds a lot of um, you know risk if we don't study it okay now let's start with something called active and passive voice this is also important active and passive voice why it is important i'll tell you in a while but let's try to understand it first of all <clears throat> whenever a subject does or takes the action then it is called active voice so example could make it even more clearer for example let's say i gave him a book all right instead of that if i say he was given a book by me it becomes passive so when i say he was given a book by me right this is called passive when the action is not being performed by the subject but action is performed on the subject okay subject will be coming on the back object will be first here right great so this is active and this is passive now when to use this passive because active is generally what we use every day i am doing this i am doing that always i will be here the subject will be in front when do we use this passive thing you must be thinking why to elongate the sentence and make it so hard think about it when you don't know what the subject is when you have no idea what the subject is you use the passive for example yesterday there was a robbery or there was a theft and who did it no one knows so you would say the bank was robbed you wouldn't say he or she robbed the bank you say the bank was robbed right so when i say the the check was sent i have no idea who sent the check 
So when I have no idea about the subject, I use passive. Remember that point. Whenever you have no idea about the subject, you do it. So you don't know who was involved in the corruption or in the case. You say this was being corrupted. This was being told. But who told it? You don't know. Remember, no subject, passive. Or when you don't want to give emphasis on the subject, when you know the subject is of no use, use passive, please. Okay? So this is the main thing that you have to remember always. What is coming next is really important. Really important means you can understand whole English grammar. In fact, the whole English language from this, but we never studied this. And it is called collocation. Collocation is a term that is used to show that a word or phrase that is often used together, okay, and it is making sense together. Now, for example, when I say uh, fast cars, okay, now if you think of the synonyms of fast, I would say mm, quick cars. Does it make any sense? Not really. When I say fast food, it's making total sense. But if I say quick food, it doesn't make sense. But at the same time, when I say quick meal, it's like, yeah, I understand quick meal is a quick meal. So sometimes we use the synonyms still, doesn't make sense. But with other words, it is clear. That is what collocation is, how two words combine to make sense. And some of them cannot be replaced. In order to understand collocation, we have to understand what are the types. There are plenty of the types. We understand all of them slowly and eventually. <clears throat> and it's going to be a long video. So get some popcorns, get a rest or pause it. And, um, you know, you have to watch it fully at once because the best time never comes. So uh, take some notes and also have some coffee with it. Okay, pause it and go back, get a coffee. Let's start with the number one type of collocation. The first kind is called noun plus noun. Now, what is this noun plus noun? Noun plus noun is when we have two nouns to combine and they never are separated, though separately they don't make any sense. For example, round of applause. Now here, round and applause are both nouns and making sense. So when we say cease fire agreement, this is noun plus noun. Ceasefire and agreement both are nouns, right? And together making full sense. Okay, this is noun plus noun kind of collocation. Then we have number two. Number two is called noun plus verb. Now, what is this noun plus verb? When we say a uh, plane took off. So this taking off is a verb and noun is plane. We never say plane uh, run or plane was anything else apart from took off. We'd say that business went broke. Business went broke. Right? So we never say business. This is the word I'm talking about. This is went broke is a verb and here business again noun. So noun plus verb is some of the kinds that we have. Okay. Now comes just a little bit opposite. Number three, which is verb plus noun. Let's see some of the types of verb plus noun. And it is, let's say, um, making my bed. You really don't make your bed, but you set it up. So that's called making my bed. You say, do my laundry. So these are kind of collocations where we have verb first and then we have a noun, right? You don't say do my bed, but you say make my bed. And do my laundry, that means cleaning your clothes. So you got the idea what collocations are and what are these kinds. Remember, these kinds are important. Please take notes out of it. And we have number four. It's called verb plus adverb. I think in the beginning, I've explained what is the meaning of verb and adverb. I did it for this reason, because you might not understand this in a later. So to make it clear, some of you might have done it, but earlier, but now let's see. You remember this adverb and verb meaning initially. If you have not, if you are watching from middle, Go in the beginning, in the parts of speech, I've explained it, okay? So adverbs, verbs and adverbs could be something like this. Remember vaguely. Remember vaguely means not remembering cl clearly. Walk slowly. This is pretty common, right? 
Okay, these are the verbs or adverb type of collocations. Cool. Then we have number fifth. Number five is when we have adverbs, which I said earlier that adverbs can also qualify adjectives. Now let's see the types of that. Adverb and adjective can form a collocation always like this. Utterly stupid is one of the types of this. Adverb and adjective, utterly stupid, fully aware. So you see, fully is an adverb and aware is adjective. So fully aware is adverb adjective types of collocation. And these are all what? Collocations. Right? Okay, great. Then we move ahead to the next one, which is number six. Number six is adjective plus noun. I think you're pretty clear about adjective plus noun, if I'm not wrong. Adjective plus nouns are the most commonest one, right? And they are like, for example, a slow car. So this is slow means, again, adjective and emphasizing the car. Small car, big house. So these big words are this is an adjective, okay? Uh, you could say anything, any such thing, which is the easiest. Now comes number seven, which some of them consider it as collocation, some don't, so I'm going to write it here. I do consider it, and it's called prepositional phrases. Now, prepositional phrases are the phrases where they use preposition and not in the form of exactly. For example, when I say in or under, I mean in a box or under something, but in here it doesn't make full sense according to if you, if you look at this each word, but if I combine two words, it's different. For example, when I say under pressure, I'm not saying I'm standing under some pressure, but I am have a lot of worries. I'm, I'm under pressure because of that. When I say run out of money, I don't literally mean that, you know, I have a lot of money and I ran out of in the middle of the money. <laughs> run out of money means no having no money. So to see this outward is showing preposition. So these are the seven kinds that you have to do. What I recommend is don't watch this video as a fun video or anything. Watch it in the form of, um, you know, study. Watch it, pause it, understand it, and then find meanings of it. You know, the examples of noun plus noun, noun plus all the kinds, you know, seven kinds, at least five to ten. So it's going to help you a lot. There are books written on collocations only, like, you know, uh, collocation and use from Cambridge. So they're going to help you a lot to get through all this grammar. Okay, wonderful.